the prologue to men women and guns by sapper this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org two days ago a dear old aunt of mine asked me to describe to her what shrapnel was like what does it feel like to be shelled she demanded explain it to me under the influence of my deceased uncle's most excellent port i did so soothed and in that expansive frame of mind induced by the old and bold i drew her a picture vivid startling wonderful and when i had finished the dear old lady looked at me dreadful she murmured did i ever tell you of the terrible experience i had on the front at eastbourne when my bath chair attendant became inebriated and upset me slowly and sorrowfully i finished the decanter and went to bed but seriously my masters it is a hard thing that my aunt asked of me there are many things worse than shelling the tea party you find in progress on your arrival on leave the utterances of war experts the non-arrival of the whisky from england but all of those can be imagined by people who have not suffered they have a standard a measure of comparison shelling no the explosion of a howitzer shell near you is a definite actual fact which is unlike any other fact in the world except the explosion of another howitzer shell still nearer many have attempted to describe the noise it makes as the most explainable part about it and then you're no wiser listen stand with me at the menin gate of ypres and listen through a cutting a train is roaring on its way rapidly it rises in a great swelling crescendo as it dashes into the open and then its journey stops on some giant battlement stops in a peal of deafening thunder just overhead the shell has burst and the echoes in that town of death die slowly away reverberating like a sullen sea that lashes against a rock-bound coast and yet what does it convey to any one who patronizes inebriated bath chair men similarly shrapnel the germans were searching the road with whiz bangs a common remark an ordinary utterance in a letter taken by fond parents as an unpleasing affair such as the cook giving notice come with me to a spot near ypres come and we will take our evening walk together they're a bit lively farther up the road sir the corporal of the military police stands gloomily at a crossroads his back against a small wayside shrine a passing shell unroofed it many weeks ago it stands there surrounded by debris the image of the virgin chipped and broken just a little monument of desolation in a ruined country but pleasant to lean against when it's between you and german guns let us go on it's some way yet before we reach the dugout by the third dead horse in front of us stretches a long straight road flanked on each side by poplars in the middle there is pave at intervals a few small holes where the stones have been shattered and hurled away by a bursting shell and only the muddy grit remains hollowed out to a depth of two feet or so half full of water at the bottom an empty tin of bully ammunition clips numbers of biscuits sodden and muddy altogether a good obstacle to take with the front wheel of a car at night a little further on beside the road in a ruined desolate cottage two men are resting for a while smoking the dirt and mud of the trenches is thick on them 
and one of them is contemplatively scraping his boot with his knife and fork. Otherwise, not a soul. Not a living soul in sight. Though way to the left front, through glasses, you can see two people, a man and a woman, labouring in the fields. And the only point of interest about them is that between you and them run the two motionless, stagnant lines of men who for months have faced one another. Those two labourers are on the other side of the German trenches. The setting sun is glinting on the little crumbling village two or three hundred yards ahead. And as you walk towards it in the still evening air, your steps ring loud on the pavé. On each side the flat, neglected fields stretch away from the road. The drains beside it are choked with weeds and refuse, and here and there one of the gaunt trees, split in two halfway up by a shell, has crashed into its neighbour or fallen to the ground. A peaceful summer's evening, which seems to give the lie to our shrine, Lena. And yet, to one used to the peace of England, it seems almost too quiet, almost unnatural. Suddenly, out of the blue, there comes a sharp whizzing noise, and almost before you've heard it there is a crash, and from the village in front there rises a cloud of dust. A shell has burst on impact on one of the few remaining houses. Some slates and tiles fall into the road, and round the hole torn out of the sloping roof there hangs a whitish-yellow cloud of smoke. In quick succession come half a dozen more, some bursting on the ruined cottages as they strike, some bursting above them in the air. More clouds of dust rise from the deserted street, small avalanches of debris cascade into the road, and above three or four thick white smoke clouds drift slowly across the sky. This is the moment at which it is well, unless time is urgent, to pause and reflect a while. If you must go on, a detour is strongly to be recommended. The Germans are shelling the empty village just in front with shrapnel, and who are you to interpose yourself between him and his chosen target? But if in no particular hurry, then it were wise to dally gracefully against a tree, admiring the setting sun until he desists, when you may in safety resume your walk. But do not forget that he may not stick to the village, and that whiz-bangs give no time. That is why I specified a tree, and not the middle of the road. It's nearer the ditch. Suddenly, without a second's warning, they shift their target. Whiz-bang! Duck, you blighter, into the ditch, quick, move, hang your bottle of white wine, get down, cower, emulate the mole. This isn't the village in front now, he's shelling the road you're standing on. There's one burst on impact in the middle of the pavé forty yards in front of you, and another in the air just over your head. And there are more coming, don't make any mistake. That short, sharp whiz every few seconds. The bang, bang, bang seems to be going on all around you. A thing hums past in the air with a whistling noise, leaving a trail of sparks behind it, one of the fuses. Later the curio hunter may find it nestling by a turnip. He may have it. With a vicious thud a jagged piece of shell buries itself in the ground at your feet, and almost simultaneously the bullets from a well-burst one cut through the trees above you and ping against the road, thudding into the earth around. No more impact ones. They've got the range. Our pessimistic friend at the crossroads spoke the truth. They're quite lively. Everything bursting beautifully above the road, about forty feet up. Bitter thought, if only the blighters knew that it was empty, save for your wretched and unworthy self cowering in a ditch, with a bottle of white wine in your pocket, and your head down a rat-hole. Surely they wouldn't waste their ammunition so reprehensibly. Then, suddenly, they stop, and as the last white puffs of smoke drift slowly away, 
you cautiously lift your head and peer towards the village have they finished will it be safe to resume your interrupted promenade in a dignified manner or will you give them another minute or two almost have you decided to do so when to your horror you perceive coming towards you through the village itself two officers what a position to be discovered in true only the very young or the mentally deficient scorn cover when shelling is in progress but of course just at the moment when you'd welcome a shell to account for your propinquity with the rat hole the blighters have stopped no sound breaks the stillness save the steps ringing towards you and it looks silly to be found in a ditch for no apparent reason then as suddenly as before comes salvation just as with infinite stealth you endeavour to step out nonchalantly from behind a tree as if you were part of the scenery bang crash from in front cheero the village again the church this time a shower of bricks and mortar comes down like a landslip and if you are quick you may just see two black streaks go to ground from the vantage point of your tree you watch a salvo of shells explode in on or about the temporary abode of those two officers you realize from what you know of the hun that this salvo probably concludes the evening hate and the opportunity is too good to miss edging rapidly along the road keeping close to the ditch you approach the houses your position you feel is now strategically sound with regard to the wretched pair cowering behind rubble heaps you even desire revenge for your mental anguish when discovery in the rodent's lair seemed certain so light a cigarette if you didn't drop them all when you went to ground yourself if you did whistle some snappy tune as you stride jauntily into the village don't go too fast or you may miss them but should you see a head peer from behind a kitchen range express no surprise just top in evening ain't it gettin furniture for the dugout what to linger is bad form but it is quite permissible to ask his companion seated in a torn-up drain if the ratting is good then pass on in a leisurely manner but when you're round the corner run like a hare with these cursed germans you never know night and a working party stretching away over a ploughed field or digging a communication trench the great green flares lob up half a mile away a watery moon shines on the bleak scene suddenly a noise like the tired sigh of some great giant a scorching sheet of flame that leaps at you out of the darkness searing your very brain so close does it seem the ping of death past your head the clatter of shovel and pick next you as a muttered curse proclaims a man is hit a voice from down the line god old ginger's took it hold up mate say blokes ginger's done in ay it's worse at night shrapnel woolly fleecy puffs of smoke floating gently downwind getting more and more attenuated gradually disappearing while below each puff an oval of ground has been plastered with bullets and it's when the ground inside the oval is full of men that the damage is done not you perhaps but someone next time maybe you and that methinks is an epitome of other things besides shrapnel it's all the war to the men who fight and the women who wait end of the prologue to men women and guns by sapper read by noel badrian the sensation of night driving by robert w imbrey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
it was early in february that i got my first experience at night driving without lights to you gentlemen who have shot rapids great game and billiards who have crossed the painted desert and the line who have punched cows in arizona and heads in mile end road who have killed moose in new brunswick and time in monte carlo who have tramped and skied and trekked to you who have tried these and still crave a sensation let me recommend night driving without lights over unfamiliar shell-pitted roads cluttered with traffic within easy range of the enemy challenged every now and then by a sentry who has a loaded gun and no compunction in using it your car which in daylight never seems very powerful has now become a very juggernaut of force at the slightest increase of gas it fairly jumps off the road throttle down as you may the speed seems terrific you find yourself with your head thrust over the wheel your eyes staring ahead with an intensity which makes them ache staring ahead into nothing now and then the blackness seems if possible to become more dense and you throw out your clutch and on your brake and come to a dead stop climbing out to find your radiator touching an overturned caisson or mayhap a timely gun flash or the flare of a trench light will show that you are headed off the road and straight for a tree a little further on the way leads up a hill the pulling of the engine is the only thing that tells you this and then just as you top the rise a star bomb lights the scene with a dense white glare and the brancardier by your side rasps out vite pour la mort de dieu vite il pouve nous voir and you drop down the other side of the hill like the fall of a gun hammer then in a narrow mud gutted lane in front of a dugout you back and fill and finally turn your bloody load is eased in and you creep back the way you have come save that now every bump and jolt seems to tear your flesh as you think of those poor stricken chaps in behind yes there is something of tenseness in lightless night driving under such conditions try it gentlemen on the afternoon and night of february twelfth there was an attack on the line near vangre preceded by drum fire as such things go it was but a small affair it would perhaps have a line in the communique as north of the Aisne, the enemy attempted a coup upon a salient of our line but we repulsed him with loss that and nothing more but to those who were there it was very real the big guns spat their exchange of hate rifle fire crackled along the line the machine guns sowed the air with wicked staccato sounds and men with set jaws and bayonets charged to death through barbed entanglements as night closed down the flare bombs spread their fitful glare on mutilated things which that morning had been living men now set in the bloody backwash of wounded with the coming of night the enemy lengthened the range of his artillery so as to harass the transport and the zone back of the line was seared with shells the field dressing station at roche near vic suffered greatly and it soon became apparent that its evacuation was necessary i had already been on duty fourteen hours when the call reached quarters for the entire squad my journal for the thirteenth reads i'm too tired for much writing as i've had but two hours sleep in the last forty during which i have driven close to three hundred kilometres been three times under fire and had but two hot meals the entire squad was turned out just after i got into the blankets last night roche was being bombarded and it was necessary to take out all the wounded there were a number of new shell holes in the road and this made interesting driving it was one thirty when i reached compain three when i had completed my evacuation and four fifteen this morning when i reached quarters 
up at six thirty and working on my bus this afternoon made route three tonight i am bien fatigué firing light today possibly because of sleet and rain the attack was evidently repulsed the squad did good work that night afterwards we were commended by the colonel in command it was in this attack that bill won his croix de guerre when a un endroit particulièrement exposé au moment où les obus tombaient avec violence a arrêté sa voiture pour prendre les blessés qui l'a aidé avec courage et sans foi a week later he was decorated our muddy little courtyard being the setting for the ceremony in celebration of his decoration bill determined to give a burst there would seem to be few places less adapted to the serving of a banquet or less capable of offering material than poor little war-torn jalousie nevertheless at six o'clock on the evening of february the twenty seventh the squad sat down to a repast that would have done credit to any hotel bill had enlisted the services of a paris caterer and not only was the food itself perfection but it was served in a style that after our accustomed tin cup tin plate service positively embarrassed us our dingy quarters were decorated and made light by carbide lamps a snowy cloth covered our plank table stacks of china dishes not tin appeared at each place there were chairs to sit upon even flowers were not forgotten and bill being a yale man had seen to it that beside the plates of the other yale men in the squad were placed bunches of violets the artist of the section designed a menu card but we were too busy crashing into the food to pay any attention to the menu for a month past we had been living mostly on boiled beef and army bread and the way the squad now eased into regular food was an eye-opener to dietitians hors d'oeuvre fish ham roasts vegetables salads sweets wines and smokes disappeared like art in a hun raid twenty men may have gotten through a greater quantity and variety of food in three hours and lived but it is not on record and through it all the guns snarled and roared unheeded and the flare bombs shed their fitful glare verily in after years when men shall foregather and the talk flows in epicurean channels if one there be present who was at bill's burst surely his speech shall prevail february which had come in with mild weather lost its temper as it advanced the days became increasingly cold and snow fell the nights were cruel for driving one night i remember especially i had responded to a call just back of the line where i got my blessé a poor chap shot through the lung it was snowing the flakes driving down with a vicious force that stung the eyes and brought tears in spite of the snow it was very black and to show a light meant to draw fire we crept along for fear of running into a ditch or colliding with traffic at kilometre eight my engine began to miss i got out and changed plugs but this did not help much and we limped along the opiate given the blesse had begun to wear off and his groans sounded above the whistling of the wind once in the darkness i lost the road going several kilometres out of my way before i realised the error the engine was getting weaker every minute but by this time i was out of gun range and able to use a lantern with the aid of the light i was able to make some repairs though my hands were so benumbed i could scarcely hold the tools the car now marched better and i started ahead several times a qui vive came out of the darkness to which i ejaculated a startled france the snow-veiled clock in villers cotterets showed the hour was half after midnight when we made our way up the choked streets 
but the load had come through safely uncomfortable as these runs were and every member of the squad made them not once but many times they were what lent fascination to the work they made us feel that it was worth while and however small the way we were helping it was about this time that the service was militarized and incorporated into the automobile corps of the french army thereafter we were classed as militaires and wore on our tunics the red-winged symbol of the automobile corps we were now subject to all the rules and regulations governing regularly enlisted men with one exception the duration of our enlistments we were permitted to enlist for six month periods with optional three months extensions and were not compelled to serve for duration as incident to the militarization we received five sous a day per man the pay of the french poilu and in addition we were entitled to touch certain articles such as shelter tents sabots tobacco etc we had already been furnished with steel helmets and gas masks we were also granted the military franchise for our mail while at jalousy the personnel of the squad changed considerably the terms of several men having expired they left their places being taken by new recruits thus hippo bob brook and magnum joined us nor must i forget to mention another important addition to our number the puppy mascot vic he was given to us by a tirailleur who being on the march could not take care of him and one of the fellows brought him back to quarters in his pocket a tiny soft white ball who instantly wriggled himself into the squad's affections when we got him he could scarcely toddle and was never quite certain where his legs would carry him yet even then the button which he fondly believed was a tail stuck belligerently upright like a shattered mast from which had been shot the flag for he being a child of war had fear of nothing no not gunfire itself and as he grew older we took him with us on our runs and he was often under shell fire he was always at home in chateau or dugout always sure of himself and could tell one of our khaki uniforms a mile away picking us out of a mob of blue-clad soldiers such was vic the squad mascot End of the Sensation of Night Driving by Robert W. Imbry Read by Noel Badrian Grodeck by Georg Trackel Read in German This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Rodeck. Am Abend tönen die herzlichen Wälder von tödlichen Waffen, die goldenen Ebenen und blauen Seen, darüber die Sonne düstre hinrollt, umfängt die Nacht sterbende Krieger, die wilde Klage ihrer zerbrochenen Münder. Doch stille sammelt in weiden grund rotes gewölk darin ein zürnender gott wohnt das vergossene blut sich mundne kühe alle straßen münden in schwarze verwesung unter goldenem gezweig der nacht und sternen es der schwester schatten durch den schweigenden hain zu grüßen die geister der helden die blutenden häupter und leise tönen im rohr die dunklen flöten des herzes o stolzere trauer ihr irnen altäre die heiße Flamme des Geistes nährt heute 
ein gewaltiger Schmerz. Die ungeborenen Enkel. End of Grodeck by Georg Trakel. Read by Hermann Roskans. Harvest by John Galsworthy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The sky tonight looks as if a million bright angels were passing. A gleaming cloud mesh drawn across the heaven. One star, very clear, shines beside a full moon, white as the globe campion flower. The wan hills and valleys, the corn stooks, casting each its shadows, the gray bowls of the beeches, all have the remoteness of an ineffable peace. On the past day was so soft, so glamorous, such a hum, such brightness, and the harvest going on. This last year millions have died with energy but one-third spent. Millions more, unripe for death, will yet herald us into the long shades before these shambles cease. Boys born just to be the meat of war, spitted on each other's reddened bayonets, without inkling of guilt or knowledge. To what shall we turn that we may keep sane? watching this green, unripe corn, field on field, being scythed by death for none to eat. There is no solace in the thought death is nothing, save to those who still believe they go straight to paradise. To us who dare not to know the workings of the unknowable, and in our heart of hearts cannot tell what, if anything, becomes of us, to us, great majority of the modern world, life is valuable, good, a thing worth living out for its natural span. For if it were not, long ere this we should have sat with folded arms, lifting no hand till the last sighing breath of the human race had whispered itself out into the wind, and a final darkness come, sat like the Hindu yogi, watching the sun and moon a little, and expired. The moon would be as white, and the sun as golden, if we were gone. The hills and valleys as mysterious, the beech trees just as they are. Only the stooks of corn would vanish, with those who garner them. If life were not good, we should make of ourselves dust indifferently, we human beings, quietly, peacefully, not in murderous horror, reaped by the curbing volleys, mown off by rains of shrapnel, and the long yellow scythe of the foul gases. But life is good, and no living thing wishes to die. Even they who kill themselves, despairing, resign out of sheer love of life, out of craving for what they have found too mutilated and starved, out of yearning for their meed of joy, cruelly frustrated, and they who die that others may live are but those in whom the life flame burns so hot and bright that they can feel the life and the longing to live in others as if it were their own, more than their own. Yea, life carries with it a very passion for existence. To what, then, shall we turn that we may keep sane, watching this harvest of two young deaths the harvest of the brave, whose stooks are raised before us, casting each its shadow in the ironic moonlight. Green corn, green corn. If, having watched these unripe blades reaped off and stacked so pitifully, watched the great dark wagoner clear those unmellowed fields, we let their sacrifice be vain. If we sow not hereafter in a peaceful earth that which shall become harvest more golden than the world has seen, then shame on us, unending, in whatever land we dwell. 
This harvest night is still, and yet up there the bright angels are passing over the moon. One star. End of Harvest by John Galsworthy Read by Winston Tharp Discours prononcé à la Sorbonne lors du meeting Hommage à l'Arménie par Anatole France This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Il y a vingt ans, lorsque les massacres ordonnés par le sultan Abdul Hamid ensanglantèrent l'Arménie, quelques voix seulement en Europe, quelques voix indignées, protestèrent contre l'égorgement d'un peuple. En France, un très petit nombre d'hommes appartenant aux partis les plus opposés s'unirent pour revendiquer les droits de l'humanité grandement offensés. Vous les connaissez. Jaurès, Denis Cochin, Gabriel Seyaï, Ernest Lavis, Jean Finot, Victor Bérard, Francis de Pressensé, le père Charmetan, Pierre Quillard, Clémenceau, Albert Vandal, quelques autres encore que je m'excuse de ne pas nommer. Le reste demeura muet. Plusieurs se sentaient émus d'une grande pitié, mais comme les malheureux inspirent de l'éloignement à la plupart des hommes, on chercha des torts aux victimes, on leur reprocha leur faiblesse. Quelques-uns, prenant la défense des bourreaux, les montraient châtillant des séditieux ou vengeant les populations turques ruinées par des usuriers chrétiens. D'autres, enfin, voyaient dans ce carnage la main de l'Angleterre ou celle de la Russie. Cependant, malgré les protestations des arménophiles et les représentations timides de quelques puissances, en dépit des promesses du gouvernement turc, la persécution, parfois assourdie et voilée, ne cessait pas. En vain, une révolution de palais changea les chefs de l'Empire. Les jeunes Turcs, parvenus au pouvoir, surpassèrent Abdul Hamid en férocité dans l'organisation des massacres d'Adana. À la longue, les malheurs de ces chrétiens d'Orient la serrent la pitié. Ils demeuraient incompréhensibles à l'Europe civilisée. Le peuple arménien ne nous était connu que par les coups qui le frappaient. On ignorait tout de lui, son passé, son génie, sa foi, ses espérances. Le sens de son extermination échappait. Il en allait encore ainsi il y a deux ans. La grande guerre éclata. La Turquie s'y comporta comme une vassale de l'Allemagne, et la lumière se fit soudain en France sur l'esprit de l'Arménie et les causes de son martyr. On comprit que la longue lutte inégale du Turc oppresseur et de l'Arménien était à bien comprendre la lutte du despotisme, la lutte de la barbarie contre l'esprit de justice et de liberté. Et quand nous vîmes la victime du Turc tourner vers nous des yeux éteints où passait une lueur d'espérance, nous comprîmes enfin que c'était notre sœur d'Orient qui mourait, et qui mourait parce qu'elle était notre sœur, et pour le crime d'avoir partagé nos sentiments, d'avoir aimé ce que nous aimons, pensé ce que nous pensons, cru ce que nous croyons, goûté comme nous la sagesse, l'équité, la poésie, les arts. Tel fut son crime inexpiable. Il convient donc, mesdames et messieurs, qu'une assemblée de Français rende à ce peuple, dans sa grande et noble infortune, un solennel hommage. Nous accomplissons ici un devoir sacré. Nous rendons à l'Arménie les honneurs dus moins encore à ses illustres infortunes qu'à la constance avec laquelle elle les a supportées. Nous la louons de cet invisible amour qui l'attache à la civilisation des peuples représentés dans cette salle, à notre civilisation, car l'Arménie est unie à nous par les liens de famille, et comme l'a dit un patriote arménien, elle prolonge en Orient le génie latin. Son histoire, telle que M. Paul de Chanel vient de nous en donner un vigoureux raccourci, se résume dans un effort séculaire 
pour conserver l'héritage intellectuel et moral de la Grèce et de Rome. Puissante, l'Arménie le défendit par ses armes et ses lois. Vaincue, asservie, elle en garda le culte dans son cœur. L'on peut dire que, en ces heures récentes, dont M. Painlevé nous a retracé éloquemment l'horreur, sans exemple, plus de cinq cent mille Arméniens sont morts pour notre cause et notre nom sur les lèvres. Ces chrétiens, disent les Turcs, organisaient une vaste insurrection et tendaient la main aux ennemis du croissant. Les assassins ne sauraient légitimer leurs crimes par cette imputation. Mais il est vrai que les Arméniens appelaient de leurs vœux la victoire de la France et des alliés. Au reste, la destruction de ce peuple qui nous aime était résolue dans les conseils du gouvernement turc. Tout ce qu'il y avait, de Samsung à Dierberkir, de jeunes hommes, de vieillards, de femmes, d'enfants, périt assassiné par ordre du sultan avec la complicité de l'Allemagne. L'Arménie expire, mais elle renaîtra. Le peu de sang qui lui reste est un sang précieux dont sortira une postérité héroïque. Un peuple qui ne veut pas mourir ne meurt pas. Après la victoire de nos armées qui combattent pour la justice et la liberté, les alliés auront de grands devoirs à remplir. Et le plus sacré de ces devoirs sera de rendre la vie au peuple martyr, à la Belgique, à la Serbie. Alors ils assureront la sûreté et l'indépendance de l'Arménie. Penchés sur elle, ils lui diront « Ma sœur, lève-toi, ne souffre plus. » Tu es désormais libre de vivre selon ton génie et ta foi. End of discours prononcé à la Sorbonne lors du meeting hommage à l'Arménie par Anatole France. Read in French by Herman Roskams. Chapter One of the Blackest Page of Modern History: Events in Armenia in 1915. The Facts and the Responsibilities by Herbert Adams Gibbons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In April 1915, the Ottoman government began to put into execution throughout Turkey a systematic and carefully prepared plan to exterminate the Armenian race. In six months, nearly a million Armenians have been killed. The number of the victims and the manner of their destruction are without parallel in modern history. In the autumn of 1914, the Turks began to mobilize Christians as well as Muslims for the army. For six months, in every part of Turkey, they called upon the Armenians for military service exemption money was accepted from those who could pay a few weeks later the exemption certificates were disregarded and their holders enrolled the younger classes of armenians who did not live too far from constantinople were placed as in the balkan wars in the active army the older ones and all the armenians enrolled in the more distant regions were utilized for road railway and fortification building Wherever they were called, and to whatever task they were put, the Armenians did their duty, and worked for the defence of Turkey. They proved themselves brave soldiers, and intelligent and industrious labourers. In April 1915, orders were sent out from Constantinople to the local authorities in Asia Minor, to take whatever measures were deemed best to paralyse in advance an attempt at rebellion on the part of the Armenians. The orders impressed upon the local authorities that the Armenians were an extreme danger to the safety of the empire, and suggested that national defence demanded imperatively anticipatory severity, in order that the Armenians might be rendered harmless. In some places the local authorities replied that they had observed no suspicious activity on the part of the Armenians, and reminded the government that the Armenians were harmless because they possessed no arms, and because the most vigorous masculine element had already been taken for the army. 
there are some turks who have a sense of pity and a sense of shame but the majority of the turkish officials responded with alacrity to the hint from constantinople and those who did not were very soon replaced a new era of armenian massacres began at first in order that the task might be accomplished with the least possible risk the virile masculine armenian population still left in the cities and villages was summoned to assemble at a convenient place generally outside the town and gendarme and police saw to it that the summons was obeyed none was overlooked when they had rounded up the armenian men they butchered them this method of procedure was generally feasible in small places in larger cities it was not always possible to fulfil the orders from constantinople so simply and promptly the armenian notables were assassinated in the streets or in their homes if it was an interior city the men were sent off under guard to another town in a few hours the guard would return without their prisoners if it was a coast city the armenians were taken away in boats outside the harbour to another port the boats returned astonishingly soon without the passengers then in order to prevent the possibility of trouble from armenians mobilized for railway and road construction they were divided in companies of from three hundred to five hundred and put to work at intervals of several miles regiments of the turkish regular army were sent quote, to put down the armenian revolution end quote and came suddenly upon the little groups of workers plying pickaxe crowbar and shovel the rebels were riddled with bullets before they knew what was happening the few who managed to flee were followed by mounted men and shot or sabred telegrams began to pour in upon talat bay at constantinople announcing that here there and everywhere armenian uprisings had been put down and telegrams were returned congratulating the local officials upon the success of their prompt measures to neutral newspaper men at constantinople to neutral diplomats who had heard vaguely of a recurrence of armenian massacres this telegraphic correspondence was shown as proof that an imminent danger had been averted Quote, we have not been cruel but we admit having been severe declared talat bey this is wartime end quote. having thus rid themselves of the active manhood of the armenian race the turkish government still felt uneasy the old men and boys the women and children were an element of danger to the ottoman empire the armenians must be rooted out of turkey but how accomplish this in such a way that the turkish ambassador at washington and the german newspapers might be able to say as they have said and are still saying quote, all those who have been killed were of that rebellious element caught red-handed or while otherwise committing traitorous acts against the turkish government and not women and children as some of these fabricated reports would have the americans believe End quote. Talat Bey was ready with his plan. Deportation, a regrettable measure, a military necessity, but perfectly humane. From May until October, the Ottoman government pursued methodically a plan of extermination far more hellish than the worst possible massacre. Orders for deportation of the entire Armenian population to Mesopotamia were dispatched to every province of Asia Minor. These orders were explicit and detailed. No hamlet was too insignificant to be missed. The news was given by town criers that every Armenian was to be ready to leave at a certain hour for an unknown destination there were no exceptions for the aged the ill the women in pregnancy only rich merchants and bankers and good-looking women and girls were allowed to escape by professing islam and let it be said to their everlasting honour that few availed themselves of this means of escape 
the time given varied from two days to six hours no household goods no animals no extra clothing could be taken along food supply and bedding was limited to what a person could carry and they had to go on foot under the burning sun through parched valleys and over snow-covered mountain passes a journey of from three to eight weeks when they passed through christian villages where the deportation order had not yet been received the travellers were not allowed to receive food or ministrations of any sort the sick and the aged and the wee children fell by the roadside and did not rise again women in childbirth were urged along by bayonets and whips until the moment of deliverance came and were left to bleed to death the likely girls were seized for harems or raped day after day by the guards until death came as a merciful release those who could committed suicide mothers went crazy and threw their children into the river to end their sufferings hundreds of thousands of women and children died of hunger of thirst of exposure of shame the pitiful caravans thinned out first daily and later hourly death became the one thing to be longed for for how can hope live how can strength remain even to the fittest in a journey that has no end and if they turned to right or left from that road to hell they were shot or speared curds and mounted peasants hunted down those who succeeded in escaping the roadside guards they are still putting down the armenian revolution out there in asia minor i had just written the above paragraph when an english woman whom i have known for many years came to my home she left adana in cilicia only a month ago her story is the same as that of a hundred others i have the identical facts one eyewitness testimony corroborating the other from american english german and swiss sources this english woman said to me quote, the deportation is still going on from the interior along the baghdad railway they are still being sent through adana on the journey of death as far as the railway exists it is being used to hurry the work of extermination faster than the caravans from the regions where there are no railways oh if they would only massacre them and be done with it as in the hamidian days i stood there at the adana railway station and from the carriages the women would hold up their children and cry for water they had got beyond a desire for bread only water there was a pump i went down on my knees to beg the turkish guard to let me give them a drink but the train moved on and the last i heard was the cry of those lost souls that was not once it was almost every day the same thing did lord bryce say eight hundred thousand well it must be a million now could you conceive of human beings allowing wild animals to die a death like that End quote. but the turkish ambassador in washington declares that these stories are fabrications and that no women and children have been killed End of chapter one of the blackest page of modern history Events in Armenia in nineteen fifteen by Herbert Adams Gibbons. Read by Ruth Golding. Letters of a Soldier by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. December thirty, nineteen fourteen your christmas letter came last night perhaps in this very hour when i am writing to you mine of the same day is reaching you at that time in spite of the risk i was enjoying all the beauty but to-day i confess it is poisoned for me by what we hear of the last slaughter on the twenty sixth we were made to remain on duty in positions occupied only at night as a rule 
our purely defensive position was lucky that day for we were exposed only to slight artillery fire but on our right a regiment of our division in one of the terrible emplacements of october fourteenth received an awful punishment of which the inconclusive result cost several hundred lives here in our great village where our kind hostess knew as we did the victims all is sadness same day nothing attacks the soul the torture can certainly be very great especially the apprehension but questions coming from the distance can be silenced by acceptation of what is close the weather is sweet and soft and nature is indifferent the dead will not spoil the spring and then once the horror of the moment is over when one sees its place taken by only the memory of those who have gone there is a kind of sweetness in the thought of what really exists in these solemn woods one realizes the inanity of sepulchres and the pomp of funerals the souls of the brave have no need of all that four o'clock i have just finished the fourth portrait a lieutenant in my company he is delighted daylight fades i send you my thoughts full of cheerfulness hope and wisdom january third nineteen fifteen yesterday after the first satisfaction of finding myself freed from manual work i contemplated my stripes and i felt some humiliation because instead of the great anonymous superiority of the ordinary soldier which had put me beyond all military valuation i had now the distinction of being a low number in military rank but then i felt that each time i looked at my little bits of red wool i should remember my social duty a duty which my leaning towards individualism makes me forget only too often so i knew i was still free to cultivate my soul having this final effort to demand of it january fourth i am writing to you at the entrance to an underground passage which leads under the enemy emplacement my little job is to look out for the safety of the sappers who are hollowing out and supporting and consolidating an excavation about twelve metres deep already to get to this place we have to plunge into mud up to our thighs but during the eight hours we spend here we are sheltered by earthworks several metres thick i have six men with whom i have led an existence of sleeplessness and privation for three days this is the benefit i derive from the joyful event of my new status but as a matter of fact i am glad to take part in these trials again besides in a few days the temporary post which i held before may be given to me altogether horrible weather and to make matters worse i burnt an absolutely new boot and am soaking wet like the others but in excellent health dear i am now going to sleep a little january thirteen i hope that when you think of me you will have in mind all those who have left everything behind their family their surroundings their whole social environment all those of whom their nearest and dearest think only in the past saying we once had a brother who many years ago withdrew from this world we know nothing of his fate then i feeling that you too have abandoned all human attachment will walk freely in this life closed to ordinary relations i don't regret my new rank it has brought me many troubles but a great deal of experience and as a matter of fact some ameliorations so i want to continue to live as fully as possible in this moment and that will be all the easier for me if i can feel that you have brought yourself to the idea that my present life cannot in any way be lost i did not tell you enough what pleasure the reviews hebdomadaires gave me i found some extracts from that speech on lamartine which i am passionately fond of circumstances led this poet to give to his art only the lowest place life in general closed him round imposing on his great heart a more serious and immediate task than that which awaited his genius february two dear mother i go on with this letter in the billet where the great worry of accumulated work fills up the void which melancholy would make her own dark days have come upon me and nothingness seems the end of all whereas all that is in my being had assured me of the plenitude of the universe yes devotion not to individuals but to the social idea of brotherhood sustains me still oh what a magnificent example is to be found in jesus and in the poor that righteous aristocrat showing by his abhorrent task the infinite obligation of altruistic duty and teaching above all that no return of gratitude should be demanded to my experience of men and things i owe this tranquillity of expecting nothing from any one thus duty takes an abstract form deprived of a human object an unspeakable sunrise to-day another spring draws near i want to tell you about our three days in the first line snow and frost 
we went down the slopes leading to our emplacement in the village the night was then so beautiful that it moved the heart of every soldier to see it i could never say enough about the fine delicacy of this country how can i explain to you the chiselled effect allied to the dream-like mists with the moon soaring above for three days my night service took me straight to the heart of this purity this whiteness tarnished gold work of the trees and in spite of the mist many colours rose and blue these are the hours of such beauty that those who take them to themselves can hardly die i was well in front of the first lines and never did i feel better protected this morning when i came a pink and green sunrise over the blue and rosy snow the open country marked with woods and covered fields far off the distance in which the silvery muse fades away o oh, beauty in spite of all february eleven it may possibly be a great intended privilege for our generation to be a witness of these horrors but what a terrible price to pay well faith eternal faith is over all faith in an evolution an order beyond our human patience in such hours as these one must perforce take refuge in the extra-human principle of sacrifice it is impossible for mere humanity to go further let go all poor human hope seek something beyond perhaps you have already found it as for me i feel myself unworthy in such days to be anything more than a memory i picked some flowers in the mud keep them in remembrance of me courage through all courage in spite of all february thirteen beloved after the days of tears and of rebellion of the heart that have so shaken me i pull myself together again to say thy will be done so according to the power and the measure of my faculties i would be he who to the very end never despaired of his share in the building of the temple i would be the workman who knowing full well that his scaffolding will give way and who has no hope of safety goes on with his stone carving of decoration on the cathedral front decoration i am not one who will ever be able to lift the blocks of stone but there are others for that job yes i am getting back into a little quiet thinking the equable tranquillity i had hoped for is not yet mine but i have occasional glimpses of that region of peace and light in which all things even our love is renewed and transfigured i am now at the foot of a peaked hill where nature has brought the loveliest lines of design together man is hunting man and in a moment they will be locked in fight meanwhile the lark is rising even as i write a strange serenity possesses me something extraordinary comfort be it a human quality be it a revelation from on high all around me men are asleep february nineteen one word only we are in the hands of god never never have we so needed the wisdom of confidence death prevails but it does not reign life is still noble friends of mine killed and wounded yesterday and the day before dearest our messengers may be greatly delayed february twenty two we are in billets after the great battle and this time i saw it all i did my duty i know that by the feeling of my men for me but the best are dead bitter loss this heroic regiment we gained our object we'll write more at length february twenty two dearest beloved mother i will tell you about the goodness of god and the horror of these things the heaviness of heart that weighed me down this month and a half past was for the coming anguish to be undergone in these last twenty days we reached the scene of the action on the seventeenth the preparations ceased to interest me i was all expectation of the event it broke out at three o'clock the explosion of seven mines under the enemy's trenches it was like a distant thunder next five hundred guns created the hell into which we leapt night was coming on when we established ourselves in the positions we had taken all that night i was actively at work for the security of our men who had not suffered much i had to cover great tracts over which were scattered the wounded and the dead of both sides my heart yearned over them but i had nothing better than words to give them in the morning we were driven with serious loss back to our previous positions but in the evening we attacked again we retook our whole advance here again i did my duty in my advance i got the sword of an officer who surrendered after that i placed my men for guarding our ground the captain ordered me to his side and i gave him the plan of our position he was telling me of his decision to have me mentioned when he was killed before my eyes briefly under the frightful fire of those three days i organized and kept going the work of supplying cartridges in this job five of my men were wounded 
our losses are terrible those of the enemy greater still you cannot imagine beloved mother what man will do against man for five days my shoes have been slippery with human brains i have walked among lungs among entrails the men eat what little they have to eat at the side of the dead our regiment was heroic we have no officers left they all died as brave men two good friends one of them a fine model of my own for one of my last pictures are killed that was one of the terrible incidents of the evening a white body splendid under the moon i lay down near him the beauty of things awoke again for me at last after five days of horror that lost us twelve hundred men we were ordered back from the scene of abomination the regiment has been mentioned in dispatches dear mother how shall i ever speak of the unspeakable things i have had to see but how shall i ever tell of the certainties this tempest has made clear to me duty effort february twenty three dearest beloved mother a second day in billets to-morrow we go to the front darling i can't write to-day let us draw ever nearer to the eternal let us remain devoted to our duty i know how your thoughts fly to meet mine and i turn mine towards the happiness of wisdom let us take courage let me be brave among these young dead men and be you brave in readiness god is over us february twenty six dear mother here we are again upon the battlefield we have climbed the hill from which it would be better to praise the glory of god than to condemn the horrors of men innumerable dead at the setting out of our march but they grow fewer leaving here and there some poor stray body the colour of clay a painful encounter our losses are what are called serious in dispatches at all events i can assure you that our men are admirable and their resignation is heroic all deplore this infamous war but nearly all feel that the fulfilment of a hideous duty is the one only thing that justifies the horrible necessity of living at such a time as this dear mother i cannot write more the plain is settling to sleep under colours of violet and rose how can things be so horrible february twenty eighth dearest beloved mother and dear beloved grandmother i am writing to you having just struggled out of a most appalling nightmare and out of dantesque scenes that i have lived through things that gustave dore had the courage to picture through the text of the divina commedia have come to pass with all the variety and circumstance of fact in the midst of labours that happily tend to deaden one's feelings i have been able to gather the better fruits of pain on the twenty fourth in the evening we returned to our positions from which the more hideous of the traces of battle had been partly removed only a few places were still scattered with fragments of men that were taking on the semblance of that clay to which they were returning the weather was fine and cold and the heights we had gained brought us into the very sky the immensities appeared only as lights the higher light a brilliance of stars the lower light a glow of fires the frightful bombardment with which the germans overwhelm us is really a waste of fireworks i lay in a dugout from which i could follow the moon and watch for daybreak now and again a shell crumbled the soil about me and deafened me then silence came again upon the frozen earth i have paid the price i have paid dearly but i have had moments of solitude that were full of god i really think i have tried to adapt myself to my work for as i told you i am proposed for the rank of sergeant and for mention in dispatches ah oh, but dearest mother this war is long too long for men who had something else to do in the world what you tell me of the kind feeling there is for me in paris gives me pleasure but am i not to be brought out of this for a better kind of usefulness why am i so sacrificed when so many others not my equals are spared yet i had something worth doing to do in the world well if god does not intend to take away this cup from me his will be done march five i wish i could recover in myself the extreme sensibilities i felt before the fiery trial so that i might describe for you the colours and the aspects of the drama we have passed through but just now i am in a state of numbness pleasant enough in itself yet apt to hinder my vision of things present and my forecasts of things to come i have to make an effort to keep hold of eternal and essential things perhaps i shall succeed in time and yet certain sights on the wasted field of war had so noble a lesson a teaching so persuasive that i should love to share with you the great certainties of those days how harmonious is death within the natural soil how admirable is the manner of man's return to the substance of his mother earth compared with the poverty of funeral ceremonial yesterday i thought of those poor dead as forsaken things 
but I had been present at the burial of an officer, and it seems to me that nature is more compassionate than man. Yes, indeed, the soldier's death is close to natural things. It is a frank horror, a horror that does not attempt to cheat the law of violence. I often passed close to bodies that were gradually passing into the clay, and their change seemed more comforting than the cold and unchanging aspect of the tombs of town cemeteries. From our life in the open we have gained a freedom of conception, an amplitude of thought and of habit, which will for ever make cities horrible and artificial to those who survive the war. Dear mother, I write but ill of things that I have greatly felt. Let us seek refuge in the peace of spring, and in the treasure of the present moment. March 7. Dearest beloved mother, I am filling up the idleness of this morning. I am rejoicing in the clear waters of the muse that give life to dales and gardens. The play of the current over weeds and pebbles makes a soothing sight for my tired eyes, and expresses the calm life of this big village that is sheltered by the muse hills the church here is thronged with soldiers who possess as i do a definite intuition of the ideal but who seek it by more stated and less immediate means i am to board for a fortnight in the house in which nearly two months ago our joyous company used to meet to-day i have seen the tears of those same friends weeping to hear of the wounded and the dead i received your sleeping sack which is quite right i am worried with rheumatism which has spoilt many of my nights in billets these two months past. Darling mother, here is a calm in the noise of that barrack life which must now be ours. As there are none here but non-commissioned officers, they are all ordered to hard jobs, and I shall renew my acquaintance with brooms and burdens. We have been warned, we shall have to work with our hands, and so we learn to direct others. Soft weather after rain. Bells in the evening. Flowing waters singing under the bridges trees settling to sleep march twenty two a splendid sun looking on it one is amazed to see the world at war spring has come in triumph it has surprised mankind in the act of hatred in the act of outrage upon creation the dispatches tell us little fortunately of what is happening being now these twenty-one days away from the front i find it difficult to reaccustom myself to the thought of the monstrous things going on there indeed dear mother i know that your life and mine have had but one object one aim and that even in the time we are passing through we have never lost sight of it but have constantly tried to draw nearer therefore our lives may not have been altogether useless this is the only thought to comfort an ambitious soul to forecast the influence and the consequences of its acts i believe that if longer life had been granted me i should never have relaxed in my purpose having no certainty but that of the present i have tried to put myself to the best use march twenty five here i am living this life in the earth again i found the very hole that i left last month nothing has been done while i was away a formidable attack was attempted but it failed the regiments ordered to engage had neither our dash nor our perfect steadiness under fire they succeeded only in getting themselves cut to pieces and in bringing upon us the most atrocious bombardment that ever was it seems the action before this was nothing to be compared with it my company lost a great many men by the aerial bombs these projectiles measure a meter in height and twenty-seven centimeters in diameter they describe a high curve and fall vertically exploding in the narrowest passages we are several meters deep underground pleasant weather at night we go to the surface for our hard work dearest I wanted to say a heap of things about our joys, but some of them are best left quiet, unawakened. All coarse common pleasure would frighten them away. They might die. I am writing again after a sleep. We get all the sleep we can in our dugouts. I had a pile of thoughts that fatigue prevents my putting in order, but I remember that I evoked Beethoven. I am now precisely at the age he had reached when disaster came upon him and i admired his great example his energies at work in spite of suffering the impediment must have seemed to him as grave as what is before me seems to us but he conquered to my mind beethoven is the most magnificent of human translations of the creative power i am writing badly for i am still asleep how easy how kind were all the circumstances of my return i left the house alone but passing a battery of artillery i was accosted by the non-commissioned officers with offers of the most friendly hospitality 
the artillery are devoted to the tenth for we defend them and as the good fellows are not even exposed to the rain they pity us exceedingly i must close abruptly loving you for your courage that so sustains me whatever happens i have recovered joy the night i came was so lovely march twenty six dearly beloved mother nothing new in our position the organizing goes on interesting but not easy work the fine weather prospers it now and again our pickaxes come upon a poor dead man whom the war harasses even in his grave march twenty eight on the heights a grey sunday weather broken by yesterday's bombardment we are again in full fight a great attack from our side has repeated the carnage of last week my company which was cut up in the last assault was spared this time we had nothing to do but occupy a sector of the defence so we got only splashes of the fighting on the loveliest saturday of this spring i had a distant view of the battle i saw the crawling beast that a battalion looks like twisting as it advances under the smoke of the guns the chasseurs appeared go forward in spite of the machine guns and the bombardment french and german these fine fellows did what they had to do in spite of all and have made amends for the check we had last week when our attack was a failure for a month past i have been living raffet's lithographs with this difference that in his time one could be an eye-witness in comparative safety at the distance where i stood for the guns of those days did not shoot far but i saw fine things in that great plain beneath our heights a hundred thousand fires of bursting shells and the chasseurs climbing climbing sunday march twenty eighth second letter dear mother radiant weather rose this morning i have been a long way over our sector and now the bombardment begins again and grows and still i turn my thoughts to hope whatever happens i pray for wisdom for you and for me dearest i feel at times how easy it would be to turn again to those pursuits that were once the charm and interest of my life at times i catch myself in this lovely spring so bent upon painting that i mourn because i paint no more but i compel myself to master all the resources of my will and to keep them to the difficult straits of this life april first a sun that lays bare the lovely youth of the spring the stream of the muse runs through this rich and comely village which the echoes of the cannonade reach only as a dull thud their meaning lost we have had to change again as the reinforcements are arriving in such numbers that our places are wanted and it is always our regiment that has to turn out but to-day all is freshness and light the great rich plain that is edged by the muse uplands has its distance all invested in the tenderest silver tones i am pleased with gabriel's letter it shows me what things will be laid upon the heart of france when these events are at an end a touching letter from pierre cured at last of his terrible wound a splendid letter from grandmother how she longs for our meeting again i cannot speak of it i finished this letter by the waterside recalling with delight the joys i used to have in painting before me are the sparkling rays of spring april third postcard only a word from the second line we are in the spring woods sun and rain at play in the sky courage through all april third second letter i wish i had written you better letters in these days every minute of which has been sweet to me even when we were in the front line but i confess that i was satisfied just to let myself live in the beauty of the days serene days in spite of the clamours of war we know nothing of what is to happen but there is more movement coming and going shall we have to bear the shock again think what it was for us when we were last in the front line to have to spend whole days in the dugout that the odious bombardment had compelled us to hollow out of the hillside ten metres deep there in complete darkness night was awaited for the chance to get out but once my fellow non-commissioned officers and i began humming the nine symphonies of beethoven i cannot tell what thrill woke those notes within us they seemed to kindle great lights in the cave we forgot the chinese torture of being unable to lie or sit or stand the life of a sergeant in billets is really quite pleasant but i take no advantage as to the front i hope providence will give me strength of heart to do my duty there to the very end a good friend of mine who is my section chief has been appointed adjutant to our company this is all trivial enough but dearest i am in a rather feeble state i was not well after the events of last month so i let myself glide over the gentle slopes of my life suppose one comes to skirt a precipice may providence keep us away from the edge april four darling mother 
a time of anxious waiting, big with the menace of near things. Meanwhile, however, idleness and quiet. I am not able to think, and I give myself up to my fate. Beloved, don't find fault with me if for a month past I have been below the mark. Love me and tell our friends to love me. Did you get my photograph? It was taken at the fortunate time of our position here, when we were having peaceful days with no immediate enemy except the cold. A few days later I was made corporal, and my life became hard enough, burdened with very ungrateful labours. After that the storm, and the lights of that storm are still bright in my life. April 4, Evening of Easter Sunday Dear Mother, we are again in the immediate care of God. At two o'clock we march towards the storm. Beloved, I think of you. I think of you both. I love you and I entrust the three of us to the providence of God. May everything that happens find us ready. In the full power of my soul I pray for this on your behalf, on mine. Hope through all, but before else wisdom and love. I kiss you without more words. All my mind is now set upon the hard work to be done. April 5, 1 o'clock a.m. Dear Mother and dear Grandmother, we are off. Courage, wisdom and love. Perhaps all this is ordained for the good of all. I can but send you my whole love. My life is lived in you alone. April 5, towards noon. Dear Mother, we are now to be put to the proof. Up to this moment there has been no sign that mercy was failing us. It is for us to strive to deserve it. This afternoon we shall need all our resolution, and we shall have to call upon the supreme wisdom for help. Dear Beloved Mother, Dear Grandmother, I wish I could still have the delight of getting your letters. Let us pray that we may be strengthened even in what is before us now. Dear darling, once more, all my love for you both. Your son. April 6, noon. Dear beloved mother, it is midday, and we are at the forward position in readiness. I send you my whole love. Whatever comes to pass, life has had its beauty. Editor's Note it was in the fight of this day, April 6, that the writer of these letters disappeared. End of Letters of a Soldier by Anonymous Mary Louise and the Liberty Girls by Edith Van Dyne Chapter 3 The Liberty Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Three: The Liberty Girls. An hour later, six girls met at the home of Alora Jones, who lived with her father in a fine mansion across the street from Colonel Hathaway's residence. These girls were prepared to work and worked diligently under the leadership of Mary Louise, for they had been planning and discussing this event for several days, patiently awaiting the word to start their campaign. Some girls, said Mary Louise, are knitting, and that's a good thing to do in a way. Others are making pajamas and pillows for the Red Cross, and that's also an admirable thing to do. But our duty lies on a higher plane, for we're going to get money to enable Uncle Sam to take care of our soldier boys. Do you think we can make people buy bonds? asked little Laura Hilton, with a trace of doubt in her voice. Mary Louise gave her a severe look. We not only can, but we shall make people buy, she replied. We shall ask them very prettily, and they cannot refuse us. We've all been loaded to the brim with arguments, if arguments are necessary, but we haven't time to gossip with folks. A whole lot of money must be raised, and there's a short time to do it in. Seems to me, remarked Edna Barlow earnestly, we're wasting time just now. Let's get busy. Well, get on your costumes, girls, suggested Delora Jones. They're all here in this big box, and the banners are standing in the hall. It's after nine now and by ten o'clock we must all be at work. They proceeded to dress themselves in the striking costumes they had secretly prepared, a blue silk waist with white stars scattered over it, a red and white striped skirt, the stripes running from waistband to hem, a goddess of liberty cap and white canvas shoes. Attired in this fashion, the Liberty Girls, as they had dubbed themselves, presented a most attractive and patriotic appearance, and as they filed out through the hall each seized a handsome silken banner, gold-fringed, which bore the words, Buy Bonds of Dorfield's Liberty Girls. Now then, said Mary Louise, we have each been allotted a certain district in the business part of the city, for which we are individually responsible. Each one knows what she is expected to do. Let no one escape. 
If any man claims to have already bought bonds, make him buy more. And remember, we're all to meet at my house at one o'clock for luncheon and to report progress. A block away they secured seats in a street car, and a few minutes thereafter reached the four corners, the intersection of the two principal streets of Dorfield. But on the way they had sold old Jonathan Dodd, who happened to be in the car and was overawed by the display of red, white, and blue, two hundred dollars worth of bonds. As for old man Dodd, he realized he was trapped, and bought his limit with a sigh of resignation. As they separated at the four corners, each to follow her appointed route, many surprised, if not startled, citizens regarded the Liberty Girls with approving eyes. They were pretty girls, all of them, and their silken costumes were really becoming. The patriots gazed admiringly. The more selfish citizens gave a little shiver of dismay and scurried off to escape meeting these aggressive ones, whose gorgeous banners frankly proclaimed their errand. Mary Louise entered the bank on the corner and made inquiry for Mr. Jaswell, the president. "'We're off at last, sir,' she said, smiling at his bewildered looks. "'And we girls are determined to make the Dorfield people do their full duty. May we depend on your bank to fulfill your promises and carry those bond buyers who wish to make time payments?' "'To be sure, my dear,' replied the banker. "'I'd no idea you young ladies were to wear uniforms. "'But you certainly look fascinating, if you're a fair sample of the others, "'and I don't see how anyone can refuse to back up our girls in their patriotic drive. "'God bless you, Mary Louise, and help you to achieve your noble object.' "'There were many offices in the building, above the bank, "'and the girl visited every one of them. "'Her appearance, garbed in the national colours and bearing her banner, "'was a sign of conquest,' for it seemed to these busy men as if Uncle Sam himself was backing this crusade, and all their latent patriotism was stirred to the depths. So they surrendered at discretion and signed for the bonds. Mary Louise was modest and sweet in demeanor. Her pleas were as pleasant as they were persuasive. There was nothing virulent or dominant in her attitude. But when she said, "'Really, Mr. So-and-so, you ought to take more bonds than that. You can afford it, and our country needs the money.' The argument was generally effective, and when she had smilingly pinned the bond button on a man's coat and passed on to interview others, she left him wondering why he had bought more bonds than he ever had intended to, or even provoked with himself that he had subscribed at all. These were the people who had generally resisted all former pleadings of the regular committee, and had resolved to ignore the bond sale altogether. But perhaps their chagrin was equalled by their satisfaction in having been won over by a pretty girl whose manner and appearance were alike irresistible. The men of Dorfield are a fair sample of men everywhere. At this period the full meaning of the responsibilities we had assumed in this tremendous struggle was by no means fully realized. The war was too far away, and life at home was still running in its accustomed grooves. They could not take the European war to themselves, nor realize that it might sweep away their prosperity, their liberties, even their homes. Fear had not yet been aroused, pity for our suffering and hard-pressed allies was still lightly considered, the war had not struck home to the hearts of the people as it has since. I doubt if even Mary Louise fully realized the vital importance of the work she had undertaken. When the Liberty Girls met at Colonel Hathaway's for a light luncheon, their eyes were sparkling with enthusiasm and their cheeks rosy from successful effort. Their individual sales varied, of course, for some were more tactful in winning than others, but all had substantial results to report. "'We've taken Dorfield by storm!' was their exultant cry. "'Altogether,' said Mary Louise, figuring up the amounts, "'we've sold thirty-two thousand dollars' worth of bonds this morning. That's encouraging for three hours' work, but it's not enough to satisfy us. We must put in a busy afternoon and try to get a total of at least one hundred thousand by tonight.' Tomorrow we must do better than that. Work as late as you can, girls, and at eight o'clock we will meet again at Alora's house and compare results. The girls needed no urging to resume their work, for already they had gained confidence in their ability and were inspired to renewed effort. Mary Louise had optimistic plans for that afternoon's work. She first visited the big flour mill, where she secured an interview with Mr. Chisholm, the president and general manager. "'We can't buy bonds,' he said peevishly. "'Our business is being ruined by the high price of wheat and the absurd activities of Hoover. "'We stand to operate at a loss, or else shut down altogether. "'The government ought to pay us compensation instead of asking us to contribute to the war.' "'However, if we fail to win the war,' Mary Louise quietly replied, "'your enormous investment here will become worthless.' 
isn't it better to lose a little now for the sake of future winnings than to sacrifice the past and future and be reduced to poverty we're asking you to save yourself from threatened danger the national calamity that would follow our defeat in this war he sat back in his chair and looked at the girl in amazement she was rather young to have conceived such ideas well there's time enough to consider all that he said less gruffly you'll have to excuse me now miss burroughs i'm busy but mary louise kept her seat and redoubled her arguments which were logical and straight to the point mr chisholm's attitude might have embarrassed her had she been pleading a personal favor but she felt she was the mouthpiece of the president of the nation of worldwide democracy and would not allow herself to feel annoyed she devoted three quarters of an hour to mr chisholm who gradually thawed in her genial sunshine she finally sold him fifty thousand dollars worth of liberty bonds and went on her way elated the regular bond committee had labored for weeks with this stubborn man who managed one of the largest enterprises in dorfield yet they had signally failed to convince him or to induce him to subscribe a dollar the girl had succeeded in less than an hour and sold him exactly the amount he should have bought the mill subscription was a powerful leverage with which to pry money from other reluctant ones stacks sellem and stacks the big department store heretofore resisting all appeals bought from mary louise's bonds to the amount of twenty five thousand the dennis hardware company took ten thousand then mary louise met her first serious rebuff she went into silas herring's wholesale grocery establishment and told mr herring she wanted to sell him bonds this is outrageous cried herring indignantly when the men can't rob us or force us back to england in her selfish schemes they set girls on us to wheedle us out of money we've honestly earned this hold-up game won't work i assure you and i advise you to get into more respectable business my money is mine it doesn't belong to the allies and they won't get a cent of it he was getting more angry as he proceeded in his harangue moreover he continued our weak administration can't use me to help it out of the hole it has foolishly stumbled into or make america the cat's paw to pull british chestnuts out of the fire you ought to be ashamed, Miss Burroughs, to lend yourself to such unpatriotic methods of bulldozing honest citizens. Mary Louise was distressed, but undaunted. The man was monstrously wrong, and she knew it. Sitting in Mr. Herring's private office at the time were Professor John Dyer, the superintendent of Dorfield Schools, and the Honorable Andrew Duncan, a leading politician, a former representative and now one of the county supervisors. The girl looked at Professor Dyer, whom she knew slightly, and said pleadingly, won't you defend our administration and our country mr dyer he smiled depreciatingly but did not speak he was a tall lean man quite round-shouldered and of studious appearance he wore double eyeglasses underneath which his eyes were somewhat watery the smile upon his thin features was a stationary one not as if assumed but moulded with the features and lacking geniality it was the hon andrew duncan who answered the liberty girl the difference between mr herring and eighty per cent of the american people said he in stilted pompous tones is that our friend herring unwisely voices his protest while the others merely think and consider it the part of wisdom to say nothing i don't believe that cried mary louise indignantly the american people are loyal to their president there may be a few traitors we're gradually discovering them but i'm busy herring interrupted her scowling and swung his chair so that his back was toward her you won't be busy long if you keep talking that way predicted the girl tut tut said the hon andrew warningly your threats young lady are as unwise as mr herring's speech but they carry more weight she asserted stoutly do you think any grocery man in dorfield would buy goods of mr herring if he knew him to be disloyal in this our country's greatest crisis and they're going to know it if i have to visit each one and tell him myself what mr herring has said a tense if momentary silence followed broken by the professor who now said in his smooth unctuous way mr herring's blunt expression of his sentiments was not intended for other ears than ours i'm sure in confidence one may say many things to friends which he would prefer to withhold from an indiscriminating public we are well assured indeed that mr herring is a loyal american with america's best interests at heart but he does not regard our present national activities as leniently as we do i have been endeavouring in my humble way to change his attitude of mind here herring swung around and looked at the speaker stolidly 
and though I admit he is a bit obstinate, I venture to assure you, Miss Burroughs, that Silas Herring will stand by the Stars and Stripes as long as there is a shred of our banner to wave in the breeze of freedom, justice, and democracy. A cynical smile gradually settled on the grocer's stern face. The Honorable Andrew was smiling with undisguised cheerfulness. "'We are all loyal, thoroughly loyal,' said the latter. "'I've bought some Liberty Bonds already, my girl, but you can put me down for a hundred dollars more. We must support our country in every possible way, with effort, with money, with our flesh and blood. I have no children, but my two nephews and a second cousin are now in France.' "'For my part,' added Professor Dyer, "'I have hesitated as to how much of my meagre salary I can afford to spend. But I think I can handle five hundred dollars' worth.' "'Thank you,' said Mary Louise, somewhat puzzled by these offers. "'It isn't like risking the money. It's a solid investment in the best securities in the world.' "'I know,' returned the professor, nodding gravely. "'But I'm not thinking of that. I'm a poor man, as you probably know. But what I have is at my country's disposal, since it's evident that my country needs it.' "'Doesn't that shame you, sir?' asked Mary Louise brightly, as she turned to Silas Herring. "'You're a business man, and they say, although I confess I doubt it, that you're a loyal American. You can convince me of the facts by purchasing a liberal share of bonds. Then I can forget your dreadful words. Then I can carry to every one the news that you've made a splendid investment in Liberty Bonds. Even if you honestly think the administration has been at fault, it won't do any good to grumble. We're in this war, sir, and we've got to win it, that you and every other American may enjoy prosperity and freedom. How much shall I say that you have subscribed, Mr. Herring? He studied her face, his expression never changing. Mary Louise wondered if he could read her suspicion and dislike of him, despite her efforts to smother those feelings in the cause of liberty. Then Herring looked at Professor Dyer, who stood meekly with downcast eyes. Next the grocer gazed at the supervisor, who smiled in a shrewd way and gave a brief nod. Mr. Herring frowned. He drummed nervously with his fingers on his mahogany desk. Then he reached for his checkbook and with grim deliberation wrote a check and handed it to Mary Louise. "'You've won, young lady,' he admitted. "'I'm too good an American to approve what has been done down at Washington, but I'll help keep our flag waving, as the professor suggests. When we've won our war, and of course we shall win, there will be a day of reckoning for every official who is judged by our citizens to have been disloyal, however high his station. Good afternoon.' The first impulse of Mary Louise was to crumple up the check and throw it in the man's face, to show her resentment of his base insinuations. But as she glanced at the check she saw it was for ten thousand dollars, and that meant sinews of war, help for our soldiers and our allies. She couldn't thank the man, but she bowed coldly and left the private office. Professor Dyer accompanied her, and at the outer door he said to the girl, "'Silas Herring's heart is in the right place, as you see by his generous check. Of course he might have bought more bonds than that, as he is very wealthy, but he's an obstinate man, and it is a triumph for our sacred cause that he was induced to buy it all. You're doing noble work, my child, and I admire you for having undertaken the task. If I can be of service to you, pray command me. Urge everyone you meet to buy bonds, suggested Mary Louise. She did not care to discuss Silas Herring. I'll do that indeed, promised the school superintendent. But as he watched her depart there was a queer expression on his lean face that it was well Mary Louise did not see. End of Mary Louise and the Liberty Girls Chapter 3 by Edith Van Dyne Chapter 5 of Many Fronts The Passing of a Zeppelin by Louis R. Freeman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Passing of a Zeppelin In the year that had gone by since the first great air raid on London, we knew that much had been done in the way of strengthening the defenses. Just what had been done, we did not, of course, and do not know. We knew that there were more and better guns and searchlights, and probably greatly improved means of anticipating the coming of the raiders, and of following and reporting their movements after they did come. At the same time, we also knew that the latest Zeppelin had been greatly improved, that it was larger, faster, capable of ascending to a greater altitude, 
and probably able to stand more and heavier gunfire than its prototype of a year ago it seemed to be a question therefore of whether or not the guns could range the raiders and if so do them any vital damage when they did hit them the aeroplane was an unknown quantity and in the popular mind at least not seriously reckoned with london knew that the crucial test would not come until an airship tried again to penetrate to the heart of the metropolitan area and awaited the result calmly if not quite indifferently the zeppelin raids of the spring and early summer numerous as they had been had done a negligible amount of military damage and scarcely more to civil property the death list too had mercifully been very low it seemed significant however that the main london defences had been avoided during all of this time indicating apparently that the raiders were reluctant to lift the lid of the pandora's box that was laid out so temptingly before them for fear of the possible consequences twice or thrice watching with my glasses after i had been awakened by distant bomb explosions or gunfire i had seen a shell pocketed airship draw back as a yellow dog refuses the challenge that his intrusion has provoked and glide off into the darkness of some safer area would they try it again was the question londoners asked themselves as the dark of the moon came round each month and except for the comparatively few who had personal experience of the terror and death that follow the swath of an air raider most of them seemed rather anxious to have the matter put to the test last night just twelve darks of the moon after the first great raid of nineteen fifteen the test came it was hardly a conclusive one perhaps though that may well have come before these lines find their way into print but it was certainly highly illuminative i write this on my return to london from viewing twenty miles away a tangled mass of wreckage and a heap of charred trunks that are all that remain of a zeppelin and its crew which whether by accident intent or the force of circumstances will probably never be known rushed in where two others of its aerial sisters feared to fly and paid the cost there was nothing of the surprise to london at least as regards the ill-starred zeppelin crew none can say in last night's raid the night grew more heavily overcast as the darkness deepened and towards midnight stealthy little beams of hooded searchlights pirouetting on the eastern clouds told the home wending saturday night theatre crowd that with the imminent approach of the raiders london was lifting a corner of its mask of blackness and throwing out an open challenge to the enemy this was the first time i had known the lights to precede the actual explosion of bombs and the cool confidence of the thing suggested as i heard one policeman tell another that the defence had something up their sleeves it was towards one in the morning when i finished my supper at a west end restaurant and started walking through the almost deserted streets to my hotel london is anything but a bedlam after midnight but the silence in the early hours of this morning was positively uncanny now with the last of the buses gone and all trains stopped only the muffled buzz of an occasional belated taxi pushing on cautiously with hooded lights broke the stillness reaching my room i pulled on a sweater ran up the curtain laid my glass ready and seated myself at the window the same window from which a year ago i had watched those two insolently contemptuous raiders sail across overhead and leave a blazing wake of death and destruction behind them on that night i reflected i had felt the rush of air from the bombs and later 
had watched the firemen extinguishing the flames and the ambulances carrying the wounded to the hospitals. Would it be like that tonight? I wondered. There was now no doubt that the raiders were near, for the searchlights had multiplied, and far to the southeast, though no detonations were audible, quick flashes told of scattering gunfire. Or would the defense have more of a word to say for itself this time? I looked to the eastern heavens where the shifting clouds were now polka-dotted with the fluttering golden motes of a score of searchlights, and thought I had found my answer. There was no wheeling and reeling of the lights in wide circles as a year ago, but rather a steady, persistent stabbing at the clouds, each one appearing to keep to an allotted area of its own. Stabbing expresses the action exactly, and it recalled to me an occasion a month ago when a Tommy, who was showing me through some captured dugouts on the Somme, illustrated with bayonet thrusts the manner in which they had originally searched for Germans hiding under the straw mattresses. There was nothing panicky in the work of the lights this time, but only the suggestion of methodical, ordered, relentless vigilance. Encouraging as a preliminary, I said to myself, Now, for the night was electric with import, for the main event. There was not long to wait. To the southeast the gun flashes had increased in frequency, followed by mist-dulled blurs of brightness in the clouds that told of bursting shells. Suddenly, through a rift in the clouds, I saw a new kind of glare, the earthward-launched beam of an airship searchlight groping for its target. But the shifting mist curtain intervened again, even as one of the defending lights took up the challenge and flashed its own rapier ray in quick reply. Presently, the muffled boom of bombs fleeted to my ears, and then the sharper rattle of a sudden gust of gunfire. This was quickly followed by a confused roar of sound, evidently from many bombs dropped simultaneously or in quick succession, and I knew that one of two things had happened. Either the raider had found its mark and was delivering rapid fire, or the guns were making it so hot for the visitor that it had been compelled to dump its explosives and seek safety in flight. When a minute or more had gone by, I felt sure that the latter had been scuttled and that it was now only a question of which direction the flight was going to take. Again the eastern searchlights gave me the answer. By twos and threes, I could not follow the order of the thing. The lights that had been patrolling the eastern sky moved over and took their station around a certain low-hanging cloud to the south. The murky sheet of cumulonimbus seemed to pale and dissolve in the concentrated rays. And then, right into the focus of golden glow formed by the dancing light motes, running wild and blind as a bull charges the red mantle masking the matador, darted a huge zeppelin. Perhaps never before in all time has a single object been the center of so blinding a glare. It seemed that the optic nerve must wither in so fierce a light, and certainly no unprotected eye could have opened to it. Dark glasses might have made it bearable, but could not possibly have resolved the earthward prospect into anything less than the heart of a fiery furnace. Indeed, it was very doubtful if the bewildered fugitive knew, in more than the most general way, where it was. Cut off by the guns to the southeast from a retreat in that direction, but knowing that the North Sea and safety could be reached by driving to the northeast, it is more than probable that the harried raider found itself over the lion's den rather because it could not help it than by deliberate intent. What a contrast was this blinded, reeling thing to those arrogantly purposeful raiders of a year ago! 
supremely disdainful of gun and searchlight, these had prowled over London till the last of their bombs had been planted, and one of them had even circled back, the better to see the ruin its passing had wrought. But this raider, far larger than its predecessors, and flying at over twice as great a height though it was, dashed on its erratic course as though pursued by the vengeful spirits of those its harpy sisters had bombed to death in their beds. If it still had bombs to drop, its commander either had no time or no heart for the job. Never have I seen an inanimate thing typify terror, the terror that must have gripped the hearts of its palpably flustered, to judge by the airship's movements, crew, like that staggering, helpless maverick of a zeppelin when it finally found itself clutched in the tentacles of the searchlights of the aerial defences of London. All this time the weird, uncanny silence that brooded over the streets before I had come indoors held the city in its spell. The watching thousands, nay, millions, kept their excitement in leash, and the propeller of the raider, muffled by the mists intervening between the earth and the twelve thousand feet at which it whirred, dulled to a drowsy drone. Into this tense silence the sudden fire of a hundred anti-aircraft guns, opening in unison as though at the pull of a single lanyard, cut in a blended roar like the crack of doom. Indeed, though few among those hushed watching millions realized it, it was, literally, the crack of doom that was sounding. For perhaps a minute, or a minute and a half, the air was vibrant with the roar of hard-pumped guns and the shriek of speeding shell, the great sound from below drowning the sharper cracks from the steel-cold flashes in the upper air. It was guns that were built for the job, not the hastily gathered and wholly inadequate artillery of a year ago, that were speaking now, and the voice was one of ordered, imperious authority. Rangefinders had the marauder's altitude, and the information was being put at the disposal of guns that had the power to deliver the goods at that level. What a contrast the sequel was to that pitiful firing of the other raid. Only the opening shots were shorts or wides now, and ten seconds after the first gun, a diamond-clear burst blinking out through a rift in the upper clouds told that the raider, to use a naval term, was straddled, had shells exploding both above and below it. From that instant till the gun ceased to roar seventy or eighty seconds later, the shells burst, lacing the air with golden glimmers, and meshed the flying raider in a fiery net. For a few seconds it seemed to me that, close woven as was the net of shell bursts, the flashes came hardly as fast as the roar of the guns would seem to warrant, and I swept the heavens with my glasses in a search for other possible targets. But no other raider was in sight. There was no other nodal center of gunfire and searchlights. Suddenly, the reason for the apparent discrepancy was clear to me. The flashes I saw, except for a few of the shrapnel bullets they were releasing, were only the misses. The hits I could not see. The long-awaited test was at its crucial stage. Empty of bombs and with half of its fuel consumed, the raider was at the zenith of its flight, and yet the guns were ranging it with ease. It was now a question of how much shell-fire the zeppelin could stand. In spite of the fact that the airship, so far as I could see through my glasses, did not appear to slow down or to be perceptibly racked by the gunfire, I have no doubt what the end would have been if the test could have been pressed to its conclusion in an open country. But bringing a burning zeppelin down across three or four blocks of thickly settled London 
was hardly a thing the air defense desired to do if it could possibly be avoided the plan was carried to its conclusion with the almost mathematical precision that marked the preliminary searchlight work and gunnery from the moment that it had burst into sight the raider had been emitting clouds of white gas to hide itself from the searchlights and guns while the plainly visible movements of its lateral plane seemed to indicate that it was making desperate efforts to climb still higher into the thinning upper air neither expedient was of much use the swirling gas cloud might well have obscured a hovering airship but never one that was rushing through the air at seventy miles an hour while far from increasing its altitude there seemed to be a slight but steady loss from the moment the gun ceased until two or three miles farther along it was hidden from sight for a minute by a low hanging cloud undoubtedly the aim of the gunners had been to hole not to fire the marauder and it must have been losing gas very rapidly even as the climactic moment of the attack approached at the time increased buoyancy was most desirable the massed searchlights of london let go shortly after the gunfire ceased and now as the raider came within their field the more scattered lights of the northern suburbs wheeled up and fastened on the fugitive changed its course from north to northeasterly about this time and the swelling clouds of vapor left behind presently cut off its foreshortened length entirely from my view a heavy ground mist appeared to prevail beyond the heights to the north and in the diffused glow of the searchlights that strove to pierce this mask my glasses showed the ghostly shadows of flitting aeroplanes maneuvering for the death thrust the ground mist which did not however cover london proper kept the full strength of the searchlights from the upper air and it was in a sky of almost stygian blackness that the final blow was sent home the farmers of hertfordshire tell weird stories of the detonations of bursting bombs striking their fields but all these sounds were absorbed in the twenty-mile air cushion that was now interposed between my vantage point and the final scene of action not a sound not a shadow heralded the flare of yellow light which suddenly flashed out in the northeastern heavens and spread latitudinally until the whole body of a zeppelin no small object even at twenty miles stood out in glowing incandescence then a great sheet of pink-white flame shot up and in the ripples of rosy light which suffused the earth for scores of miles i could read the gilded lettering on my binoculars this was undoubtedly the explosion of the ignited hydrogen of the main gas bags and immediately following it the great frame collapsed in the middle and began falling slowly toward the earth burning now with a bright yellow flame above which the curl of black smoke was distinctly visible a lurid burst of light doubtless from the exploding petrol tanks flared up as the flaming mass struck the earth and half a minute later the night save for the questioning searchlights to the east and south was as black as ever again then perhaps the strangest thing of all occurred london began to cheer I should have been prepared for it in Paris or Rome or Berlin or even New York, but that the Briton, who of all men in the world most fears the sound of his own voice lifted in unrestrained jubilation, was really cheering, and in millions, was almost too much. I pinched my arm to be sure that I had not dozed away and, lost in wonder, forgot for a minute or two the great drama just enacted under my window half a dozen australian tommies were rending the air with cooees and dancing around a lamp-post while all along the street from doorways and windows 
exultant shouting could be heard for several blocks in all directions the cheers rang out loud and clear distinctly recognizable as such the sound of the millions of throats farther afield came only as a heavy rumbling hum perhaps since the dawn of creation the air has not trembled with so strange a sound a sound which though entirely human in its origin was still unhuman unearthly fantastic certainly never before in history not even during the great volcanic eruptions has so huge a number of people the fall of the zeppelin had been visible through a fifty to seventy five mile radius in all directions a region with probably from ten million to fifteen million inhabitants been suddenly and intensely stirred by a single event it was undoubtedly the spectacularity of the unexpected coup that had made these normally repressed millions so suddenly and so violently vocal many perhaps most stopped cheering when they had time to realize that a score of human beings were being burned to cinders in the heart of that flaming comet in the northeastern heavens others i knew the only recently restored tenements where some of them were must have shouted in all the grimmer exultation for that very realization i can hardly say yet which stirred me more deeply the fall of the zeppelin itself or that stupendous burst of feeling aroused by its fall by taxi milk cart tram and any other conveyance that offered but mostly on foot i threaded highway and byway for the next four hours and shortly after daybreak scrambled through the last of a dozen thorny hedgerows and found myself beside the still smouldering wreckage of the fallen raider an orderly cordon of soldiers surrounded an arc of blackened and twisted metal miles and miles of tangled wire and a score or so of flying corps men already busily engaged loading the wreckage into waiting motor lorries that was about all there was to see a ten-foot square green tarpaulin covered all that could be gathered together of the airship's crew some of the fragments were readily recognizable as having once been the arms and legs and trunks of men others were not a man at my elbow stood gazing at the pitiful heap for a space his brow puckered in thought presently he turned to me a grim light in his eye and spoke do you know he said that these indicating the charred stumps under the square of canvas have just recalled to me the words count zeppelin is reported to have used at a great mass meeting called in berlin to press for a more rigorous prosecution of the war against england by air for a further increase of frightfulness leading two airship pilots to the front of the platform he shouted to the crowd here are two men who were over london last night and the assembled thousands so the dispatch said roared their applause and clamoured that the zeppelins be sent again and again until the arrogant englanders were brought to their knees well he paused and drew a deep breath as his eyes returned to the heap of blackened fragments it appears that they did send the zeppelins again more than ever were sent before and now it is our turn to be presented to the men who were over london last night i wonder if the flare that consumed these poor devils was bright enough to pierce the black night that has settled over germany the tenseness passed out of the night and the raid was over who knows but what so far as the threat to england is concerned the passing of a zeppelin marked also the passing of the zeppelin end of chapter five of many fronts the passing of a zeppelin by lewis r freeman read by scott daniker 
Elizabeth City, North Carolina. The Soul of Nation by Philip Gibbs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It did not seem an unknown warrior whose body came on a gun carriage down Whitehall, where we were waiting for him. He was known to us all. It was one of those our boys, not warriors, as we call them, in the days of darkness led by faith. To some women, weeping a little in the crowd after an all-night vigil, he was their boy who went missing one day and was never found till now though their souls went searching for him through the dreadful places in the night. To many men among those packed densely on each side of the empty street, wearing ribbons and badges on civil clothes, he was a familiar figure, one of their comrades, the one they liked best, perhaps, in the old crowd who, into the fields of death, went and stayed there with a great companionship. It was a steel helmet, a old tin hat, lying there on the crimson of the flag, which revealed him instantly, not as a mythical warrior, aloof from common humanity, a shadowy type of national pride and martial glory, but as one of those fellows dressed in the drab of khaki, stained by mud and grease, who went into dirty ditches with a steel hat on his head and in his heart unspoken things which made him one of us in courage and in fear with some kind of faith not clear full of perplexities often dim in the watchwords of those years of war so it seemed to me at least as i looked down whitehall a lesson to the music which told us that the unknown was coming down the road the band was playing the old dead march in Seoul was heavy drumming, but as yet the roadway was clear where we led up to that altar of sacrifice, as it looked, covered by two flags hanging in long folds of scarlet and white. About that altar cenotaph there were little groups of strange people, all waiting for the dead soldier. Why were they there, these people? They were great folk to greet the dust of a simple soldier. There was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Bishop of London, and other clergy in gowns and hoods. What had they to do with the body of the soldier, who had gone trudging through the mud and the muck, like one ant in the legion of ants? Unknown to fame, not more heroic, perhaps, than all his pals about him, not missed much when he fell dead between the tangled wire and shell holes. There were great generals and admirals. Lord Haig himself, commander-in-chief of our armies in France, and Admiral Beatty, who held the seas, Lord French of Ypres, with Horn of the First Army, and Ben of the Third, and Air Marshal Trenchard, who had commanded all the birds that flew above the lines on mornings of enormous battle. These were high powers, infinitely remote, perhaps, in the imagination of the man whose dust was now being brought toward them. It was their brains that had directed these movements down the long roads which galled his feet, over ground churned up by gunfire, up the dark boards from which he slept under his heavy pack if he were a foot slogger, and whatever his class as a soldier, ordained at last the end of his journey, which finished in the grave marked by the metal desk. Unknown in life, he had looked upon these generals as terrifying in their power for the likes of him. Sometimes, perhaps, he had saluted them as they rode past. Now they stood in Whitehall to salute him to keep silence in his presence, to render him homage more 
wonderful with deeper reverence than any general of the mall had, has had there are princesses there about the cenotaph not only of england but of the indian empire these indian rajas that old white-bearded white turbaned man with the face of an eastern prophet was it possible they too were out to pay homage to the unknown british soldier there was something of the light of flanders in whitehall the strange light that the tattered ruins of the cloth hall at ypres used to shine with through the mist suffused a little by one sunlight white as the walls and turrets of the war office in the midst of london the tower of big ben was dim through the mist like the tower of albert church until it fell into a heap of dust under the fury of gunfire presently the sun shone brighter so that a picture of white hall was etched with deeper lines on all the buildings flags were flying at half-mast the people who kept moving about the cenotaph were there for the morning not for mere pageantry grenadier officers who walked about with drawn swords wore crape on their arms presently they passed the word along reverse arms and all along the line of route soldiers turned over their rifles and bent their heads over the butts it was when the music of the dead march came louder up the street a number of black figures stood in a separate group apart from the admirals and generals people of importance to whom the eyes of the crowd turned while men and women tiptoed to get a glimpse of them the prime minister and the ministers and ex-ministers of britain were there asquith lord curzon and other statesmen who in those years of conflict were responsible for all the mighty efforts of the nation who stirred up its passions and emotions who organized its labor and service who won that victory at this peace i thought the people about me stared at them as though conscious of the task that is theirs now that peace is the test of victory but it was one figure who stood alone as the symbol of the nation in this tribute to the spirit of our dead as big ben struck three quarters after ten the king advanced toward the cenotaph followed by the prince of wales the prince's two brothers and the duke of connaught and while others stood in line looking toward the top of whitehall the king was a few paces ahead of them alone waiting motionless for the body of the unknown warrior who had died in his service it was very silent in whitehall and therefore this ordered silence the dense lines of people kept their places without any movement only spoke little in their long time of waiting and then as they caught their first glimpse of the gun carriage were utterly quiet all heads were bared and bent their emotion was as though a little cold breeze were passing one seemed to feel the spirit of the crowd above all this mass of plain people something touched one with a sharp yet softening touch the massed bands passed with their noble music and their drums thumping at the hearts of men and women the guards with their reversed arms and then the gun carriage with its team of horses halted in front of the cenotaph where the king stood and the royal hand was raised to salute the soldier who had died that we might live chosen by fate for this honor which is in remembrance of that great army of comrades who went out with him to no man's land the king laid a wreath on his coffin and then stepped back again crowded behind the gun carriage in one long vista was an immense column of men of all branches of the navy and army moving up slowly before coming to a halt and behind again other men 
in several clothes, and everywhere among them and above them were flowers in the form of wreaths and crosses. The knoll was still, and the picture was complete, framing in that coffin, where the steel hat and the king's sword lay upon the flag which draped it, the soul of the nation at its best, purified at this moment by this emotion, was there in silence about the dust of that unknown. Guns were being fired somewhere in the distance. They were not loud, but like the distant thumping of the guns on a misty day in Flanders, when there was nothing to report, though on such a day perhaps this man had died. Presently there was a far-off wailing like the cry of a banshee. It was a siren giving the warning of silence in some place by the river. The deep notes of Big Ben struck eleven, and then the king turned quickly to the lever behind him, touched it, and let fall the great flax which had draped it, a grim hard thing, like a pagan altar, as it seemed to me. The cenotaph stood revealed, utterly austere, except for three standards with their gilt wreath. It was a time of silence. What thoughts were in the minds of all the people, only God knows, as they stood there for those two minutes, which were very long. There was a dead stillness in Whitehall, only broken here and there by the coughing of a man or woman, quickly hushed. The unknown warrior was it young Jack, perhaps, who had never been found? Was it one of those fellows in the battalion that moved up through Ypres before the height of the battle in the bogs? Men were smoking this side of Ypres. One could see the glow of their cigarette ends as they were halted round the old mill house at Flamertinger. It rained after that beating sharply on the tin hats, pouring in spouts down waterproof capes. They went out through Menon Gate. The shelling began along the dark boards by West Hawk Ridge. Gas shelling, every old thing. Fellows dropped into the shell holes full of water. They had their packs on, or their fighting kit. Some of them lay there in the pits, where the water was reddish. There were a lot of unknown warriors in the box by Glencore's Wood and Inverness Corps. They lay by the upturned tanks that sank in the slime. Queer how the fellows used to drop and never give a sound, so that their powers passed on without knowing. In all sorts of places, the unknown warrior lay down and was not quickly found. In Borland Wood, they were lying after the battle among the river trees, and the fields of the Somme, they lay in the churned-up earth, in Highwood and Delva Wood, at their side of Lopart Wood. It was queer, one day, how the sun shone on Lopart Wood, which was red with autumn tints. The old botch was there then, and the wood seemed to have a thousand eyes staring at our lines, newly dug. An airplane came through the fleecy sky, wonderfully careless of the black shrapnel bursting about it. Wonderful chaps, those airmen. For a man afoot, it wasn't good to stumble in that ground. Barbed wire tore one's hands damnably. There was a boy lying in a tangle of barbed wire. He looked as though he were asleep, but he was dead, all right. The airplane passed overhead with a loud humming song. What is this long silence, all this crowd in London streets, two years after the armistice and peace? Yes, those were the old dreams that have passed, old ghosts passing down Whitehall among the living. The silence ended. Some word rang out. The bugles were blowing. They were sounding the last post 
to the unknown warrior of the great war in which many men died without record or renown farther than whitehall sounded the last post to the dead did the whole army of the dead hear that call to them from the living in the crowd below me women were weeping quietly it was the cry from their hearts that was heard farthest perhaps the men's faces were hard like masks hiding all they thought and felt the king stepped forward again and took the wreath from lord haig and laid it at the base of the cenotaph it was the first of the world of flowers brought as a tribute of living hearts to this altar of the dead admirals and generals and statesmen came with wreath and battalions of police following bearing great trophies of flowers on behalf of fighting men and all their comrades and presently with a gun carriage passed down toward the abbey with the king following behind it on foot with his sons and soldiers there was a moving tide of men and women advancing ceaselessly with floral tributes they waited until the escort of the coffin had passed the blue jackets and marines the air force and infantry and then took their turn to file past the cenotaph and lay their flowers upon the bed of lilies and chrysanthemums which rose above the base as the columns passed i turned eyes left or eyes right to that whole symbol of death if they had eyes to see but they were blind men there who saw only by the light of the spirit and saluted when their guides touched them i said now it is two years after cease fire on the front but in the crowds of whitehall there were men in hospital blue who are still casualties not too well remembered by those in health two of them were legless men but they rode on wheels and with a fine gesture gave the salute as they passed the memorial of those who fought with them and suffered less than perhaps that they do now after the ceremony at the cenotaph the procession reformed and the unknown warrior was borne to westminster abbey there awaited him a great congregation of mourners they came from every class and part of the empire they sat without the distinction of rank as lot had arranged them places titled ladies next to charwomen park artisans by city merchants for all had equal title to be there the gift of a son to br or brother to the country at the door leading to parliament square bishop ryle dean of westminster in a purple and gold embroidered cape with his cannons and choir met the body it was carried shoulder high by eight tall guardsmen and on the war worn union jack that covered it lay a shrapnel helmet a crusader's sword and a wreath of laurel through the transept lined with statues of statesmen and past the high altar the unknown warrior was home and then through the choir into the nave where already many famous fighting men slept just within the west door a great purple square bordered with white marked the site of the grave it is in the pathway of kings for not a monarch can ever again go up to the altar to be crowned but must step over the resting place of the man who died that his kingdom might endure four ladies sat apart and rose to greet this great unknown queen mary and queen alexandra of england queen maud of denmark and queen victoria of spain and behind them were grouped princess mary and other women of royal blood waiting too near his grave were men of the warrior's own kind he passed through ranks of soldiers sailors airmen and civilians in mufti strangely mixed captains stood next to seamen colonels by enlisted men for all were the victoria cross 
and that earned them the right to attend. The mournful strains of the craft parcel setting of the funeral sentences were chanted, unaccompanied as the procession passed through the abbey, and as the grave was reached, the king, as the chief mourner, stepped to its head. Behind him stood the Prince of Wales, the Duke of Connaught, and other members of the royal family, and ranked in the rear were Lloyd George and Asquith, the two war premiers, and the members of their cabinets, two or four princes from India, and a score or more of the leaders of the British life. The pallbearers, chiefs of the army and navy, Haig, French, Beatty, and Jackson among them, took their stand on either side of the coffin, and the service began. It was as simple as in any village church in the land. The twenty-third psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, was sung to the familiar chant, and then came the account read by the dean from revelations of the great multitude, which no man could number, out of every nation, and of all tribes, and of all people and, and tongues, standing before the throne. As the coffin was lowered into the grave, lead, kindly light was sung, and then came the committal prayer. As the dean spoke solemnly, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, the king, as the chief mourner, stepped forward, and from a silver bowl sprinkled the coffin with soil brought from France. A few more prayers, abide with me, and Kipling's recessional concluded the service. And as the words of blessing died away, from far up the pillared arches came a whisper of sound. It grew and grew, and it seemed that regiments and then divisions and armies of men were on the march. The whole cathedral was filled with the murmur of their footfalls until they passed past, and the sound grew faint in the distance. It was the roll of drums that seemed to symbolize the host of glorious dead which has left one unknown warrior forever on guard at the entrance to England's old abbey. End of the Soul of a Nation by Philip Gibbs Read by Aaron Walsh The Message of Spiritualism in the Present Crisis An Address by Elizabeth Harlow Getz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Message of Spiritualism in the Present Crisis An Address by Elizabeth Harlow Getz Delivered before the National Spiritualist Association of America October 22, 1919 at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania The Message of Spiritualism in the Present Crisis by Elizabeth Harlow Getz the topic which has been assigned us is, as you will find upon your program, the message of spiritualism in the great crisis of the now. Every organization which is effectual, political or otherwise, is being asked today what it has to offer in this hour when the world is so disturbed. Therefore it is in keeping, while we are among you as a distinctive body, to give our thoughts as to the situation. Dr. Rhodes Buchanan several years since called the attention of the world to the law which expresses in all things known as the law of periodicity it has been questioned by the majority of thinkers but slowly they are coming to realize it as a fact of life as they have studied it from its various angles and possibilities the law of periodicity is that which divides for you the running time in life into seasons it is governed in expression by the plane and its surroundings as to its manifestation. In your temperate zone you have the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. In the Arctic region, light and dark seasons, in tropical, wet and dry. We find all through life this law expressing itself in some degree, but definite and positive. Mankind is but the product of nature, the most superior and wonderful of life, 
portraying the throbbing powers and laws that govern all things. Man, then, is not exempt from the law of periodicity. You find in the development of man on this plane, infancy, youth, manhood, and old age, each independent yet running silently and systematically into the other. We find not only in man physically but mentally and spiritually this same law manifesting in even tenor. This body is but the cloak which the real man wears, through which he awakens to individual and collective interest. Civilization is man trying to live with his brother. In other words, civilization is learning how to live together. In this process of men learning how to live together, we find this law of periodicity making itself most peculiarly pronounced in the systems of social procedures. Thus it is that we talk of the new age and of the past age, and compare one state of society to another. It is but the law of periodicity running out of a springtime, a summer, and an autumn, or winter season as it manifests in the great social structure of human life. It has been at least for a half century the great keynote of society in all its organized manifestations that there was to be born a new era. All of you, it makes no difference what particular ism, cult, or religion you subscribe to, you have all become thoroughly acquainted with the one great prophetic affirmation that a new era is at hand, that new era is being born. You cannot give birth to a newer expression of life in any department without throwing off, stepping out from, leaving behind, and entering into new and untried situations, conditions, and relationships. A great war was precipitated as from a clear sky. The declaration of war in 1914 sounded like a thunderbolt from a clear heaven on a beauteous summer's day. It was not believed by the world at that time that a war of any serious character could live long. You had grown into the thought that war was a thing of the past, especially on this side of the waters. Peace had become the one accepted condition of society. You did not believe, and the world in general did not believe, that a great disastrous war of long continuation could possibly live and produce that which has come to pass. But that great procedure, my friends, was the coming of the new era, as terrible, horrible, and devastating as it has been. It was the last great struggle of autocracy. Autocracy is the government of the many by one supreme and authority. It is, as your attorneys in the business sessions have explained, autocracy is that authority which comes from above. Democracy is authority coming up from the people, lifting themselves with it. This war has been the last heart-throb and effort of autocracy to prove that power is right, authority king, and divine right the all-essential. These are based on the enslavement of the people. Now then we are at the close of the tragedy. All things have been upset by the war. Men and women coming into the new era scarcely know which way to turn or what to do, but they are more alive in the inner chambers of the soul. They who are fully alive in this inner chamber can readily see and appreciate the fact that the old period is finished, the new is being born, and much that you have long felt was a positive necessity you will gradually leave behind. Much which has held influence over us in the past will never lift its head again. The hour has come when democracy is being born, not in one locality, not beneath one flag, but in the great heart of the world. It will not express itself in all nations alike. It will not have the opportunity to express itself at its best for some time to come. The newborn child has to begin in embryo, and it takes time, attention, and nursing continuously to develop and bring forth the great power in human life. And so with democracy we are realizing it as a great basic principle and expression that stands before us today. You ask us as spiritualists, what have we to say at this hour? Our first answer to you is this. We would first tell you to relieve the pain of the world. The world has positively believed in death. Fear of death has been the great dark shadow that has come over all states of human development and society. 
modern spiritualism is a study of life from its natural basis in a sane and natural manner to discover whether this thought that has been projected in reference to death be true or false and we find that in all the phenomena of modern spiritualism it has answered the question that has held the student and the layman if a man die shall he live again and the answer has come in no unmistakable sound seventy-two years ago in that tiny cottage in yonder city there was made a sound and behind that sound was intelligence conveying its presence and in that primitive way said to the world i live and no greater thought no greater message no more powerful message can be vouchsafed to humankind than the positive thought that i live after my physical structure has long since been destroyed this was like john the baptist crying in the wilderness that another greater than i shall come the greater one is not apart from but a development of the essential fact i live we find as we have followed step by step type by type year by year that the message has led us more and more emphatically into life life varied wonderful growing and natural it teaches us when we stand before the crosses on flanders field to realize that though they have thrown off the physical form of this life it was not to pass through the dark shadow of death or separate them from those they love but was simply saying farewell to the coats they have worn we have learned to love the coat sweetly and tenderly but we know it is not the man we lift our faces and in looking up with a keener and clearer vision have seen we know they are not dead but more alive than ever the message of spiritualism to the world today is our boys are not dead irrespective of nationalities they live they have only changed the coats they wore and it has been a great awakening to them they still live and love you and commune with you touching your thought and atmosphere thus the spiritualist message is one of life and not of death or despair it leads us out over the hills where we see not the debris of these terrible battles but the change in life that is taking place you say to us civilization has become a failure but we say to you no for civilization is but man's attempt to live together man cannot be a failure he is a god a god child he is born in its image the book tells you therefore man cannot fail though he may move in the darkness and set in action the motions of life that will not bring back all that is serene and sweet and beautiful but yet in the returning touch it brings him to an awakening consciousness that reasserts him and he finds the better way civilization has not failed but you have reached the climax and the summit of the old procedure from which you have been working the new era is born the newer civilization is not one of kings and slaves but one simply of humanity it will not be the one where men are preparing to die but where they are getting ready to live it will not be based upon degrees and possession and accumulation but upon the principle of service and association therefore my friends you can readily see if you are to be born into a larger expression of democracy and civilization you must get out of the old shell you were in whether it hurts or not you remember parker pillsbury once said great truths are dearly bought the greater the truth the greater the price the truths of the new era have called upon you to pay the price that is born from the depths of your very being the winter season of the last cycle has been finished and the springtime is upon us and you remember as we passed from winter into spring how we passed through the stormy fretful month of march to the uncertain weeks of april right now we are in the month of march you know not what to expect for men have not yet become alive enough to realize what is taking place the old is still trying to assert itself self-dominancy is uppermost as yet from the old position old ideals in a large measure are still dominating but occasionally there breaks through as in the sunny days of march the newer spring-like touch then they stop to think and feel and see and as this goes on you will have passed through this terrible period of uncertainty upheaval and destruction into the warm days of april 
where you will begin to get hold of yourself. At present many of you have believed the new era was coming, but were not prepared to stand the test which is necessary, and have been in a state of confusion as to the new condition, and you are looking about in a questioning manner. Spiritualism upon this question says to you, hold fast. Man cannot fail, man continually moves forward, but he only does so as he leaves behind him that which hinders him from expressing his greater concept. It has been said to us that religions have failed, that the world has lost its spirituality. Not so, my friends. The world has not lost its spirituality, but the spirituality of the new era is not the spiritual concept of the past. You have believed in the past that spirituality was but an expression of faith. You have believed in God and have murdered your brother. You have believed in salvation and have created hell. You have believed in death and have hoped for future life. Spirituality is not belief, it is not faith, it is none of those things. Spirituality is the rising of the soul of man into greater expression. True spirituality is true living. Man is spiritual according to his ability to express the best within him. You have not gone backward, you are not less spiritual. Why are you making ready? Why are you anxiously awaiting to receive the coming king and queen? Because he forgot his crown, he left behind his throne. He laid away all his trappings of divine rights and went with his people. The great spirit of humanity touched him, and the soul of the man superseded the kingship of his inheritance. That is why you love the King Albert, that is spirituality, and in this great tragedy that has been upon us, the expression of the spirit of humanity has been touched as never before. You have come together in common aspirations of life until today you are willing to think of the world, not national, but as a world of humanity. You are growing in spirituality, you have come through a terrible Gethsemane, and it has elevated you. You have grown stronger and better and more godlike because of your experiences. The world is entering an era of spirituality whereby religion will not be a system of setting men apart in different sects by set definitions, but bringing men together, where you will consider the fatherhood of God as never before. On the battlefields they did not ask the boy soldier whether he was Jew or Gentile, or whether he belonged to the Mother Church or the Protestant Church, but in the great hour of suffering they came to the great appreciation of brotherly kinship, and with a voice of kinship you discovered the great brotherhood of life, so that today there is another condition whereby you stand true, and you are coming together. The great thought of the hour is stamping out old procedure, it is wiping away national discrimination in a marvelous way. While France, Italy, Japan, Russia, and all other nations will still have their own home affairs, and their own inherited tendencies, their own peculiar methods of carrying out democracy, brotherhood, and kinship, yet you will not be setting up statutory distinctions that have been holding you in the past. You have crossed the line where there will be a federation of the countries of the world. Believe what you choose, criticize whom you please. I am here to say, without fear or favor, the great new era is one of association and service, not alone of men nationally but internationally, reaching from every municipality of the smallest possible form to the largest national concept of the world. This is the message of spiritualism at this hour. You cannot go backward, you must go forward. The time was when you could not communicate with nations across the sea. The day was when nations were separated by the ocean. But today you step into an airship, and in sixteen hours you go from Halifax to Ireland, the day of separateness is past. The inventions giving you the telephone, the telegraph, and flying machine have given you the power that you may go where you please, when you please, thus welding mankind together. There are those who say that man never can and never will live together without war. My friends, the time was when man said that you could not live in cities without walls, because the others would steal upon you at night and take your possessions. But the walls have faded away, 
and the men in this generation would consider the individual that recommended them disturbed mentally. The day was when you said that all differences between individuals must be settled by the blood of the individual. But you have grown out of the custom of dueling, and you enter the court of justice. The great majority are for peace and order, reason, arbitration, and consideration. There has grown into your minds demands, not dreams, demands for arbitration of all questions. There was a time when it was thought wonderful for a steamboat or railway train to travel twelve miles an hour. There was a time when automobiles were unthought of. But man has developed and overcome until these apparent difficulties which beset him have faded away, and he has broadened in his individuality and mode of life. You have at last come to the hour where you are devising and working out a system of arbitration of all troubles of the nation and the world, say what you will. The message of spiritualism goes on to say that we have discovered that man is not simply bone and muscle, and has a soul that will live hereafter, but he is a soul now, and now possesses his spiritual body. Our mediums often see them, you have often felt them, and wondered what it was. It is a growing fact that we are coming to realize that man is not a spirit product ready to be plucked or to be punished, but he is a potential quantity that is unfolding and growing into expression as opportunity and environment make way for him. We have discovered that men grow only as they are better situated and environed here on the earth plane by coming to realize that man is essentially divine instead of evil, essentially strong instead of weak. We shall cease praying to God on Sunday to save him and begin to create environments for him on Monday that will appeal to the aspirations of the soul instead of the weakness of the physical. When you begin to change the general environments of society with this understanding, you will need to pray less and greater works will follow. Men only grow strong, useful, and good in freedom. Some have said that the world already has too much freedom. Phillips Brooks was once asked what he would recommend when men had too much freedom, and he calmly replied, give them more freedom, an opportunity for man to do his best. The new era will be an era of creating environments that will recognize and bring forward more of man that he may do his best. This economic situation that faces the world today will be based upon a new redemptive power. You may not realize it, but the world is now in debt to herself. It is not Russia indebted to America or England indebted to her, but the world in debt to herself, and you will never be able to rise from the situation through the present processes based on competition. The old economic basis was based upon commodity values, which fluctuated with the rise and fall of commodity uses. The system was one of accumulation, possession, and competition. The new consideration is that man is that redeeming power economically. A mountain of gold without brains and muscle to use it is but an object. Man, with his brains and muscles, is a vital power of creative wealth. Thus we begin to realize that man is the redeeming power. The new system of economic procedure will not be for accumulation, possession, and power, but one to develop the brain and muscle of all nations in such manner that the race will grow into a real human being. The basis of action will be the service and association with the one vision that the individual is part of the state, and anything that injures or hinders its growth hinders and injures the state. The new era is to be one of character, and it is developed only through opportunities that give expression to the higher qualities, economic and otherwise, thus an opportunity for man to do his best, economically as well as morally and intellectually. That is why America has stood at the head in this world crisis. America has done more for her common people than any other nation. Thus the message of spiritualism is that the new era in all things will be based upon the recognition of a spiritual basis in all life, and that life is a process of growth. The keynote will be education in all departments, 
and as man comes to know he will learn how to live with his neighbor locally or worldwide in a tolerant and peaceful manner ignorance is the greatest danger there is in the universe the new era is to be one of enlightenment the new savior education education that adds to man and prepares him for the spiritual and immortal as well as the mortal you will then begin to realize what is meant by really laying up treasures both on earth and in heaven you do not take your silver and gold and other furnishings into the next life but simply that which you have become the wealth of the future is the real development of men my friends the future will be more beautiful and civilized more spiritual and wonderful because you have come to realize and recognize and pay attention to life's greatest qualities spiritualism came not alone to demonstrate continuity of life and that your loved ones can communicate with you but to purify and uplift while here it came to wash away the tears and help you over the barriers and to tell the story that man in his spiritual nature is infinite you are filled with life's possibilities now you are living gods in the eternal home of the now you have learned how to pray together you must now learn how to live together and all evil will be overcome you are to find the angel that is in man and let him go forth i must now be leaving you but i wish to say the message of the hour is one of life touched with all the immortal glories that lead you up from the dark spheres and the night of misunderstanding to supernal day of real human rights where the growing throbbing life in each individual and in all nations shall manifest not simply beneath the stars and stripes but among the steppes of russia in the sunny vales of italy across the vivacious heart of france lifting poor belgium to her feet across the sturdy strength of england home again to the stars and stripes bringing all the world of men to the one great federation of the world end of the message of spiritualism in the present crisis an address by elizabeth harlow getz read by mary in arkansas mary postgate by rudyard kipling this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org mary postgate by rudyard kipling of miss mary postgate lady mccausland wrote that she was thoroughly conscientious tidy companionable and ladylike i am very sorry to part with her and shall always be interested in her welfare miss fowler engaged her on this recommendation and to her surprise for she had had experience of companions found that it was true miss fowler was nearer sixty than fifty at the time but though she needed care she did not exhaust her attendant's vitality on the contrary she gave out stimulatingly and with reminiscences her father had been a minor court official in the days when the great exhibition of eighteen fifty one had just set its seal on civilization made perfect some of miss fowler's tales none the less were not always for the younger mary was not young and though her speech was as colourless as her eyes or her hair she was never shocked she listened unflinchingly to every one said at the end how interesting or how shocking as the case might be and never again referred to it for she prided herself on a trained mind which did not dwell on these things she was too a treasure at domestic accounts for which the village tradesmen with their weekly books loved her not otherwise she had no enemies provoked no jealousy even among the plainest neither gossip nor slander had ever been traced to her she supplied the odd place at the rector's or the doctor's table at half an hour's notice 
She was a sort of public aunt to very many small children of the village street, whose parents, while accepting everything, would have been swift to resent what they called patronage. She served on the village nursing committee as Miss Fowler's nominee when Miss Fowler was crippled by rheumatoid arthritis, and came out of six months' fortnightly meetings equally respected by all the cliques. And when fate threw Miss Fowler's nephew, an unlovely orphan of eleven, on Miss Fowler's hands, Mary Postgate stood to her share of the business of education as practised in private and public schools. She checked printed clothes lists and unitemized bills of extras wrote to head and housemasters matrons nurses and doctors and grieved or rejoiced over half-term reports young wyndham fowler repaid her in his holidays by calling her gate post posty or pack thread by thumping her between her narrow shoulders or by chasing her bleating round the garden her large mouth open her large nose, high in air, at a stiff-necked shamble, very like a camel's. Later on, he filled the house with clamour, argument, and harangues, as to his personal needs, likes and dislikes, and the limitations of you women, reducing Mary to tears of physical fatigue, or, when he chose to be humorous, of helpless laughter. At crises, which multiplied as he grew older, she was his ambassadress, and his interpretress to Miss Fowler, who had no large sympathy with the young, a vote in his interest at the councils on his future. His sewing-woman, strictly accountable for mislaid boots and garments, always his butt and his slave. And when he decided to become a solicitor, and had entered an office in London, when his greeting had changed from, Hello, posty, you old beast, to morning, packthread, there came a war, which, unlike all wars that Mary could remember, did not stay decently outside England and in the newspapers, but intruded on the lives of people whom she knew. As she said to Miss Fowler, it was most vexatious. It took the rector's son, who was going into business with his elder brother. It took the colonel's nephew on the eve of fruit farming in Canada. It took Mrs. Grant's son, who, his mother said, was devoted to the ministry. And very early indeed, it took Wynne Fowler who announced, on a postcard, that he had joined the Flying Corps, and wanted a cardigan waistcoat. He must go, and he must have the waistcoat, said Miss Fowler. So Mary got the proper sized needles and wool, while Miss Fowler told the men of her establishment, two gardeners, and an odd man, aged sixty, that those who could join the army had better do so. The gardeners left cheap, the odd man stayed on, and was promoted to the gardener's cottage. The cook, scorning to be limited in luxuries, also left, after a spirited scene with Miss Fowler, and took the housemaid with her. Miss Fowler gazetted Nellie, Cheap's seventeen-year-old daughter, to the vacant post, Mrs. Cheap to the rank of cook, with occasional cleaning bouts, and the reduced establishment moved forward smoothly. When demanded an increase in his allowance, Miss Fowler, who always looked facts in the face, said he must have it, the chances are he won't live long to draw it, and if three hundred make him happy. Wynne was grateful, and came over in his light-buttoned uniform to say so. His training centre was not thirty miles away, 
and his talk was so technical that it had to be explained by charts of the various types of machines. He gave Mary such a chart. "'And you'd better study it, Posty,' he said. "'You'll be seeing a lot of them soon.' So Mary studied the chart, but when Wynne next arrived to swell and exalt himself before his womenfolk, she failed badly in cross-examination, and he rated her as in the old days. "'You look more or less like a human being,' he said, in his new service voice. "'You must have had a brain at some time in your past. "'What have you done with it? "'Where do you keep it? "'A sheep would know more than you do, Posty. "'You're lamentable. "'You are less used than an empty tin can, "'you dowy old cassowary.' "'I suppose that's how your superior officer talks to you,' "'said Miss Fowler from her chair. "'But Posty doesn't mind,' Wynne replied. "'Do you, Packthread?' "'Why? "'Was Wynne saying anything? "'I shall get this right next time you come,' she muttered, "'and knitted her pale brows again "'over the diagrams of Taubes, Farmans, and Zeppelins.' In a few weeks the mere land and sea battle, which she read to Miss Fowler after breakfast, passed her like idle breath. Her heart and her interest were high in the air with Wynne, who had finished rolling, whatever that might be, and had gone on from a taxi to a machine more or less his own. One morning it circled over their very chimneys, alighted on Veg's Heath, almost outside the garden gate, and Wynne came in, blue with cold, shouting for food. He and she drew Miss Fowler's bath chair, as they had often done, along the Heath footpath to look at the biplane. Mary observed that it smelt very badly. Posty, I believe you think with your nose, said Wynne. I know you don't with your mind. Now what type's that? I'll go and get the chart, said Mary. You're hopeless. You haven't the mental capacity of a white mouse, he cried, and explained the dials and the sockets for bomb dropping, till it was time to mount and ride the wet clouds once more. Ah, said Mary, as the stinking thing fled upward, wait till our flying corps gets to work. Wind says it's much safer than in the trenches. I wonder, said Miss Fowler. Tell Cheap to come and tow me home again. It's all downhill, I can do it, said Mary, if you put the brake on. She laid her lean self against the pushing bar, and home they trundled. Now be careful you aren't heated and catch a chill, said overdressed Miss Fowler. Nothing makes me perspire, said Mary. As she bumped the chair under the porch, she straightened her long back, the exertion had given her a colour, and the wind had loosened a wisp of hair across her forehead. Miss Bowler glanced at her. "'What do you ever think of, Mary?' she demanded suddenly. "'Oh, Wynne says he wants another three pairs of stockings as thick as we can make them.' "'Yes, but I mean the things that women think about. Here you are, more than forty, forty-four, said truthful Mary. "'Well?' Well? Mary offered Miss Fowler her shoulder, as usual. And you've been with me ten years now. Let's see, said Mary. Wynne was eleven when he came. He's twenty now, and I came two years before that. It must be eleven. Eleven! And you have never told me anything that matters in all that while. Looking back, it seems to me that I've done all the talking. I'm afraid I'm not much of a conversationalist, as Wynne says. I haven't the mind. Let me take your hat. Miss Fowler, moving stiffly from the hip, stamped her rubber-tipped stick on the tiled hall floor. Mary, aren't you anything except a companion? Would you ever have been anything except a companion? Mary hung up the garden hat on its proper peg. No, she said after consideration. I don't imagine I ever should. 
but I've no imagination, I'm afraid. She fetched Miss Fowler her eleven o'clock glass of Contrexeville. That was the wet December, when it rained six inches to the month, and the women went abroad as little as might be. Wind's flying chariot visited them several times, and for two mornings he had warned her by postcard. Mary heard the thrush of his propellers at dawn. The second time she ran to the window, and stared at the whitening sky. A little blur passed overhead. She lifted her lean arms toward it. That evening at six o'clock there came an announcement in an official envelope that Second Lieutenant W. Fowler had been killed during a trial flight. Death was instantaneous. She read it and carried it to Miss Fowler. I never expected anything else, said Miss Fowler, but I'm sorry it happened before he had done anything. The room was whirling round Mary Postgate, but she found herself quite steady in the midst of it. Yes, she said, it's a great pity he didn't die in action, after he had killed somebody. He was killed instantly. That's one comfort, Miss Fowler went on. But when says the shock of a fall kills a man at once, whatever happens to the tanks, quoted Mary. The room was coming to rest now. She heard Miss Fowler say impatiently, But why can't we cry, Mary? And herself replying, There's nothing to cry for. He has done his duty, as much as Mrs. Grant's son did. And when he died, she came and cried all the morning, said Miss Fowler. This only makes me feel tired, terribly tired. Will you help me to bed, please, Mary? And I think I'd like the hot water bottle. So Mary helped her, and sat beside, talking of Wynne in his riotous youth. I believe, said Miss Fowler suddenly, that old people and young people slip from under a stroke like this. The middle-aged feel it most. I expect that's true, said Mary, rising. I'm going to put away the things in his room now. Shall we wear mourning? Certainly not, said Miss Fowler. Except, of course, at the funeral. I can't go. You will. I want you to arrange about his being buried here. What a blessing it didn't happen at Salisbury. Everyone, from the authorities of the Flying Corps to the rector, was most kind and sympathetic. Mary found herself, for the moment, in a world where bodies were in the habit of being dispatched by all sorts of conveyances to all sorts of places. And at the funeral, two young men, in buttoned-up uniforms, stood beside the grave and spoke to her afterward. "'You're Miss Postgate, aren't you?' said one. "'Father told me about you. He was a good chap. First-class fellow. Great loss. Great loss, growled his companion. We're all awfully sorry. How high did he fall from? Mary whispered. Pretty nearly four thousand feet, I should think, didn't he? You were up that day, monkey. All of that, the other child replied. My bar made three thousand, and I wasn't as high as him by a lot. Then... That's all right, said Mary. Thank you very much. They moved away, as Mrs. Grant flung herself weeping on Mary's flat chest under the lich gate and cried, I know how it feels. I know how it feels. But both his parents are dead, Mary returned, as she fended her up. Perhaps they've all met by now, she added vaguely as she escaped toward the coach. "'I thought of that, too,' wailed Mrs. Grant. "'But then he'll be practically a stranger to them. <laughs> Quite embarrassing!' Mary faithfully reported every detail of the ceremony to Miss Fowler, who, when she described Mrs. Grant's outburst, laughed aloud. Oh, how Wynne would have enjoyed it! He was always utterly unreliable at funerals. Do you remember? 
and they talked of him again, each piecing out the other's gaps. And now, said Miss Fowler, we'll pull up the blinds, and we'll have a general tidy. That always does us good. Have you seen to Wynne's things? Everything, since he first came, said Mary. He was never destructive, even with his toys. They faced that neat room. Can't be natural not to cry, Mary said at last. I'm so afraid you'll have a reaction. As I told you, we old people slip from under the stroke. It's you I'm afraid for. Have you cried yet? I can't. It only makes me angry. With the Germans. That sheer waste of vitality, said Miss Powler. We must live. Till the war is finished she opened a full wardrobe now i've been thinking things over this is my plan all his civilian clothes can be given away belgian refugees and so on mary nodded boots collars and gloves yes we don't need to keep anything except his cap and belt they came back yesterday with his flying cork clothes mary pointed to a roll on the little iron bed. Ah, but keep his service things. Someone may be glad of them later. Do you remember his sizes? Five feet eight and a half, thirty-six inches round the chest. But he told me he's just put on an inch and a half. I'll mark it on a label and tie it on his sleeping bag. So that disposes of that, said Miss Fowler tapping the palm of one hand with the ringed third finger of the other. What a waste it all is. We'll get his old school trunk tomorrow and pack his civilian clothes. And the rest, said Mary. His books and pictures and the games and the toys and... And the rest. My plan is to burn every single thing, said Miss Fowler. Then we shall know where they are, and no one can handle them afterward. What do you think? I think that would be much the best, said Mary, but there's such a lot of them. We'll burn them in the destructor, said Miss Fowler. This was an open-air furnace for the consumption of refuse, a little circular four-foot tower of pierced brick over an iron grating. Miss Fowler had noticed the design in a gardening journal years ago, and had it built at the bottom of the garden. It suited her tidy soul for it saved unsightly rubbish heaps, and the ashes lightened the stiff clay soil. Mary considered for a moment, saw her way clear, and nodded again. They spent the evening putting away well-remembered civilian suits, underclothes that Mary had marked, and the regiments of very gaudy socks and ties. A second trunk was needed, and after that a little packing-case, and it was late next day when Cheap and the local carrier lifted them to the cart. The rector luckily knew of a friend's son, about five feet eight and a half inches high, to whom a complete flying corps outfit would be most acceptable, and sent his gardener's son down with a barrow to take delivery of it. The cap was hung up in Miss Powler's bedroom, the belt in Miss Postgate's, for, as Miss Fowler said, they had no desire to make Tea Party talk of them. "'That disposes of that,' said Miss Fowler. "'I'll leave the rest to you, Mary. I can't run up and down the garden. You'd better take the big clothes-basket, and get Nelly to help you.' "'I shall take the wheelbarrow and do it myself,' said Mary, and for once in her life closed her mouth. Miss Fowler, in moments of irritation, had called Mary deadly methodical. She put on her oldest waterproof and gardening hat, and her ever-slipping galoshes, for the weather was on the edge of more rain. She gathered firelighters from the kitchen, a half-scuttle of coals, and a faggot of brushwood. These she wheeled in the barrow, down the mossed paths to the dark little laurel shrubbery, where the destructor stood under the drip of three oaks. She climbed the wire fence into the rector's glebe just behind, and from his tenant's rick 
pulled two large armfuls of good hay, which she spread neatly on the fire bars. Next, journey by journey, passing Miss Fowler's white face at the morning room window each time, she brought down in the towel covered clothes basket on the wheelbarrow, thumbed and used Henty's, Marriott's, Levers, Stevenson's, Baroness Oakes's, Garvis's, school books, and atlases, unrelated piles of the motorcyclist, the light car, and catalogues of Olympia exhibitions, the remnants of a fleet of sailing ships from nine penny cutters to a three guinea yacht, a prep school dressing gown, bats from three and sixpence to twenty four shillings, cricket and tennis balls, disintegrated steam and clockwork locomotives with their twisted rails, a grey and red tin model of a submarine, a dumb gramophone and cracked records, golf clubs that had to be broken across the knee like his walking sticks, and an assegai, photographs of private and public school cricket and football elevens, and his OTC on the line of march, kodaks, and film rolls, some pewters, and one real silver cup for boxing competitions and junior hurdles, sheaves of school photographs, Miss Fowler's photograph, her own, which she had borne off in fun, and good care she took not to ask, had never returned, a play-box with a secret drawer, a load of flannels, belts, and jerseys, and a pair of spiked shoes unearthed in the attic, a packet of all the letters that Miss Fowler and she had ever written to him, kept for some absurd reason through all these years, a five-day attempt at the diary, framed pictures of racing motors in full Brooklyn's career, and load upon load of undistinguishable wreckage of tool-boxes, rabbit hutches, electric batteries in tin soldiers, frets or outfits, and jigsaw puzzles. Miss Fowler at the window watched her come and go, and said to herself, Mary is an old woman. I never realized it before. After lunch she recommended her to rest. I'm not in the least tired, said Mary. I've got it all arranged. I'm going to the village at two o'clock for some paraffin. Nelly hasn't enough, and the walk will do me good. She made one last quest round the house before she started, and found that she had overlooked nothing. It began to mist as soon as she had skirted Veg's Heath, where wind used to descend. It seemed to her that she could almost hear the beat of his propellers overhead, but there was nothing to see. She hoisted her umbrella and lunged into the blind wet till she had reached the shelter of the empty village. As she came out of Mr. Kidd's shop with a bottle full of paraffin in her string shopping bag, she met Nurse Eden, the village nurse, and fell into talk with her, as usual, about the village children. They were just parting opposite the Royal Oak, when a gun, they fancied, was fired immediately behind the house. It was followed by a child's shriek, dying into a wail. Accident! said Nurse Eden promptly, and dashed through the empty bar, followed by Mary. They found Mrs. Garrett, the publican's wife, who could only gasp and point to the yard, where a little cartledge was sliding sideways amid a clatter of tiles. Nurse Eden snatched up a sheet, drying before the fire, ran out, lifted something from the ground, and flung the sheet round it. The sheet turned scarlet, and half her uniform too, as she bore the load into the kitchen. It was little Edna Garrett, aged nine, whom Mary had known since her perambulator days. "'Am I hurted bad?' Edna asked, and died between Nurse Eden's dripping hands. The sheet fell aside, and for an instant before she could shut her eyes, Mary saw the ripped and shredded body. "'It's a wonder she spoke at all,' said Nurse Eden. "'What in God's name was it?' "'A bomb,' said Mary. One of the Zeppelins? No, an airplane. I thought I heard it on the heath. 
but I fancied it was one of ours. It must have shut off its engines as it came down. That's why we didn't notice it. The filthy pigs, said Nurse Eden, all white and shaken. See the pickle I am in. Go and tell Dr. Hennis, Miss Postgate. Nurse looked at the mother, who had dropped face down on the floor. She's only in a fit. Turn her over. Mary heaved Mrs. Garrett right side up, and hurried off with the doctor. When she told the tale, he asked her to sit down in the surgery till he got her something. But I don't need it, I assure you, said she. I don't think it would be wise to tell Miss Fowler about it, do you? Her heart is so irritable in this weather. Dr. Hennis looked at her admiringly as he packed up his bag. No, don't tell anybody till we're sure, he said, and hastened to the Royal Oak, while Mary went on with the paraffin. The village behind her was as quiet as usual, for the news had not yet spread. She frowned a little to herself, her large nostrils expanded uglily, and from time to time she muttered a phrase which Wynne, who never restrained himself before his womenfolk, got applied to the enemy. Bloody pagans! They are bloody pagans! But— She continued, falling back on the teaching that had made her what she was. One mustn't let one's mind— dwell on these things. Before she reached the house, Dr. Hennis, who was also a special constable, overtook her in his car. Oh, Miss Postgate, he said, I wanted to tell you that that accident at the Royal Oak was due to Garrett's stable tumbling down. It's been dangerous for a long time. It ought to have been condemned. I thought I heard an explosion, too, said Mary. You might have been misled by the beam snapping. I've been looking at them. They were dry rotted through and through, of course, as they broke. They would make a noise just like a gun. Yes, yeah, said Mary, politely. Poor little Edna was playing underneath it, he went on, still holding her with his eyes. And that and the tiles cut her to pieces, you see. I saw it, said Mary, shaking her head. I heard it, too. Well, we cannot be sure. Dr. Hennis changed his tone completely. I know both you and Nurse Eden, I have been speaking to her, are perfectly trustworthy, and I can rely on you not to say anything, yet at least. It is no good to stir up people unless— Oh, I never do. Anyhow, said Mary, and Dr. Hennis went on to the county town. After all, she told herself, it might just possibly have been the collapse of the old stable that had done all those things to poor little Edna. She was sorry she had even hinted at other things, but Nurse Eden was discretion itself. By the time she reached home, the affair seemed increasingly remote, by its very monstrosity. As she came in, Miss Fowler told her that a couple of airplanes had passed half an hour ago. I thought I heard them, she replied. I'm going down to the garden now. I've got the paraffin. Yes, but what have you got on your boots? They are soaking wet. Change them at once. Not only did Mary obey, but she wrapped the boots in the newspaper and put them into the string bag with the bottle. So, armed with the longest kitchen poker, she left. "'It's raining again,' was Miss Fowler's last word. "'But I know you won't be happy till that's disposed of. "'It won't take long. "'I've got everything down there, "'and I put the lid on the destructor to keep the wet out.' "'The shrubbery was filling with twilight "'by the time she had completed her arrangements "'and sprinkled the sacrificial oil. "'As she lit the match that would burn her heart to ashes,' She heard a groan, or a grunt, behind the dense Portugal laurels. Cheap, she called impatiently, but cheap, with his ancient lumbago and his comfortable cottage, would be the last man to profane the sanctuary. Sheep, she concluded, 
and threw in the fusee. The pyre went up in a roar, and the immediate flame hastened night around her. How Wynne would have loved this, she thought, stepping back from the blaze. By its light she saw, half hidden behind a laurel not five paces away, a bare-headed man sitting very stiffly at the foot of one of the oaks. A broken branch lay across his lap, one booted leg protruding from beneath it. His head moved ceaselessly from side to side, but his body was as still as the tree's trunk. He was dressed, she moved sideways to look more closely, in a uniform something like winds, with a flap buttoned across the chest. For an instant she had some idea that it might be one of the young flying men she had met at the funeral. But their heads were dark and glossy. This man's was as pale as a baby's, and so closely cropped that she could see the disgusting pinky skin beneath. His lips moved. What do you say? Mary moved toward him and stooped. Latty, 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 he muttered, while his hands picked at the dead, wet leaves. There was no doubt as to his nationality. It made her so angry that she strode back to the destructor, though it was still too hot to use the poker there. Wynne's books seemed to be catching well. She looked up at the oak behind the man. Several of the light upper and two or three rotten lower branches had broken and scattered their rubbish on the shrubbery path. On the lowest fork a helmet with dependent strings showed like a bird's nest in the light of a long-tongued flame. Evidently, this person had fallen through the tree. Wynne had told her that it was quite possible for people to fall out of aeroplanes. Wynne told her, too, that trees were useful things to break an aviator's fall. But in this case, the aviator must have been broken, or he would have moved from his queer position. He seemed helpless, except for his horrible rolling head. On the other hand, she could see a pistol case at his belt, and Mary loathed pistols. Months ago, after reading certain Belgian reports together, she and Miss Fowler had had dealings with one a huge revolver with flat-nosed bullets, which latter, Wynne said, were forbidden by the rules of war to be used against civilized enemies. They're good enough for us, Miss Fowler had replied. Show Mary how it works and Wynne, laughing at the mere possibility of any such need, had led the craven, winking Mary into the rector's disused quarry, and had shown her how to fire the terrible machine. It lay now in the top left-hand drawer of her toilet table, a memento not included in the burning. Wynne would be pleased to see how she was not afraid. She slipped up to the house to get it. When she came through the rain, the eyes in the head were alive with expectation. The mouth even tried to smile. But at sight of the revolver, its corners went down, just like Edna Garrett's. A tear trickled from one eye, and the head rolled from shoulder to shoulder, as though trying to point out something. Casse. Tut casse, it whimpered. What do you say? said Mary disgustedly, keeping well to one side, though only the head moved. Casse, it repeated. Cameron, le médecin, doctor. Nine, said she, bringing all her small German to bear with the big pistol. Ich haben de tot Kinder gesehen. The head was still. Mary's hand dropped. She had been careful to keep her finger off the trigger for fear of accidents. After a few moments waiting, she returned to the destructor, where the flames were falling, 
and churned up Wynne's charring books with the poker. Again the head groaned for the doctor. Stop that, said Mary, and stamped her foot. Stop that, you bloody pagan! The words came quite smoothly and naturally. They were Wynne's own words, and Wynne was a gentleman, who for no consideration on earth would have torn little Edna into those vividly coloured strips and strings. But this thing, hunched under the oak tree, had done that thing. It was no question of reading horrors out of newspapers to Miss Fowler. Mary had seen it with her own eyes on the royal oak kitchen table. She must not allow her mind to dwell upon it. Now when was dead, and everything connected with him was lumping and rustling and tinkling under her busy poker into red-black dust and grey leaves of ash, the thing beneath the oak would die too. Mary had seen death more than once. She came of a family that had a knack of dying under, as she told Miss Fowler, most distressing circumstances. She would stay where she was till she was entirely satisfied that it was dead. Dead as dear papa in the late eighties, Aunt Mary in eighty-nine, Mamma in ninety-one, Cousin Dick in ninety-five, Lady McCausland's housemaid in ninety-nine, Lady McCausland's sister in nineteen hundred and one, Wynne buried five days ago, and Edna Garrett still waiting for decent earth to hide her. As she thought, her underlip caught up by one faded canine, brows knit, and nostrils wide. She wielded the poker with lunges that jarred the grating at the bottom and careful scrapes round the brickwork above. She looked at her wristwatch. It was getting on to half-past four, and the rain was coming down in earnest. Tea would be at five. If it did not die before that time, she would be soaked, and would have to change. Meantime, and this occupied her, wind things were burning well, in spite of the hissing wet, though now and again a book back with a quite distinguishable title would be heaved up out of the mass. The exercise of stoking had given her a glow which seemed to reach to the marrow of her bone. She hummed. Mary never had a voice to herself. She had never believed in all those advanced views, though Miss Fowler herself leaned a little that way, a woman's work in the world, but now she saw that there was much to be said for them. This, for instance, was her work work which no man, least of all Dr. Hennis, would ever have done. A man, at such a crisis, would be what Wynne called a sportsman, would leave everything to fetch help, and would certainly bring it into the house. Now a woman's business was to make a happy home for, for, for a husband and children. Failing these, it was not a thing one should allow one's mind to dwell upon. But stop it! Mary cried once more across the shadows. Nine, I tell you, ich haben der Tod kindergesehen. But it was a fact. A woman who had missed these things could still be useful, more useful than a man in certain respects. She thumped like a kpawa through the settling ashes, at the secret thrill of it. The rain was damping the fire, but she could feel, it was too dark to see, that her work was done. There was a dull red glow at the bottom of the destructor, not enough to char the wooden lid if she slipped it half over against the driving wet. This arranged, she leaned on the poker and waited, while an increasing rapture laid hold on her. She ceased to think, she gave herself up to feel. Her long pleasure was broken by a sound that she had waited for in agony several times in her life. She leaned forward and listened, smiling. There could be no mistake. 
she closed her eyes and drank it in. Once it ceased abruptly. Go on, she murmured half aloud. That isn't the end. Then the end came, very distinctly, in a lull between two rain gusts. Mary Postgay drew her breath short between her teeth and shivered from head to foot. That's all right, said she contentedly, and went up to the house, where she scandalized the whole routine by taking a luxurious hot bath before tea, and came down looking, as Miss Fowler said, when she saw her lying all relaxed on the other sofa. Quite handsome. THE BEGINNINGS It was not part of their blood. It came to them very late, with long arrears to make good, when the English began to hate. They were not easily moved. They were icy, willing to wait, till every count should be proved, ere the English began to hate. Their voices were even and low. Their eyes were level and straight. There was neither sign nor show when the English began to hate. It was not preached to the crowd. It was not taught by the state. No man spoke it aloud when the English began to hate. It was not suddenly bred. It will not swiftly abate through the chill years ahead when time shall count from the date that the English began to hate. The End of Mary Postgate by Rudyard Kipling Lingo of No Man's Land by Lorenzo Smith Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lingo of No Man's Land, or Wartime Lexicon, compiled by Sergeant Lorenzo Smith, May 1918. Forward it is no wonder that new words and new terms had to express our surroundings and our experiences. With unheard-of conditions in the trenches, sights and sounds inconceivable before August 1914, the elbowing of the nations as friend and foe, ourselves with unfamiliar weapons and accoutrements in our hands, in dress and undress which made us feel more at home with our comrades than with ourselves, these expressions were inevitable, involuntary. That many of them are humorous is only the natural rebound from frightfulness in the mind of the Anglo-Saxon, whether he hail from the British Isles, from Canada, or from the United States. Tommy has always been noted for making fun of his serious self, and when the brand-new lieutenant is dubbed the one-star wonder, and the finest company of infantry you could wish to see is called the gravel-crusher, it affords an interesting clue to Tommy's analysis of himself and to the secret of his sure success. But the real need for definitions and explanations was impressed upon me while on recruiting duty for the British-Canadian recruiting mission. Talks and addresses before clubs, societies, and mass meetings were frequently followed by questions from the floor. What do you mean by blighty? What's a whiz-bang? Hence the lingo of no man's land, or the wartime lexicon, in this small pocket edition. L. N. Smith Note Sergeant Lorenzo N. Smith, a typical son of Massachusetts, fired by the newspaper reports of desecrated Belgium and France, crossed the Canadian border and joined the Westmount Rifles in February 1915. 
he was unwilling to wait until his own countrymen were sure it was their business to fight the proposition that might is right. Private Smith was soon familiarly known among his comrades as Yank Smith, and with the first Canadian contingent, a few months later, he was doing his bit at Ypres, Festubert, Givenchy, Thiogstert, and Messines. After the usual experiences with machine-gun, reconnoitering parties, and listening post-duty, a generous amount of shrapnel at Messines ended Sergeant Smith's ability to carry on. He returned to Canada in April 1916. After his honourable discharge and a partial recovery from his wounds, he found the need for men in the trenches still great. How great only those who had helped hold the thin Allied lines seemed to appreciate. With this thought predominating, Sergeant Smith joined the British Canadian Recruiting Mission in July 1917. This work brought him back to the United States, where his business, like that of the other men who came back, was to arouse British subjects to answer the call to colours, to urge them to take the places of the brave English, the Scots, and the Canadians who have fallen for the cause which every man worthy of the name considers his own. E. W. May 8, 1918 Lingo of No Man's Land Ace a term of distinction applied by the French to any aeroplane pilot who has brought down five or more enemy aeroplanes. Brought down, in this connection, means the machine wrecked and the aviator disabled. The Germans do not make such distinctions. Forcing any enemy plane to descend, even if uninjured, is counted by them as brought down. Advance Post an advance post is used only when trenches are a considerable distance away. Swampy lands often make their use necessary. An advance post is sometimes detailed to a position as close as possible to the German lines in order to watch and report the actions of the enemy. See Listening Post. Aerial Photography A photograph taken from an aeroplane as it circles above the ground. The supremacy of the British air fleets has made it possible for the Allies to know very exactly, by means of aerial photographs, all the movements of the enemy and the strength of their lines. This information is used in the making of maps of tape in fields behind the trenches, where plans of attack can be rehearsed with great accuracy. Each soldier knows the precise distance and direction of that part of the enemy line which he is to reach. The best height of the aeroplane for taking these photographs is 600 feet. Allemande, the French word for German, applied to the Huns by British soldiers, much used in trench songs. Ammunition Column An ammunition column is a train of transports or wagons, drawn usually by horses or mules, engaged in carrying munitions from the railroads to the munition dumps, and from the dumps to the batteries. Ammunition Dump An area set aside for the storing of ammunition. There are ammunition dumps almost anywhere you go behind the lines. The farther behind the lines they are, the bigger they are, as a rule. Angle in Range Bracketing a target east or west is called the angle, instead of the bracket in ranging because in changing the position of the gun it is turned through so many degrees of a circle, in contrast to bracketing when it is raised or lowered that distance. Anti-Aircraft Guns Thirteen-pounder guns to combat hostile aircraft, which are mounted on motor trucks and are constantly on the move. These guns fire very rapidly, and are a Bosch airman's chief source of worry as he flies over enemy territory. The shell fired from these guns is known to Tommy as an Archie. Archie. Anti-aircraft guns, generally mounted on automobiles, so called from the sound of the shell in the air, namely, Archie, Archie. The anti-aircraft gunners are also dubbed Archie or Archibald. Artillery Retaliation. An answer to enemy artillery fire upon our trenches. When our trenches are being heavily shelled, the men in the firing line call for retaliation, and our batteries then commence a bombardment of the enemy front-line trenches until their fire gradually ceases. 
Our artillery stops firing then, too. Armored cars. Fast, steel-plated motor cars, mounting machine guns. Very little used in trench warfare, but valuable for surprise attacks in open fighting. Artillery registration. When the aeroplane scouts and observation post men report some place in the enemy lines which it is desirable to register, one gun is given a range and angle to this point from the map, and the effect of the fire so directed is observed. When the target is hit, several more shells are thrown to be sure of the accuracy of the range and angle, and the exact location is noted. This target point is then said to be registered, and whenever it is desired to place shells at that point, the fire can be accurately directed, without delay or loss of ammunition. Backsheesh. Money, food, anything left over in the pot. Bandolier. The holder for ammunition, a cartridge belt, not infrequently regarded as something to lose by happy-go-lucky Tommy. Barb wire entanglements. A mass of barbed wire stretched and intertwined from post to post in varying distances from our own front line to form an obstacle to enemy attacks. This barbed wire is usually a good mark for the enemy artillery before his infantry attempts to pay us a visit. Barrage. A barrage is a protective wall or curtain of fire placed in front of infantry advancing to the attack until they have reached their final objective and made it secure. The distance the shells are thrown by the batteries is accurately timed so that the curtain moves forward only as fast as the line of soldiers. If the soldiers move too fast, they overtake their own barrage, and therefore the attack is generally timed to a walk across no man's land. Shrapnel is the usual shell employed in barrage, each shell bursting about ten feet above the earth and throwing the shrapnel bullets forward about two hundred yards. This makes it impossible for the enemy to rush to meet the attack. Barrage Alignment The enemy trenches are not often parallel to our own, and it is not therefore possible to cover all parts of a given section by giving the artillery one range. The line of bursting shells must conform to the shape of the enemy line, so that the effect is felt with equal violence at all points of attack. To do this, each gun of a battery is given a specific range, different from every other gun, and correction is made in the same way. In a creeping barrage, unless the alignment conforms with the contour of the enemy trenches, attacking infantry are not properly protected. In this case, therefore, the barrage is laid down at a given range, in a line probably parallel to our trenches, and the range gradually lengthened for each gun to shape the barrage as it advances to the contour of the enemy trenches. Bay. The part of the trenches between the traverses. The distance may be long or short according to conditions. The longest bay is about twenty feet. The bay is the space between the buttresses or towers on the wall of the trench manned by the defenders. Bertha. A sixty-ton German gun, so called from Bertha Krupp of the manufacturing firm. This gun has a range of ten to twelve miles and throws a twelve-hundred-pound shell, which the Tommies also call Jack Johnson. Billet a hut back of the lines, where worn and weary soldiers may sleep and eat in peace. The roof is made of corrugated iron, floor and sides of wood, with air spaces for ventilation, which, however, are not appreciated from November to March, when Old Saul is short in his heat supply. Billet is also the term given to the quarters in barns or outhouses, or in the homes of Belgian and French families, the latter being an unheard-of luxury to the rank and file, but commonly the good fortune of the officers. Bivouac. An encampment in the open without tents. A shelter is sometimes made with two rubber sheets, six and a half feet long and four feet wide, supported on three-foot poles. Such a bivouac accommodates two soldiers. Black Mariahs. 
300-pound howitzer shells, which liberate a large cloud of stinging black smoke when they explode. Blighty, the Briton's expression for home, England, also used for a wound which he hopes is serious enough to invalid him back to England. The base hospital is sometimes called Blighty Junction, as it is from there that the seriously wounded are sent back to England to recover. The word is said by some authorities to be derived from the Hindustani word Belaiti, which means something foreign or over the seas. Others affirm that Blighty is the East Indian's pronunciation of Brighton, England, at which place is located a large hospital with which many of them are acquainted. When Tommy receives a soft one, a slight wound, he not infrequently shouts, Hooray, I'm off for Blighty! Blind Bay When the surveyed line of the trenches is cut off by marshy ground, or by a farmhouse with a marsh behind it, or some other obstacle through which trenches cannot be dug, and no man's land is too narrow to risk digging out around the obstacle, the trench is ended abruptly, like a blind alley, or, in trench language, it becomes a blind bay. Communicating trenches run behind the lines around the obstruction, so that the section is not cut off from supplies or support in case of attack. The marsh constitutes a natural barrier more effective than trenches against enemy attack. Blind bay is also used to describe the part of the aeroplane where the enemy cannot return our fire, or the point where a pilot can sneak up on an enemy machine without being seen. Block. The term to designate a barrier built across a trench or road to fortify or protect the defenders. It may be built of sandbags, barbed wire, or the trench walls leveled to the ground. In a raid on enemy lines, the first thing to accomplish is to throw up a block, cutting off the particular section of the trench raided from enemy reinforcements or a counter-attacking party. Blue Devils a regiment of picked French troops, who die rather than surrender. Bobtail, a dishonorable discharge, used more in the American army than in the British. Boche, the familiar epithet of the Allied soldiers for the German. Its derivation is somewhat uncertain, but it probably comes from the French word borcher or bochier, meaning butcher, with the common meaning inhuman monster. Other authorities affirm that Boche is corrupted from the French caboche, which means numbskull, stupid, or in plain English, a damn fool. This term is most generally used when the Germans are bombarding our line with heavy trench mortars. Body snatchers. Snipers, so called because they pick off men unawares. Bomb. In general terms, a casing of shrapnel enclosing a high explosive, which, when thrown usually by hand, bursts and scatters the shrapnel in all directions. Bombs, today, are exploded by either time fuses or concussion caps. Bombardier The lowest non-commissioned officer attached to an artillery battery he wears one stripe on his arm, and his rank is equivalent to a lance corporal in the infantry. Bomb-proof. A safe job. Same as cushy. That these jobs are not always as safe as they are said to be is shown by the experience of a veteran of twenty years' service, who, having been sent back after a particularly hard time in the front-line trenches, was killed almost immediately by an enemy shell that landed on the dump. Box Barrage Fire from a battery so directed as to drop shells on three sides of a specific area. A skillfully directed box barrage will not only cut off enemy advance in front, but prevent flank movements or reinforcements coming up from other parts of the trenches to help those surrounded by the fire. Box respirator, the newer form of gas helmet. It consists of a small hook-like mask with a nose clamp and a mouthpiece fitted also with goggles. Attached to the mouthpiece is an elastic tube 
connecting the helmet with the box containing charcoal and other chemicals which purify the poisonous air as it is breathed in to these helmets is attached a tiny record book in which a notation is made of the number of hours worn the occasions and whether on drill or in active service a soldier carries a box respirator and also the ph gas helmet with him all the time he is on active service so that if one is injured by shell fire the other is ready for service the orders in regard to this item of equipment are so strict that a soldier caught without his masks on duty may be court-martialed and heavily fined bracket distance between ranges too long and too short for a specific target for registration of a particular target at approximately twenty five hundred yards for instance a gun would drop a shell at perhaps twenty seven hundred yards and another at twenty four hundred yards or in the language of the artillery twenty seven twenty four the effect of these shells being reported by aeroplanes or observation posts the correction may be twenty six twenty five if the latter scores a direct hit a second shot is dropped at the same range to verify the finding and the target is registered too long a range is called plus too short a one minus so that a bracket in other words is the plus and minus distance in locating a target this is bracketing in ranging brass hat general staff officer as distinguished from tin hat an ordinary soldier wearing a steel helmet brazier a sheet iron bucket with draft holes on the sides so that it may be used for cooking or to heat the dugouts britannia the name of one of the first tanks the following description from the london standard was written by one of the gallant canadians and sent to his fiancee at home they can do up prisoners in bundles like straw binders and in addition have an adaptation of a printing machine which enables them to catch the huns fold count and deliver them in choirs every thirteenth man being thrown out a little farther than the others the tanks can truss refractory prisoners like fowls prepared for cooking while their equipment renders it possible for them to charge into a crowd of huns and by shooting out spokes like porcupine quills carry off an opponent on each though stuck up the prisoners are needless to say by no means proud of their position they can chew up barbed wire and turn it into munitions and as they run they slash their tails and clear away trees houses howitzers and anything else in the vicinity they turn over on their backs and catch live shells in their caterpillar feet and they can easily be adapted as submarines in fact most of them cross the channel in this guise they loop the loop travel forward sideways and backwards not only with equal speed but at the same time they spin around like a top only far more quickly dig themselves in bury themselves scoop out a tunnel and come up again ten miles away in half an hour bucket carriers ration parties supply carriers of all kinds bug house shell shock hospital also used to refer to a dugout or to flea pots bully beef the soldier's name for canned corned beef it is put up in twelve ounce tins this being considered equal to a pound of fresh meat a day's ration for one man a sandbag full of bully beef makes splendid material for roofing a dugout or building a road which use it is put to unless tommy is very hungry buses an aeroplane used for bombing big slow and unwieldy busted the reduction of an nco to the ranks cage a wire enclosed structure to hold fritz we are gradually capturing these wild beasts and endeavoring to civilize them camouflage the fusion or blending of colors to destroy the outline or distinguishing features of an object so hidden as to make it practically invisible to mislead the enemy we cover our guns with bush and small trees 
and sometimes cover them with painted canvas similar to their surroundings so that aeroplanes flying over them cannot distinguish the location of the guns from the surrounding green meadows we also cover roads with burlap so as to keep the enemy from observing movements of our troops and transports over these roads the cleverest camouflage used by us is when we have only a few men in the front lines and pretend we have hundreds the term which is french is now adopted into english and as generally used means any effort to cover up or obscure the true nature of a thing carrier a special jacket or apron with straps over the shoulder fastening on the side or back with pockets for mills grenades caterpillar a type of tractor engine run by electricity the wheels of which are fitted with huge blocks giving the tractor great pulling power a thing much needed in the heavy mud for moving artillery c b a soldier gets a c b confined to barracks for being half a minute late he is kept in camp quarters while his pals are enjoying the neighborhood estaminet char tea afternoon tea probably derived from the hindustani term cha meaning tea or it may be derived from the hindustani expression that might be spelled phonetically as chipati the name of a kind of unleavened doughnut of flour water and salt fried in fat which is a common article of diet for indian troops and was also used to some extent in south africa during the boer war chatting name applied to the indiscriminate hunt for petit friends called cooties trouser rabbits etc chaw or chuck bread as distinguished from hardtack or ship's biscuits which are also a regular part of the army's rations chimney sweeps scottish rifles clearing station the first place which looks like a bona fide hospital to a wounded man on his long journey from the front line to the base it collects all the wounded down the lines of communication and is the start toward blighty if wounds are serious click a verb signifying all sorts of ways of dying at the front to kill to be killed to go west etc clicked sometimes means wounded clink the old soldier's term for military guard room coal box a hun high explosive shell similar to the jack johnson which on bursting makes a terrific noise and eliminates a heavy black cloud of gas should it however burst too near you you don't see the cloudy effects communication trench in low marshy ground the trenches cannot be dug deep because the water soon fills them so they are usually dug about two feet deep and the walls are then built up of sandbags as sandbags are less substantial protection than ordinary earth walls the combination trench is more often used as a communicating trench or ct than as a fire trench facing the enemy company runner official messenger for carrying orders and guide duty men chosen for this work must undergo a stiff training to give them physical endurance and speed and they must also be thoroughly familiar with the country in which they are located so that in any emergency they will know the lay of the land so well that they can find their way under all circumstances concertina wire use of coils of wire like a concertina is one of the methods of wire entanglement these coils are linked together to form a barrier more difficult for the germans to pass through than the ordinary tangled wire protection concussion the passage of big shells displaces air so suddenly that a man within range will be knocked to the ground by the rush of air a small shell falling close to a man will have a similar effect even if it does not explode thus dud shells that is those that do not explode at all will nevertheless cause concussion the effect is a nerve shock 
something seems to break in the brain in the words of the men who have come back and they suffer a loss of self-control if a man is very near a large shell he will not only be knocked to the ground but literally crushed to pulp by the same tremendous force that shatters buildings to kindling wood in the path of a cyclone a man may be lifted high in the air off a hard dirt road by the concussion of a shell contact system method of relaying messages by pre-arranged code from the infantry to the aeroplane which transmits it back to headquarters the speed with which an advancing body of infantry can communicate with its artillery support and with headquarters is remarkable frequently messages are on hand in less than a minute after they are flashed report of the success or failure of an assault the present position of the attackers and the enemy points of consolidation and alignment connection are all conveyed back to headquarters by contact machines which drop little bags containing up-to-the-minute maps of the situation contact machines do good work reporting small groups of men isolated in shell holes requesting barrage fire or machine gun support and in advising companies up and down the line of the success or failure of the general attacking movement Cootie this is a species of lice with extraordinary biting ability these pests are introduced to us three or four hours after we arrive in the trenches and they worry us more than the huns on many occasions it is no use to feed them insect powder or poison of any kind instead of destroying them they thrive on it and become more ambitious no matter how hard you try it is impossible to be free from these pests and you are bothered with them until your stay in flanders is over they are also called seam squirrel trouser rabbit or shiny lizard counter-attack an attack made immediately after losing a position to recover the lost ground counter-battery duel a counter-battery duel occurs when a battery on one side is answered by a battery on the other side two methods of return are used when an enemy battery shells one of our batteries if the enemy position is successfully located we may answer shell for shell in an effort to silence it the usual method however is for the battery which is the target of enemy shells to keep quiet but get into communication with several heavy artillery batteries which will direct a fierce return fire from big guns until the enemy is silenced crater a large hole similar to the crater of a volcano made by a high explosive shell or mine a crater is sometimes several feet across and many battles have been fought around these craters crawlies cooties alias red stripes alias crumbs american variety is called a flea creeping jimmy high velocity shell which gives no warning of its approach this term is more or less colloquial in different parts of the line corresponding probably to the silent susie of some other section of the trenches crimed the soldier term for being called before the officer commanding for bad conduct crump a high explosive shell generally a five nine crystallized assault that is settled down in one place after surging back and forth as ground is won or lost in the attack by succeeding waves of infantry curtain fire british term for barrage which a military expert defines as the creation of a narrow belt of shell bursting in front of advancing troops or over trenches so continuous as theoretically to prevent the possibility of any living thing passing through and which actually in practice renders such passage so dangerous and expensive of life that it is hardly attempted the curtain is only possible since the advent of quick-firing field guns twenty odd years ago with the invention of the french famous seventy five millimeter gun even the old-time concentration of fire did not give the same results because the rate of fire was not rapid enough and not accurate enough 
the old guns did not absorb the shock of recoil and had to be relayed and repointed after every shot because the shock drove the trail deeper and deeper into the ground and shifted the whole position of the carriage it is now possible with modern rapid-firing field guns to reach thirty rounds a minute cushy the way the men who go into the firing line and over the top refer to the soldiers whose duty lies safely back of the lines a cushy job is equivalent to a soft job there is no danger connected with it dcm distinguished conduct medal also much the opposite a district court-martial usually for serious offences dejeuner a french word meaning to the soldier breakfast up digging in digging a trench a hole in the ground or any protection while under shell fire disparu official word for missing referring to an aviator who does not come in from his two-hour detail dixie the term by which tommies designate the black pot in which meals are cooked doggo an adjective laid at the door of the east indians meaning still quiet no man's land is doggo doing in killing as in we are doing in the huns dolly varden the british term for a german helmet dos an east indian word meaning a short sleep a nap dos house some place any place where tommy can snatch a little rest doughboy an infantryman so called because infantrymen once rubbed their uniforms with pipe clay and in the rain the clay made dough dressing station usually the first place to which the wounded men are taken or first aid station the battalion medical officer is in charge after being examined and dressed at the dressing station the wounded soldier is sent on to the nearest red cross station for further treatment drum fire uninterrupted firing which sounds like the beating of drums at a distance d s o distinguished service order conferred only on british officers dud bad the weather may be dud or a shell may be dud or anything else that does not suit tommy dud shell a dud shell is a dead one that is one which does not explode after being fired removing these unexploded shells is one of the dangers of reclaiming the waste land over which armies have been fighting as they sometimes explode unexpectedly when struck by a rifle dugout an excavation in which to sleep and eat when not flooded by water from the trench the earlier dugouts were only a few feet underground and were of very little use in shielding the men from high explosives today the dugouts afford very good protection and a great deal of comfort as they are anywhere from twenty to thirty feet underground these dugouts constitute a definite part of the front line fortifications as soldiers can only be dislodged from such cave-like strongholds by throwing bombs down into them or employing suffocating gas eggs another term for bombs or grenades there is a german bomb resembling a goose egg these eggs have come out in ever-increasing variety in the past few years they are sometimes filled with shrapnel and various kinds of poison gas or bits of metal the deadly contents are sometimes released by a time fuse other times by concussion caps elaine another french word adopted by the english it means spirited for instance an official report says our troops attacked with great elaine meaning with great vigor emma g machine gun it is much simpler to say emma g and much more descriptive of Tommy's feeling for his weapon than to always say machine gun. Emplacement. Gun platform. It may be of concrete, hard-packed earth, or stone and mortar. 
some of the big guns are moved on specially constructed railways which are built ahead faster than the advancing of the battery so that when a new position is taken the guns can be moved forward very rapidly to defend it laying these railroads is one of the dangerous duties of the engineer corps enfilading fire fire from a flank that is not from a point directly in front of the target but at wide angles on each side so as to strike the object obliquely enfilading fire directed against a salient makes such a part of the line a particularly deadly place to defend entrenching tool a trowel-shaped tool for digging in with which every soldier is supplied as well as with musket and ammunition a spade and pick combined with a removable handle fifteen inches long opinion among soldiers varies as to its usefulness some claiming it is the most satisfactory tool devised for scooping out a shelter quickly under fire others regarding it as an entirely useless cross between a tack hammer and a geologist's pickaxe echelon from the french meaning any fortified place used indiscriminately with reference to fortified positions ammunition dumps batteries pillboxes airdromes railheads etc thus the press dispatches refer to allied aviators dropping bombs on enemy echelons estaminet the french word adopted by the british soldiers meaning drinking house or saloon where they can buy beer french wines and similar drinks a place of higher grade than the ordinary saloon where fair mademoiselle waits on tommy and where he is apt to sit and talk with his comrades until her napu fini no more finished is understood to mean closing time fag tommy asks for a fag meaning a cigarette feel of the air the aviator develops a sixth sense the feel of the air difficult to describe but an important element in the success of his work fire trench the front line of the trenches the firing line firing step a long narrow platform of earth made when digging the trench on which to mount when firing a machine gun or rifle or to use when looking over on sentry duty it should be four feet six inches from the top of the parapet in fine weather tommy uses it as a bed in the daytime fish tail a german trench mortar shell eight inches long corrugated with a hollow stem which slips over the gun when fired it carries fish tail shaped wings whence its name also sometimes called a pineapple flare a cartridge filled with fourth of july stuff to be fired from a pistol when you think you see something moving out in no man's land at night leaving the pistol the flare shoots up into the air towards fritzy's line and as it begins to descend bursts into a dazzling light illuminating the surrounding ground for five hundred yards or so if tommy is out there when a flare goes up he imagines every bosch machine gun for miles on either side is trained on him ready to fire but if he keeps perfectly still he will nine times out of ten be taken for some old post by the overtrained wooden-headed hun flea bag officer's sleeping bag or bedroll this is not unlike a hunter's or an arctic explorer's outfit it is a heavy canvas sheet seven feet by five feet in which the blankets are laid the edges are turned in to meet in the center and the foot is turned up the edges are then laced together so that the roll is really a kind of bag the advantage is that it can be spread out and the blankets aired and washed easily flipper to tommy flipper is short for hand flying pig the name of one of the heaviest trench mortars it is about five feet long weighs two hundred ninety eight pounds is shaped like a pig and shoots a shell in which ninety-three pounds of amnol a high explosive is used the flying pig carries a light in the tail which goes out as soon as the shell begins to descend this is a cue to the watching soldiers to get out of the way the mortars throw a shell one thousand one hundred forty feet away 
and even though no fragments touch him the concussion is so great that a man's insides burst like a kernel of popcorn and death is usually instantaneous this shell is also called a sausage a rum jar and minnie flying traverse a roof of sod gravel and earth built over the communicating trench for a distance of perhaps twelve feet the sod and earth are effective camouflage while the distance of the traverse from the fire trench is such that the entrance to this protected portion of the communicating trench is just out of range of vision of german outposts across no man's land so instead of seeing soldiers going under this false roof they see only the roof and cannot distinguish it from the rest of the ground while airplane scouts cannot distinguish it from above fogey a ten per cent increase in pay football one of the sixty pound trench mortar shells shaped like a football french beer two per cent beer which the soldiers consider about as thrilling as the kiss of a man's sister french wire pure steel wire it is a plain coiled wire on which barbs for wire entanglements may be placed it is very pliable fritz another fond term tommy has for the german when particularly friendly tommy refers to him as fritzy galloper a staff officer particularly the general's aide-de-camp so called because usually seen by the soldiers riding at a gallop only general staff officers are mounted gas a sleep producer first introduced by the germans with a favorable wind a gas attack can be very effective there are two kinds cloud and shell the cloud gas is ejected from cylinders placed in or near the front-line trenches the wind catching it and wafting it over no man's land towards the enemy a five mile an hour wind is required to get satisfactory results the gas when ejected drifts along close to the ground and always seeks the lowest levels shell gas is sent over encased in ordinary shells sometimes mixed with shrapnel which when bursting scatter the shrapnel and gas in all directions gas gong generally an empty shell case hung along the front line of a trench the moment that the sentries notice the gas they ring these gongs and this warns the men to put on their gas helmets immediately gas helmets to combat the gas attacks introduced by the germans the british first devised the ph gas helmet it consists of a hood of cotton fabric double thickness soaked in chemicals glass goggles are fitted at the level of the eyes the hood can be adjusted in ten seconds time the loose lower edge being tucked under the coat collar or shirt the air is drawn through the fabric and the poisonous character of the gas neutralized by the chemicals in which the cloth has been saturated breath is exhaled through a collapsed rubber tube mouthpiece see respirator gas shells shells which liberate a poisonous gas when they explode the chief method of gas attack now is to bombard with gas shells getting wind up tommy says the germans are getting wind up when they are so nervous and jumpy in expectation of an attack that they begin firing without a good cause at shadows and imaginary objects a nervous sentry firing at a shadow he thinks is a man may set the whole line ablaze with shell fire over nothing goat talk chaffing joshing with the same general significance as the common expression to get one's goat if tommy is getting the boche's goat across no man's land so much the better going in the short and ready phrase for going into the trenches the opposite of going out or going out of the trenches going over the soldiers in the trenches say going over rather than going over the top or over the top gooseberry entanglements barb wire hoop coils put together so as to form the shape of a ball or gooseberry these are thrown in amongst the other entanglements to hinder the advance of the enemy gone west an expression for death 
likewise the slang kicked in these terms together with the phrase pushing up the daisies are the soldiers common terms for the fate that overtakes comrades and may momentarily overtake themselves gotas got getter suspected of originating from the german a fast scouting biplane corresponding to destroyers gravel crusher an infantryman always walking so named it is explained from his big feet another expression for doughboy grenade a bomb or grenade was not considered a modern weapon of warfare since the crimean war but with the development of trench warfare it was revived and perfected as one of the most efficient modern weapons it is a small iron container about the size of a lemon or a little larger marked off in squares and fitted with a time fuse it is thrown with a stiff overarm movement different from baseball throwing in exploding the shells burst into fragments along the square markings of the container carrying destruction in their path ground flare a cartridge filled with the same kind of illuminating powder as the ordinary flare used by troops in the first wave of an attack to signal their whereabouts to the aeroplanes they can be used day or night although very little flying is done after dark and consequently they are not much needed then about one man in ten carries ground flares in the attack so that when they are set off on signal from the observer in the plane the general attacking line is pretty clearly defined to him grousing tommy out of sorts grumbling is grousing no socks ration parties several hours late etc at first were causes for grousing before tommy got used to it guardhouse lawyer a soldier who is usually in the guardhouse himself who advises other soldiers how to get out gunfire a term referring to morning tea purely local in its application soldiers from different parts of the line not recognizing it at all with that meaning hangars sheds or huts where aeroplanes are housed when not flying they are built of wood tin or canvas as most convenient hanging on the barbed wire absent after a battle h e high explosive shells a high explosive shell contains no bullets it does not explode until it hits the ground but on explosion the shell bursts into fragments which are thrown in all directions heavies the soldiers refer to the big guns as heavies they are large caliber guns discharging shells weighing from sixty pounds to two thousand pounds and are effective at distances of many miles his or ours the question a soldier asks when he hears a shell but cannot see it hissing jenny a four point one high velocity german shell fired from a field gun it may contain either shrapnel high explosive poisonous gas or crying gas it has a velocity of about two thousand four hundred feet per second and makes a hissing sound as it goes hence its name it is used to demolish troops its velocity making it especially deadly howitzer a short muzzle cannon which fires a high explosive shell this war has brought out howitzers of very large caliber and at present they are being used very extensively they are very effective in destroying the strongest fortified positions in a few moments their caliber ranges from four inches to fifteen inches hun the cruelest animal known will soon be extinct the term is derived from the huns of attila an ancient tribe of barbaric people from whom the present-day germans claim to be descended in our opinion it is too good a name for fritz identification disc a small metal plate marked with the soldier's name regimental number and religion this disc is worn around the neck or wrist identification patrol a patrol sent out into no man's land for the purpose of getting a prisoner 
and identifying the enemy troops holding the line opposite. Intense Bombardment The heaviest bombardment our artillery is capable of giving to Fritz. This fire generally wrecks the troops in front of us, and when it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting he is not capable of putting up a stubborn resistance. Invalided Home Sent home on account of sickness or wounds. Irish Diehards Sixth Dragoons of the British Army At the Battle of the Marne only sixty-nine men of this regiment came out of the fight, of the seven hundred who went into it. Iron Rations Tommy's Emergency, or Twenty-Four-Hour Ration, consisting of bully beef, hardtack or ship's biscuit, tea, and sometimes sugar and oxo cubes also applied to the shells thrown by our artillery at the Huns. Island Traverse An island in a communication trench, about eight by twelve feet, around which the trench is dug in a square or oblong shape. This island traverse forms an excellent protection for a machine gun, and it also serves as a kind of switch by which men going up to the front may pass those coming back with less difficulty than in the narrow trenches. End of Lingo of No Man's Land by Lorenzo Smith Part 1 Read by Maria Casper Lingo of No Man's Land by Lorenzo Smith, Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jack Johnson, the largest shell used by Fritz. It is between sixteen and seventeen inches, and when it explodes, it makes a shell crater about twenty feet deep. This shell is also called the Ypres Express, as it reminds one of an express train as it tears through the air, emitting a dense cloud of black smoke when it explodes. Jake, a universal army term meaning something like our expression ripping. It is applied without discrimination to a pretty girl, a good soup or stew, or anything with which there is much satisfaction. It may be an anglicism of the French word chic. Jam tins. Jam tins are exactly what the name implies. In the early days, all empty jam tins were by order collected, filled with high explosive and old pieces of iron, etc., and used as a hand grenade. Sammy will learn soon enough what a jam tin is in the present day fighting, and he will welcome any fresh fruit which comes his way. Jawbone a new verb meaning to obtain credit, as I have jawboned Yank out of five dollars. Jerry, a steel shrapnel helmet, also known as tin hat. Juice, tea, also called char. Jumping off trench, a shallow temporary trench a few yards in advance of the main entrenchments from which an attack is started. The term is also used sometimes with reference to the fire trench itself. When it is a distinct trench by itself, it is simply a shelter for men going over the top before advancing, easier to get out of than the deeper fire trench. It is usually built the night before the attack. Camarade. The Bosch sign of surrender. He raises his hands and shouts, Mercy, Camarade! and the next minute you see Tommy hand him a cigarette or give him a drink from his water bottle. Some Germans surrender in this way until you pass on, and then they grab a rifle and shoot you in the back, their way of expressing thanks for the cigarette or drink of water. Knife Rest A wire entanglement made in sections behind the lines and carried forward at night to be set up in no man's land. This method is easier and quicker than to construct the entanglement out in no man's land exposed to enemy fire. Knuckle Knives Heavy daggers about nine inches long, now part of every Allied soldier's equipment, for use in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. 
the knives have heavy bayonet-like blades and knobbed hilts they are carried in the putties as the highlanders carry a skein do in their socks cookery when the british brought troops from india to the western battle front new weapons outside the knowledge of western warfare were brought into use by the indian soldiers chief among these is the kukri a fifteen to eighteen inch curved knife of the gurkhas the wonderful soldiers from nepal the knife has a razor edge which thickens toward the back to a quarter of an inch the handle which is of wood is bound with copper wire at distances convenient for the fingers to grip the wood easily it can be used either at close quarters or thrown there is no escape by running for so skilful are these indians in the use of the kukri that a man would be beheaded before he had gone ten yards in an effort to escape ladies from hell the complimentary epithet of the germans for the scotch kilties liaison officer officer who maintains communication between battalions or batteries during operations liquid fire the chemical composition of this weapon is kept a secret although it is sometimes referred to as burning petrol or kerosene early in the war when the germans first employed this barbarous weapon it was shot from nozzles like fire hose now individual soldiers may carry a cylinder of the chemicals on their backs with a nozzle attached by which to direct the burning stream at will it will carry about forty yards listening post a shell hole a crater or a place of concealment where scouts lie watching for enemy patrols enemy raids on our trenches or for any useful information an ordinary listening post is occupied by one bomber and two riflemen little willie the german crown prince whom tommy says he expects to make an uncrowned pauper machine gun nests the steel and concrete fortifications behind which several machine guns are placed to rake the enemy lines while protected themselves by the concrete and steel walls of the next fortifications maconachy so called from the manufacturer's name it is canned irish stew or mulligan served in tins the soldiers warm it over trench stoves mad fourth a canadian regiment which won its name of honor by making a hopeless charge april twenty third nineteen fifteen in order to hold the germans back until the british could bring up reinforcements in that fight nineteen officers and six hundred and fifty men were killed mad minute the first minute of an attack it was so named because we fired so many shots in the first minute of an attack that it dazed the huns mechanical transports the trains of motor trucks used to carry forward supplies from the railroads mess tin so necessary a part of the soldiers equipment that one battalion used fifteen thousand from the time they went to france until june nineteen sixteen it is a complete outfit plate cup and bowl in an emergency a shaving mug or a soup can is a worthy substitute mills bomb the official british hand grenade the most deadly weapon for its size in use to-day in france it is thrown like a cricket ball thirty-five yards however is about as far as the average tommy ever throws a mills bomb for results ask fritzy mind the wire expression used when a man goes up the line in other words following the telephone lines etc mine an underground excavation extending out into no man's land as near to the enemy's front line as possible filled with high explosives ready to be blown up at a given signal as a rule the mines are exploded just prior to an attack minihaha name for german miniwerfers or trench mortar shells also called minis mini the german one hundred and ninety eight pound trench mortar high explosive shell which can be plainly seen coming through the air at night it has a tail of fire like a rocket it kills by concussion minor operations small-scale operations or attacks with a definite object in view 
it may take the form of a trench raid to secure information or capture prisoners without any idea of holding the captured trenches but simply to harass the enemy and destroy their morale m o medical officer moat a small house entirely surrounded by a ditch of water we make small forts of them by putting barbed wire in front and back of the ditch and putting machine guns in the house and barricading it with sandbags mopping up clearing the battlefield after action and salvaging all material this includes the hazardous business of cleaning out lurking enemies hidden in dugouts and shell holes awaiting a chance to strike tommy in the back the tricks employed by the germans to take soldiers unawares include all sorts of fanciful and deceptive bombs looking like lost personal articles which explode when picked up moppers up small parties of men detailed to follow the first attacking waves bombing dugouts and looking after any of the enemy missed by the first lines of the advancing attackers mother big naval seventeen-inch gun also called the queen elizabeth motor machine gun batteries machine guns mounted on motorcycles a very effective means of stemming an attack the guns are rushed up the road near which the action is taking place deploying as they near the enemy and almost invariably succeed in turning an enemy success into a rout mufti tommy's term for civilian clothes mulligan irish stew the meat and vegetable stew served out to the soldiers in the trenches mulligan battery the cook wagon mustard gas a new poisonous gas recently used against american soldiers it is dichlorated ethyl sulfide it burns the skin and blisters the bronchial tubes when present in quantity whence its name of mustard gas its intoxication is rarely mortal but the burns are painful and hard to heal the effects are first felt in the eyes six to twelve hours after taking followed by a congestion hardly painful but bothering to the vision this phase is regularly over in three days it is followed by breathing troubles which begin by an almost complete extinction of the voice this phase lasts approximately four days and is followed in turn by congestion of the lungs which requires a long time to cure by reason of the frequent relapses when health is apparently restored finally there are burns on the skin looking like red splotches these may be painful or even frightful but are never mortal unless a great portion of the skin has been exposed to the action of the gas for a long time the action is quickest on damp surfaces and the body burns are the result of the action of the body heat and moisture on the gas children and civilians are likely to suffer even more from this kind of a gas attack because of the body burns from which it is difficult to protect them m and d abbreviation for militia and defense the canadian department at ottawa corresponding to the war office in london or the war department at washington also stands for medicine and duty representing the small ailment treatment a dose of physic and back to work m and v meat and vegetables or in official army language rations napu in the familiar parlance of the trench napu means done for killed it is presumably a corruption of the french phrase ne plus no more and is used not only with reference to the death of a comrade but with the general meaning it is finished napper tommy's word for head you duck your napper when passing a bad place in the parapet n c o a non-commissioned officer night ops night patrol no man's land the stretch of land lying between the german front line and our own ground much coveted by both sides but owned by neither along one section our reconnoitering parties called it canada's land because they rarely ran across a hun out there during the night patrols 
this neutral space between the enemy lines varies in width from twenty-five to four or five hundred yards the enemy has even been as close as fifteen yards observation balloon a captive balloon kept several miles behind the front line the men in these balloons are equipped with powerful glasses with telescopic lens they watch closely all movements of the enemy and also locations of artillery and enemy aeroplanes who attempt to pass over observation post an observation post is a point in our lines from which a clear view can be obtained of the enemy territory if it is an infantry observation post the enemy movements and defenses are noted and reported direct if it is an artillery post connection with the battery is made by telephone the observer reporting to the gunners all movements and defenses within range all firing from the battery which is often miles behind the lines is controlled by these observation posts far up near the enemy country o c abbreviation for officer commanding battalion under the direct command of the brigadier of the division or officer in charge of any unit o d olive drab or on dress old man universal term of affection for the colonel of the regiment old swati an old soldier one star wonder a second lieutenant his badge of rank being a single star open up the usual expression for beginning to fire o pip the soldier's name for observation post from which the movements of the enemy are watched through telescopes out there the usual english expression for at the front about the same as the americans over there over the tapes rehearsing the plan of attack behind the lines so as to avoid misunderstandings and delays in action is called over the tapes from aerial photographs a map of white tape is laid out in a field behind the lines showing the relation and direction of enemy trenches from our own and the distance between the various points each soldier learns exactly how far and in what direction from his own post is the part of the enemy trench which he is to reach and capture over the top before the attack friends of the party participating often bid them adieu over the top and the best of luck or over the top and give them hell oyster bombs oyster-shaped hand grenades with projections around the edge unlike the ordinary grenade it explodes by concussion that is upon hitting something solid instead of by a time fuse package another expression for a wound or blighty that is a wound serious enough to take the boys home to england to recuperate strange as it may appear to those in mufti tommy sometimes welcomes blighty or a package with joy padre universal term for army chaplains irrespective of creed or denomination pancake the aeroplane pancaked down meaning dropping flat on all fours so to speak instead of coming down in a gliding position patrol parties these are groups of from three to twenty men usually accompanied by an officer sent out into no man's land at night with some definite object in view either to report on enemy movements in their trenches condition of the barbed wire entanglements or locations of breaks through which attacking infantry may go men are frequently called upon to volunteer for some special trick of this sort small parties usually go out on this work and move by stealth creeping and crawling from shell hole to shell hole to keep out of sight of the enemy when a rocket or star shell makes no man's land as bright as day large patrols armed with machine guns are sometimes sent out to attack and capture an enemy patrol and secure information from the prisoners parapet a tier of sandbags empty jam tins old bombs etc built on the front side of the trench to form a target for fritz's artillery a model parapet should be at least forty inches thick to keep a bullet from penetrating from the fire step to the top of the parapet is four feet six inches 
parados. The parados is opposite the parapet, and its purpose is to stop the backward effect of shrapnel bursting behind the parados. It should be the same height as a parapet, and built along the same lines. When a German trench is captured, the parados of their line then becomes the firing step for the British holding it against counter-attack. Pea shooter, the artillery man's name for his gun. Periscope, an instrument used for seeing no man's land by day without exposing any part of a man's body to the enemy. It is used by submarines also. Pill, term used indiscriminately for rifle and machine gun bullets and even larger shells. Pill box, a square box like protection in which a number of men take refuge to hold a position against attack. It is made of iron and concrete. Pipsqueak, the British shell corresponding to the Germans hissing jenny. It is smaller than the German shell and makes a sound like its name followed by a switch crump. It is usual to reply to a bombardment with shells in kind, so that duels of the front are sometimes staged between hissing jennies and pipsqueaks. The velocity of the English shell is about 2,200 feet per second. Plugged. Another expressive term for clicked, killed by bullet or shrapnel. Poilu, the French enlisted man corresponding with the English Tommy and the American Sammy or Yank. Poisonous Gas First employed by the Germans at the Battle of the Somme, the first gas used was chlorine, and after the first surprise attack, the British learned to know it by the yellow, low-rolling clouds sweeping across no man's land. Since then, other gases have been employed by both sides, the composition of which is regarded as a military secret. One gas employed by the Germans is invisible and not distinguishable, it is said, until the victim falls dead. Protection against this deadly chemical is found in the rats which inhabit the trenches and succumb more quickly than the men to its effects, thus acting as detectors. Gas shells contain various compositions calculated to spread rapidly in all directions when the shell explodes. The advantage of gas shells is more apparent when it is remembered that the first method of shooting gas from a nozzle was only possible when the wind was in the right direction to carry it away from the Hun's own lines. Sometimes even so they suffered from their own weapon. Both methods are still employed, however, and every soldier must carry gas masks as part of his regular equipment in the field gas inhaled destroys the lung tissues and is both very painful and suffocating poultice wallopers hospital orderlies pushing up the daisies this expression means a man has been killed and buried quarter blocky quarter master sergeant rabbit's hole trench name for small holes just large enough for one man to find shelter usually in the rear of the trenches, a name also used sometimes in reference to mines. Railhead, the central station for collecting troops and wounded men from the trenches, is called the Railhead. At this place are concentration camps or base hospitals, and the headquarters of the general base hospital staff. RAMC, Royal Army Medical Corps, also rob all my comrades. Rations, the scale of food allowed to each soldier, the regular apportionment of food. Rat poison, affectionate term for cheese. The trench rats which swarm about are fed up on cheese. Reconnaissance, a survey of the enemy line by a patrol to learn the lay of the land and gather information about the entire position. Red cap, a staff officer, so-called because of the red band on his cap. Redoubt, a particularly strongly fortified section of trenches, with barbed wire entanglements on all sides, to permit the garrison to hold out during an enemy attack, and, if possible, to break it up. Refilling point, the station or supply depot where the mechanical transport trains turn over their supplies to the quartermasters of the different units in the front trenches. 
Regulation strafing. Regular daily grist of shells sent over about the same time every day, without any apparent purpose of attacking or doing more than simply harassing the enemy. Re-up, re-enlist. Revetment, a support for the wall of the trenches made of chicken wire, young saplings woven between stakes, burlap, anything to strengthen the side of the trench. Ricochet, when a bullet or piece of shrapnel hits a wall or solid object and glances off before hitting a soldier, it is called a ricochet. Oftentimes soldiers are wounded in this manner, especially when there happens to be an old wall or shattered house where bullets can glance off easily. Rifle, the soldier's best friend, none to equal him in the trenches. They give him the uttermost care, keep him polished and well-oiled, you may need him at any moment to save your life, and when you call on him he will be at your service if you treat him as your dearest friend and keep him in the very best condition. Riveter. A machine-gun or automatic rifle, so called from the sound in action. Root or rooty. Rooty is a term which is used by the British troops in India, and the word found its way back to England. Every British Tommy uses the term rooty for bread. Rum jar. Not a drinking vessel, but a term for the Germans' homemade trench mortar. It looks like a piece of stovepipe on a wooden base. The rum jar is filled with all kinds of metal bits and is fitted with a time fuse. Rum ration. All British soldiers are dealt out a measure of rum each morning before stand-down or roll-call. Runner. Men used to carry messages during an attack. In many cases the wires are cut by the enemy artillery, and these men have to carry the messages on foot. Salient. An unevenness, bulge or angle in the line, projecting toward the enemy trenches. A salient is a particularly dangerous part of the line because it is liable to attack on both sides, and to cross-fire over every inch of it, a very uncomfortable place in which to be. Salvo, the simultaneous firing of the guns of a battery. Sammy, the soldier whom Uncle Sam sends to the front, Tommy's American cousin from the U.S., also called Yank and Buddy. Sand rats, soldiers who stay in the pits on the ranges and score the targets in firing practice. San Ferrian, an expression from the French, cela ne fait rien, meaning the same as napu, or the opposite sense of Jake, no good, done for. Sap. There are two kinds of saps, underground and surface. The underground sap is burrowed by the mining engineer or tunneler for the purpose of blowing up mines and listening for sounds of enemy tunnelers. The surface sap is simply a continuation of a front-line trench out into no man's land, where listening post sentries take up their positions at night. The usefulness of these saps is demonstrated when the British, or Germans, have their engineers mine across no man's land to a point under the enemy trenches, where a heavy charge of dynamite or other high explosive is placed. The explosion not only destroys the trenches, but is timed to catch a large number of soldiers occupying the trenches at the time. The British blew up a whole hill at Messine Ridge, killing two battalions of German soldiers and making a crater in the earth two acres across. Sapper, a private in the Engineering Corps. Part of their work is digging the mines to blow up enemy fortifications. The sapper is supposed to have more skill and initiative than the average infantryman. He does all kinds of engineering work, mostly supervising the infantry working parties which are supplied to him on demand. Sausage, an observation balloon, so called because its shape reminds one of a sausage. Scaling ladder, a short ladder used for climbing out of deep trenches. Scouts, men who patrol the battalion frontage at night and report any unusual enemy movements. Second Barrage. The barrage proper is laid down before advancing troops, or over a particular area. 
when the attack comes a second barrage is directed to drop a line of bursting shells at a distance back of the fire trenches thus cutting off the front lines from supplies and reinforcements from the rear while the enemy attack takes place enemy forces caught between the two are practically annihilated secret scout a new english scout monoplane which travels one hundred forty five miles an hour tommy says the germans would give ten thousand men and a zepp to learn the secret of its construction as one hundred forty miles an hour is the fastest hun plane sector a portion of the front it may mean one or two traverses or the distance held by a battalion or a full brigade seventy five the famous french gun which has the record of firing twenty-eight shells a minute shag an inferior kind of cigarette tobacco used by the british soldiers shave tail a new sub-lieutenant or second lieutenant so called because new army mules have their tails shaved this term is more used in the american army than in the british shell shock concussion frequently leads to shell shocks from which the soldier does not recover for weeks and months as a nervous disorder it makes a man irritable and quarrelsome a result of one of the most fiendish inventions for which the germans have been notorious in this war music is often employed as a means of arousing interest in shell-shock patients shiv trench slang for shave british army officers consider the discipline that requires every soldier to shave each morning if at all possible is one of the strongest factors in keeping up the morale of the troops shock troops generally picked troops who have seen previous fighting the best trained and most effective for an offensive or assault shrapnel shell a shrapnel shell contains many leaden bullets which make a rain of lead when the shell explodes this is why so often the dispatches read wounded by shrapnel if the shell is timed to explode in the air as is usually the case these bullets are thrown forward some two hundred fifty yards if the shell explodes on the ground the effect is not so great see a plane a small plane of size and type similar to the curtis plane but much faster and more sensitive to control its speed is almost as great as the newport some sea planes carry something like one thousand pounds load in addition to the pilot and observer these machines are used for day bombing and special reconnaissance they hold the record for climbing silent susie a german high explosive shell not heard until it bursts as most of the large shells can be both seen and heard the silent susie is more to be feared than some of the others sometimes called the silent lizzie skilly a thick soup of meat and vegetables served out in army rations slacks the trousers of the undress uniform the invalided men appear in slacks and minus putties while convalescing slum beef hash s m sergeant major the senior non-commissioned officer of a battalion who is the official spokesman between the adjutant and the non-commissioned officers as the adjutant is between the sergeant major and the officer commanding smoke bomb a shell which on bursting gives forth dense smoke it is used chiefly to conceal movements of troops sneeze gas to force the removal of the protecting gas masks the germans have used what the soldiers call sneeze gas because its action is to cause a violent desire to sneeze it is chemically diphenylchlorazine and shells containing it are mixed with other shells in a bombardment on explosion it expands to a damp gas containing arsenic invisible odorless and subtle which penetrates the filters of the gas masks causing great irritation of the nasal passages removal of the mask however means death the british have now devised a means of filtering this gas just as the chlorine gases and tear gases are neutralized in the box respirator and ph helmet so that they are no longer greatly to be feared sniper 
a sharpshooter located in some place of advantage like an old tree or a ruined tower close enough to the enemy lines for him to be able to pick off any man caught above the parapet the contour of the ground and the constant shell fire make many places dangerous where the trench walls are low or partly blown away and any soldier who forgets to duck his head in passing such a spot is a fair target for the sniper a crack shot is picked from the battalion and is allowed to choose his own place to snipe at fritzy's head s o l the signaler's alphabet for delete applied to anything that cannot be done or anything that is out of the question s o s the term applied to the signal the infantry send up in case of a boche attack usually two or three rockets of various colors which are changed from time to time when the artillery sentry sees this he signals his battalion for action in support of the attached infantry in front of him to the artillerymen s o s means save our souls spotting or contact aeroplanes light fast planes flying at a height of twenty five hundred to three thousand feet to detect placement of enemy batteries and receive signals from their own trenches they are not fighting machines and are therefore usually protected in their work by a second patrol flying four thousand feet or more above them commissioned to intercept any enemy planes that may try to interfere with the successful observations of the spotting planes stag heap at the mouth of coal mines large mounds are formed and when a shell strikes these heaps the coal dust flies and portions slide down if you happen to be at the bottom you immediately look like one of the gold dust twins stand to every evening at sunset for half an hour and again every morning at dawn the order is given to stand to which means that every man stands alert his pack on his back his rifle loaded facing the enemy in anticipation of a possible attack after standing to the order is stand down and the men may then go to their dugouts leaving only the sentries on duty stand down the order countermanding stand to star shell or very light rocket fired from a pistol it bursts in the air with a fireworks display bright enough to illuminate no man's land and reveal enemy scouts colored shells are used for signals the very bright s o s rocket is called by the soldiers save our souls steam roller the term applied to the one hundred twenty six german divisions hurled at the british line in their effort to take amiens in april nineteen eighteen steel ring a peculiar weapon of the indian soldiers is a kind of steel ring which they carry on their heads like a fillet it also has a razor edge which thickens abruptly to the inner rim in an attack the ring is lifted from the head and hurled with such skill and force that it will half bury itself in a tree trunk yards away and cuts a man's head off very neatly and expeditiously as the indian soldiers have been transferred to the mesopotamian battlefront on account of the unaccustomed climatic conditions in france these weapons are not now seen in the west stokes gun a very effective small gun used in the trenches it has a range of from fifty to three hundred yards and fires a shell similar to a mill's hand grenade it is operated by a release lever and a five second time fuse the shell is of cast steel weighs some twelve pounds and carries a charge of aminol the gun is operated by a spring and is so rapid in action that as many as eight shells may be in the air at one time unless the range between the front-line trenches and the enemy is sufficient for the gun to be used in the fire trenches it is usually worked from the second-line trenches storks aeroplanes strafing from the german hate used to refer to a heavy bombardment by the germans thus a rain of shells from the enemy is described as fritz is strafing striker a soldier who works for an officer suicide club general term for machine gunners grenadiers wiring parties trench mortar squads trench raiders or others engaged in extra hazardous duties sumps 
shell holes a common usage of the word is in the phrase connecting up sumps that is building trenches quickly by digging from one shell hole to another supervision trench a secondary trench close to the fire trench used for purposes of lateral communication and supervision of the front line tail slide the descent of an aeroplane sliding down tail first the stunts of the flying machines at the front have brought into common usage a vocabulary of their own taking over the act of relieving a force in the trenches a battalion takes over a section or trench tank the following description is taken from an editorial page of the christian science monitor it is said that the name tank was selected because of the need for the camouflage of secrecy and not because of the inherently genial oddity of the creature itself the tanks are of two varieties the male and the female according to their armament the male is said to precede his better half into battle for the purpose of breaking up the enemy emplacements while she pays her assiduous attentions to the men seeking her lord's destruction needless to say the name caught on from the very first with everybody except the german who refusing to see its grim humor ponderously dubbed the tank the schutzengraben vernichtungs automobile long after the tank made its dramatic appearance on the western front it refused to be photographed except for purposes of private circulation messages with regard to it were coded for instance as ten willies reach you to-day to help in concealing the destination of the tanks at the stage when any allusion to their destination was precluded they were painted with the directions with care to petrograd they were concealed under tarpaulins they were transported at night and unloaded and driven to their stables under acetylene flares as they issued from the gloom into the circle of light there appeared as it were a brood of slug-shaped monsters purring or roaring and panting and even emitting flames as they slid or pivoted over the ground behind them was a tail in the shape of ridiculous wheels mr wells the original sponsor for the tank did not like the caudal appendages he said they reminded him of a monster begun as a kangaroo and ending as a doll's perambulator these steering wheels annoyed him and it is understood they have disappeared at least they are not to be seen on the creature in mufti in spite of this loss the tanks are said to be as docile and responsive as trained elephants under their own mahouts the tanks tacitly are the nurses and protectors of the attacking infantry apart from their fighting qualities the very grotesqueness of the machines their ungainly indescribable method of progress their colouring surpassing on the battlefield it is said the sickliest fancies of the most rabid cubist proved to be actual moral assets their debut was as much a surprise to the british tommy as it was to the german infantry but while they instilled terror in the german they supplied the touch of comic relief to the british soldier who has always been blessed with a keen sense of the ridiculous as they heaved their bulk clumsily across no man's land they acted as an excellent antidote to the effect of the jack johnsons the weary willies the silent susies the whiz bangs the sausages and the rum jars which had hitherto held the field by virtue of their innate grotesqueness and humour in a moment the tank became for tommy the amusing mechanical big brother while tommy laughed holding his sides behemoth clad in his bullet-proof skin seemed to laugh also he laughed at entanglements laughed at machine-guns and trenches and laughed at everything else as he cantered and keeled swung and swayed slanted and pitched and nosed his way along the shell-holes and ditches tear gas composition of this gas is said to be benzyl bromide and iodide its action is to cause painful irritation of the eyes and a rush of tears temporarily blinding the victim chloride and bromide xylite is another tear gas which not only blinds but suffocates tear shell one form of gas shell is called the tear shell because on explosion it gives off an irritating gas that causes temporary blindness the eyes smart and tears flow terrain a word taken from the french meaning the lay of the land or the conformation of the ground 
Tickler's Artillery, Jam Tin Grenades. There is a large English jam manufacturer whose product is one of the main articles of diet in the army. His tins were frequently used in making hand grenades, especially in the early days of the war when there was a great shortage of munitions. Tin Hat Tommy's name for the steel helmet. The name sometimes applies to staff officers. Tommy Atkins, the most common name for the British soldier. Tootfinny, Tommy's expression for all finished, from the French tout fine. Torp, trench slang for aerial torpedo. Tot, the regulation rum ration of two tablespoons of rum dealt out in winter to men on active duty to warm them up, especially after a cold sentry go, morning and evening. Tracer bullet. A bullet leaving a flame or spiral of smoke behind it, which enables the operator of the gun to follow its course and recognize hits, especially used by aviators, where it is very valuable at close range as a check on marksmanship. Transport. Motor trucks, ammunition wagons, mule carts, etc., for the conveyance of all army stores, kits, and rations when a unit is on the move. Battalion transport brings up the rations to its battalion when in the line, or if not to it as close as is possible. Traverse. A section of trench connecting two fire bays. The earth wall left in building trenches, dividing the sections of trench from each other, so as to localize the effect of shells. If the trenches were perfectly straight, a bursting shell would shower death up and down the trench for many yards. But by building the trenches with irregularities, like a square-toothed saw, the effect of a shell is felt only in the particular small portion in which it lands. Trench. A deep, narrow, zigzag ditch made to hold soldiers, but usually found half full of mud and water. The narrow trenches have broadened the vocabulary of Tommy. Trench Canal. Also ration heater. It is a trench candle made of a short length of tightly rolled newspaper, pasted and soaked in melted paraffin. Trench feet. A disease of the feet caused by exposure to the wet and cold during the first year of the war. The first British contingency suffered frightful casualties from standing in water hour after hour in the trenches in 1914. Trench flare also called star or very shells, similar to the rockets of the 4th of July. These rockets are used to illuminate no man's land and thus prevent a surprise attack. Those fired from a pistol are called pistol flares. Trench mat. A boarded walk through the trenches which enables the soldier to carry a heavier load than would be possible on a slimy earth bottom. Trench mats are built in sections about five feet long by eighteen inches wide, and are carried from the rear to be placed along the trenches. Since the day when the engineers came on the scene and constructed trench mats, the trouble with trench feet has been negligible. Before that time, the casualties of the first British contingency from trench feet were frightful, as the men were obliged to stand in water for days at a time. Trench mat is also called duck walk. Trench mortar. There are several kinds of trench mortars. Usually the term trench mortar is applied to a large heavy gun with a very high trajectory and used at close range. Being effective only at short distances, these shells are stationed right in the trenches. The shells are high explosives of different sizes and are very heavy and very effective. A 298-pound torpedo from a trench mortar will go 10 to 16 feet into the ground before exploding if the ground is soft, and lighting in the trench it will wipe out a whole section. The shell is thrown in a high arc, coming down almost perpendicularly. These projectiles get Fritzy's goat quicker than anything we can put over. There is also a light trench gun with a range of from 400 to 1,500 yards, it throws a bomb weighing from 13 to 298 pounds, containing high explosives and no bullets. These shells are deadly because of the fragments into which the steel jacket bursts. The effectiveness of one of these high explosive trench mortars is realized when a direct hit by one of their shells will completely demolish an entire bay. Trench Raid 
an attack on enemy trenches on a small scale, usually made to obtain identification of the enemy unit opposite, and with no intention to hold same. Turtles, German hand grenades. Typewriter, another expression for machine gun, corresponding to riveter and similar terms arising from its sound in action. Underground cable. An ordinary cable containing almost any number of telephone wires, usually five or six, buried from five to seven feet under the surface of the earth to protect it from shell fire, thus ensuring good communication in any average bombardment. Up the line. When the men go to the trenches to relieve another regiment, they are said to go up the line. Up you go, and the best of luck, is the adieu when a man's blighty is healed and he leaves the comfortable hospital for the trenches again. Victoria Cross, V.C., the highest decoration conferred on a soldier for bravery. Also, the Canucks designation for his home country, Victorious Canada. Visibility, the condition of the atmosphere by which the terrain and the enemy positions are easily observed or not seen, as the case may be. The heavy gunfire and the low undrained ground cause mists, smoke, and other atmospheric conditions affecting observations either from observation posts or by aeroplane scouts, so that visibility or the condition of the atmosphere is a very important factor. A foggy day, low visibility, while unfavorable to observation, is favorable to a surprise attack. Volplane, the technical term for an aeroplane gliding to rest with the engine shut off. Vril, usual term for the spinning nose-dive, one of the feats which every aeroplane pilot must be able to perform. Waders. These are the high rubber boots worn by the men in the trenches to protect them from the mud and water that fills the bottom of the trenches. When the men are relieved from duty, these boots are left behind for the next company going into the trenches, rubber being scarce. Wagon Soldier, an artilleryman. Wave, a line of troops in an assault. The first line is called the first wave, that following the second wave, and so on. The line which bombs out the positions passed by the preceding lines is called the mopping-up wave. Weeping gas. Tear gas, the results of which are not fatal. It is sent over in shells and is colorless. It does no permanent damage, but it tends to weaken the efficiency of troops affected for the time being by getting into their eyes, bringing tears, and having a more or less blinding effect. Anti-tier shell goggles are now an issue in the army, and if put on in time are an absolute prevention. Weeping pill, another name for tear shell or the shell containing irritating gas that causes temporary blindness of soldiers affected by it. Whiz-bang, the name given Fritz's three-inch field battery shell. All you hear is a whiz and then a bang. This is a high-explosive shrapnel shell, and is responsible for the largest percentage of the casualties. It is said to be the only shell one can't get away from. It travels so fast it beats its own sound. Whistling Jimmy. Howitzer shell, so named from the noise it makes going through the air. Wipers. Tommy's name for Ypres. Wiring Party. Wiring parties are sent out at night to repair damage in the barbed wire entanglements, or to put up new entanglements in front of the trenches. The work is always done at night, in order to avoid the danger of enemy fire. Woodpecker. Machine gun sniping is called woodpecker. For instance, a machine gun may be trained on a certain point which all messengers and troops must pass going up to the firing trenches or leaving them, thus compelling them to pass through a veritable rain of lead. Ypres Express, a term common earlier in the war, referring to the big gun batteries, the rumble of which sounded like an approaching train. Zepp, a German dirigible, used chiefly to bombard unfortified cities and towns and to kill the civilians. Zepp raids in England were expected to terrorize the inhabitants. Zero time, the time set for the attack. 
In rehearsing an attack, the lines of the barrage are worked out to the minute, so that when the artillery begins fire, all guns are firing at a given range. Two minutes later, the range is lengthened, on a pre-arranged schedule, etc. To perfect this work, all watches must be synchronized, and this is done with nicety by London time some hours before the attack. Zero time is the exact time when the attack begins. It may be any minute of the twenty-four hours, but the sealed code message giving the time decided upon is delivered by hand to the commanding officer, as for instance 402 or two minutes after four. When all the synchronized watches point to 402, the artillery begins without further orders or carrying of messages. Any individual error in watches may clearly be very costly. End of Lingo of No Man's Land by Lorenzo Smith, Part 2 Read by Maria Casper Ghost from Tales of a Famished Land by Edward Air Hunt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Belgian peasants say that on the eve of all souls, unquiet spirits are loosed from their graves for an hour after sunset. Those who died by violence or those who died unshriven rise from the dark and speak to passers-by. They rise with the load of their sins upon them, with the hatred or fear or agony or longing which they felt while dying still in their tortured hearts, and they beg the passers-by to take vengeance on their enemies or to give them news of those they loved or hated. And after a brief hour they sink back again into the dust. I believe the story, for I have met those sad spirits. It was on a foggy evening in October, All Souls' Eve, on the road from Brussels to Antwerp, where Belgians and Britain a year before faced the German hordes in weeks of bitter fighting. We were in a terrible hurry. Pierre, the chauffeur, was driving the motor car, and I was seated beside him. The headlights blurred like drowned eyes, and the open windshield dripped with wet, if we met a belated cart, or if we misjudged distances on that winding road, we would never reach our destination alive. But we were in a hurry, for it was All Souls' Eve, the night of the dead. Drowned trees writhed in the blurred light, culverts leaped out of the yellow flood like fountains, and dead walls in the burned and ravished villages seemed like rows of Roman tombs. We flew through the murdered town of Epigym, down vacant alleys lined with gaunt, disemboweled dwellings, beneath the shell of a church, beside stark walls lit for a breathless instant by the headlight of the motor, then blotted into chaos. It was eerie and terrifying. A peculiar odor of decay, the odor of sour soil in early spring, when the grip of ice is relaxed and the buried abominations of winter steal up into the sun, rose from the town and pursued us a smell like rotten fungi in old crypts sounds like the flapping of garments on a clothesline stole through the steady bass roar of the motor and to my heavy eyes tortured with staring into the yellow blur ahead a vague shape seemed to float beside the car a shape which was strangely human erect but rigid flying along like a dry leaf upright in a gale i could see it only with the tail of my eye it disappeared when I turned my head. It was clearest when I rolled my eyes high and looked through the lower part of the retina. A sort of second sight, I suppose. The thing puzzled, angered, then frightened me. Faster! Vita! Vita! I yelled, suddenly grasping Pierre by the arm. The shadowy thing danced into the edges of the blur of light directly ahead. Look out, Pierre! The emergency brake came on with a grind and a jolt, and the lights flared with the pulse of the engine. "'It's nothing,' I protested, half ashamed of myself, for evidently Pierre saw nothing. "'Encore, plus vita.' We seemed to have lost the shadow thing, until suddenly I discovered that there were others with it, swinging rigid through the fog, 
like trees uprooted in a cyclone. My eyes were smarting with cold tears. It was like swimming with one's eyes open in a stiff current. And all the time I watched the shadow shapes gathering closer. Faintly luminous, pale yellow blots seemed to grow in the dingy black of the racing forms. They were phosphorescent as I think of them now. Something brushed my hair. A clicking sound like castanets came from the empty tunu behind me, and then a whistling, like the speech of a man with no palate. Feld, Feld, Wiebelwerk, aus Bayem sex, sechsundzwanzigsten, infanterie regiment. I turned my head with an involuntary sob. There was absolutely nothing in the car. Pierre put on the brakes violently. Do you see anything? I demanded. Nothing, monsieur. Do you hear or smell anything? We listened and sniffed. Nothing, monsieur, Pierre said, quivering and crossing himself. The noise of the motor died, and we sat motionless in gruesome darkness, listening to the hollow dripping of fog water on the fallen leaves in the roadway. We were swallowed, lost in mist, with only a square yard of paved road visible before us. Go on, Pierre, I said softly. Then gradually I saw the ghost more plainly. A woman, bent like an old hinge, flung along beside the flying motor car, and a naked, frightened child ran fearfully before her. Ask him, Gruta, ask him about home, a thin child voice sobbed. A younger woman, whose head had been hacked from her shoulders, floated along with them, fondling the severed member and wailing. De Dochers, the Germans! A group of mangled bodies of Belgian artillerymen hung like a swarm of bees together, mouthing curses as they flew, and a gigantic peasant, with a clotted beard and arms stretched rigid in the form of a cross, stared with a face stabbed through and through like honeycomb. Field Wilbur, Stoner, Kunig Kaiser, Vaterland, Say Leben Hock, whispered a voice. The swarming spirits grew till they darkened the mist. We flew through the empty corridors of Malena and on to Welheim, first of the Antwerp forts to fall, up the ridge to Varlus and Kantisha, toward Udgad and the inner forts. Still the swarms grew, crowding closer and closer. The eyes of the dead peered like cat's eyes in the yellow dark, and my soul chilled to ice. The odor of dead clay was so strong I nearly fainted, and bony fingers seemed to press against my back and shoulders as if heavy wires were freezing into the flesh. "'Light the dash light, for God's sakes, Pierre!' I cried, hoping the new electric blur would banish the phantoms. But their sulfurous eyes glowed only the more in its feeble ray." and the hissing, clicking, and rattling grew. Feldwebel Stoner, Osberian, Tot, Epigem, September Dreisen, König, Kaiser, und Vaterland, Hoch, a voice shrilled. De Dochers, De Dochers, sobbed an echo after it. And then, with a sudden access of horror, I remembered the saying of the peasants. I knew what had wakened those unquiet spirits, knew that they wished to question me, knew that I must answer their questions in the brief hour of their release. All of them I must answer. Liebenhock, screamed the German voice. Are we in Paris? No, I shouted. Swiss Francois, vive la France, have we reached the Rhine? No. Belge, is Belgium free? No. Honor, the honor of my country, honor, honor. No. Social Democrat, for world peace I fought, that the world might have peace. Is there peace? No. Kyrie of Wurlu, dead for my church and my flock, are we victorious? No. No. Ask, Ruta, ask, trilled a child's voice, and a sad shriek answered it. Home, the little farm on the road to Ilvite, beside Kestovirde. Is it safe? I knew that farm, a blackened ruin like the castle beside it, with two lath crosses leaning crazily over sunken graves in the dooryard. 
No. No, no, no. The horrid refrain beat them back. By ones and tens and hundreds they asked and were denied. They had died as most men live, hoping tomorrow would bring bliss which yesterday withheld. They had died as most men live for dreams. In all the world there was no consolation for them, no word of honest hope or recompense. In all the world there was nothing for them but a shallow grave and a little wooden cross. I came from Devon to Antwerp, sir, with the Marines. Have we whipped the Huns? No. A woman's passionate voice screamed out. They murdered my child, they murdered my man, they murdered me. Vengeance! 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 No! 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 And I fell forward in the car senseless. When I awoke, the fog had almost disappeared. Pierre was chafing my cold hands, and the shallow shapes had gone. They had sunken again into their hollow graves, unsatisfied, unconsoled. We rode swiftly on toward Antwerp. A clean breeze stole up from the west, purifying the stricken fields and their sad memories. It tore the last remnants of gray veil from the sky. And as we turned into the black, silent city streets, I leaned my head far back and stared up into the night with a sudden sense of relief and even of comfort. The sick little planet Earth fell away from me, far, far, infinitely far, and about me was unvexed emptiness and the tremendous stars. End of Ghost From Tales from a Famished Land By Edward Air Hunt Read by Mary in Arkansas Chapter 14 of Army Boys on the Firing Line Or Holding Back the German Drive by Homer Randall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information, or to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 14 The Storm of War. Listen to that music, said Frank to his comrades the next morning, as a furious cannonade opened up that made the ground shake and filled the air with flying missiles of death. Too many bass notes in it to be real good music, remarked Billy with a grin. Maybe it's the overture just before the rising of the curtain, suggested Bart. Perhaps it is, agreed Frank. The hunt has got to start his drive sometime, and this would be just a kind of morning for it. See how heavy that mist lies on the ground? We couldn't see the Germans at a distance of fifty yards. That's mighty thick for a fact, observed Bart. But I guess our advance posts are on the job. They'll give us warning in plenty of time. Not that we need much warning as far as I can see, said Billy. We've been ready for a long time to fight at the drop of a hat. I'll bet the Hun doesn't carry a foot of our line. That's where you're wrong, Billy, old scout, warned Bart. It stands to reason that he'll get away with something at first. You take any one man, no matter how strong he is, and if ten fellows rush him all at once, they're bound to drive him back at the start. The Huns have got the advantage of knowing where they're going to strike. We don't know, and so we have to spread our forces out so as to be ready to meet him at any point. Then, too, the man who comes rushing in has the advantage of the fellow who's standing still because he's got momentum. That's why generals would rather fight on the offensive than on the defensive. They're able to pick the time and place, and the other fellow has to follow his lead. I don't see why the Allies can't take the offensive, grumbled Billy. It gets my goat to let the Huns hit first. It does mine, too, admitted Frank. And if it hadn't been for Russia quitting, we'd be looking now at the coattails of the Kaiser's generals as they scooted back to Berlin. But that's a bit of hard luck that we can't help. Russia's back down has taken ten million soldiers from the Allies' strength. But America will make that all up in time, 
and then you'll see us doing the chasing. It can't come too soon to suit me, said Billy. I only wish Uncle Sam had started sooner to get ready. So do I, replied Frank. But there's no use crying over spilt milk. We're getting ahead now with leaps and bounds. I was talking to Will Stone the other day, and he'd just got back from a flying trip to one of the French seaports. He says it simply knocked him stiff to see the transports coming in, loaded to the guards with American troops. And he says the roads are fairly choked with doughboys moving this way. They're coming like a swarm of locusts, and there's millions more where they came from. Oh, Uncle Sam is awake now, all right, and don't you forget it. And when he once gets started, there's nothing on earth can stop him. Right you are, said Bart. We've won every war we've ever been in, and it's got to be a habit, grinned Billy. The old 37th was stationed on the second line, or what is called in military terms, the line of resistance. In modern fighting, when a heavy attack is expected, the defending army is usually arranged in three lines. The first is the advanced line, and this is hardly expected to be held very long. Its chief aim is to hold back the enemy for a while and weaken him as far as possible. Not many troops are employed on this line, nor many big guns. The chief reliance is on rifle fire and machine guns which are so placed as to deliver a withering crossfire and cut up the enemy divisions. By the time the first line is driven back, the defending army knows where the enemy has chosen to strike and is ready for him on the second line, or line of resistance. Here the battle is on in all its fury. If here again the enemy advances, there is still a third line of battle positions. This is practically the last entrenched position that the defenders have. If they are driven back from this into the open country beyond, it becomes a serious thing for the retreating army, as many of their big guns will have been lost, and their forces are apt to be more or less disorganized, while the enemy is flushed with the victory he has so far gained. The cannonade kept on with increasing fury all through the early morning. Heine must have plenty of ammunition, remarked Frank. He's spending it freely. It beats anything we've been up against since we came to the front, observed Billy. It seems to be coming nearer and nearer all the time, said Bart. I guess this is going to be our busy day. There was intense activity all through the lines. Orderlies galloped from place to place with orders. Big motor cars rumbled up loaded with troops who were hastily placed in position. The big guns of the Allied forces had opened up and were sending back shell for shell over the enemy lines. For over two hours the artillery kept up the titanic duel. The fog was lifting, though still heavy in some of the low-lying sections. The 37th was resting easily on its arms, ready for whatever might happen. We may not see so much fighting after all, remarked Billy, after a while. The fellows in front seem to be holding pretty well. Perhaps they'll throw the Huns back right from the start. Don't kid yourself, replied Frank grimly. That first line is almost sure to go. It's expected to. It's only a forlorn hope anyway. We'll get our stomachs full of fighting before the day is over. Even while he spoke, there were signs of confusion up in front. Groups of men came in sight, evidently retreating. Machine-gun crews, bringing their weapons with them, were hurriedly setting them up in new positions. There would be a few discharges, and then they would be forced to retreat still further. They were fighting splendidly and putting up a dogged resistance, yielding ground only foot by foot. But to the experienced eyes of the boys... There was no mistaking the signs. The enemy had broken through the first line of positions. "'Well, it's nothing more than we knew would happen,' remarked Frank, as his frame tingled with the excitement of the coming fight, which he knew would soon be upon him. "'That's so,' agreed Bart. 
But what gets me is that the line was broken so quickly. I thought it would be afternoon at least before the Huns got as far as this. The lines opened up to let the newcomers through so that they could go to the rear and reform. How about it? Frank asked of a machine gunner whom he knew, as the man limped by him, supported by a comrade. Didn't expect to see you fellers so soon. It was the mist, was the reply. The Huns got within thirty yards before we tumbled to it. We did the best we could, but they just swamped our position before we could get our crossfire going. Even at that we mowed them down in heaps with our rifle fire, but they kept on coming. For every dead man there were twenty live ones to take his place. We put up a stiff fight, but there were too many of them. It seemed like millions. They're coming now like a house of fire, and you boys want to brace. We're braced already, muttered Billy through his clenched teeth as he gripped his rifle until it seemed as though his fingers must leave their imprint on the stock. There was a short period of waiting, more trying by far than any actual fighting. Then the storm broke. In front of them, rank after rank of gray-clad troops came in sight, stretching back as far as the eye could see. The mist had wholly vanished now, and the boys could see their enemy. It seemed as though the machine-gunner had not exaggerated when he said that there were millions. They were like the waves of the sea. But the stout hearts of the American boys never quailed. Time and again they had met these men, or their fellows, and driven them back at the point of the bayonet. They had outfought and outgamed them. They had sent them flying before them. They had seen their backs. The blood of heroes and of patriots ran in the veins of the defenders. Their ancestors had fought at Bunker Hill, at Palo Alto, at Gettysburg. Above them floated the stars and stripes, an unstained flag, a glorious flag, a flag that had never been smirched by defeat. Their eyes blazed and their muscles stiffened. Then, like an avalanche, the enemy struck. End of chapter 14 of Army Boys on the Firing Line The Storm of War by Homer Randall Birds as Messengers From Birds and the War by Hugh H. Gladstone This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Birds as Messengers In the Pigeon Post we have the most obvious example of service rendered to man by birds during the war. The homing pigeon, whose speed of flight has been estimated at from 880 to 2,000 yards per minute, according to weather conditions, has naturally played an important part. The first use of pigeons as message carriers is wrapped in the mystery of antiquity. Solomon is alleged to have transmitted orders throughout his kingdom by means of homing pigeons. The ancient Greeks, Egyptians, and Romans employed these birds in their armies, and the victory at the siege of Modena, 43 B.C., has been attributed to pigeons. After the conquest of Gaul, relays of pigeons carried the news to Rome, as in later days the news of the victory at Waterloo was brought to England by pigeons, some days in advance of the official courier. Country Life, January 4, 1919 in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 they were extensively used, and in the South African War of 1899-1902 to they were also employed. Owing to the advent of wireless telegraphy, it was decided by the Admiralty in 1918 that the naval pigeon service was obsolete, and the government pigeons were therefore disposed of. Referee December 22, 1918. At the beginning of the war, the British authorities took a characteristic course in dealing with these birds. They ordered the internment or destruction of all pigeons along the coast. Thousands of lives of men depended upon the reversal of that edict, 
and upon the use instead of slaughter of the birds the minesweepers were the first to realize the existence of a means of communication possible where all others failed and an emergency pigeon service was established through private owners by means of which minesweepers were enabled to send information to shore of large minefields newly laid and other dangers of the sea bird notes and news volume eight page twenty five gradually it was recognized that pigeons would prove of great military importance steps were taken to set up an effective carrier service pigeon fanciers came forward with the utmost patriotism to present their birds and a little later severe penalties were enforced under d o r a for shooting carrier pigeons it was even held that it was the duty of the public in their own interest to feed water and care for any stray homers which might come into their possession daily express july eighteenth nineteen eighteen in spite of these precautions several fell victims during the shoots organized in this country to thin the immigrant hordes of wood pigeons our military pigeon service under captain a h osman grew to large proportions and though it was not till march nineteen sixteen that the first british pigeons were sent over to the western front our birds soon became as useful to us as those employed by our allies in france and belgium in which latter country the training and rearing of pigeons has long ranked as a national sport in the earlier days old omnibuses were used as travelling lofts but later on up-to-date motor lofts were extensively employed the pigeons were taken by bicyclists in wicker crates to the front-line trenches where they proved of the greatest use particularly when the telegraph and telephone wires had been cut by shell fire and when it became impossible for the intrepid runners to bring back messages on foot pigeon post messages when written and folded are carried in a cup placed in a small cylindrical carrier of aluminum clipped to the bird's leg the pigeon on returning to one of the latest type of lofts hearing its mate calling inside finds its way to a ledge under the window fitted with hinged wires that only open inwards pushing through these the bird's weight presses on the lightly balanced interior platform completing an electric circuit and so ringing a bell which warns the attendant in his dugout of the arrival of a messenger some of the longest distances flown in the war were three hundred miles and one female pigeon flew a hundred and sixty six sea miles three weeks in succession with dispatches from the north sea usually the birds fly these long distances about once a week but they require rest after them it has been calculated that as many as one hundred thousand pigeons were employed by the british forces during the war and their demobilization was announced in january nineteen nineteen daily news january twenty second nineteen nineteen in november nineteen fourteen the german invaders of france issued orders by which it was expressly forbidden to keep live pigeons of any breed and a penalty of fifty francs for each bird was imposed the wretched inhabitants reluctantly killed all the birds they could but many escaped and were driven to the fields here they were shot at by any passing german soldier and if they alighted on some peasant's roof they were driven off with volleys of stones for fear of incurring the penalty of the fine pigeons had a hard time of it it has been estimated that a million belgian pigeons were stolen by the germans during their occupation just before the armistice some twenty-five thousand were taken of which only five thousand were found at spandau little hope is entertained of recovering the remainder of the missing birds which are believed to have been killed and eaten by hungry german soldiers daily express january twenty fifth nineteen nineteen although on the continent spies were arrested for making use of this medium to convey messages no such cases appear to have been reported in this country in this connection it is amusing to note that the recovery of birds ringed for the investigation of migration was often regarded as suspicious a black-headed gull 
ringed m viborg denmark which was shot in suffolk in december nineteen sixteen was forwarded to the military authorities who passed the ring to the admiralty with the following comment this looks as if addressee had been trying to train a gull as a carrier to england this has often been tried but is generally considered unreliable homing pigeons were extensively used by our fleet and it is recorded that skipper thomas crisp v c who died at the wheel under fire from a german submarine lived long enough to dispatch a message by pigeon through the timely arrival of the bird his son and crew were saved an r a f seaplane patrolling over the north sea made a forced descent and was in danger of being dashed to pieces by the heavy sea the airmen released a pigeon with a message asking for immediate help and in twenty-two minutes the bird reached its loft twenty-two miles distant help was at once sent and the airmen were found clinging to the wreckage of the machine which was rapidly breaking up daily mail september thirtieth nineteen eighteen a touching story is told by a canadian flight commander r lecky d s o in a letter home published in an american newspaper after an engagement with hostile aircraft over the North Sea, he came down, his seaplane riddled with shrapnel, over fifty miles from land, and then had to act as rescuer and host to the crew of an aeroplane wrecked by engine failure. Six men were thus adrift in a doomed machine, with no food and little water. The commander had four pigeons. One was released at once, a second on the next day, a third on the third day all failed to reach home perishing over the waste of waters the fourth set free in a fog hungry and thirsty struggled over the fifty miles of sea without a landmark and without a rest the bird could not reach his loft but fluttered down in a coast guard station and there fell dead from exhaustion but his message was delivered and six men were saved bird notes and news volume eight page twenty six a pigeon sent on a seaplane carrying out duties in the North Sea brought back the message, attacked. The observer had not time to write more, and the bird itself, shot through the left eye by a bullet during the encounter which resulted in the loss of the seaplane, only just managed to struggle to its loft. It was promptly pensioned off war service and became the pet of the aerodrome. Daily Chronicle, September eleventh, 1918 pigeons once wounded while serving their country were not allowed again on duty they were fed on the best and became perfectly tame answering to such names as haig kitchener and amiens daily mirror september twentieth nineteen eighteen homers were taken up in airplanes and tossed with messages from behind the german lines advantage was also taken of the fact that behind the german lines there were large towns or thickly populated areas occupied by a friendly people many of whom moreover knew all about homing pigeons as the north of france and belgium like yorkshire and lancashire were centres of the fancy by a combination of close meteorological study and ingenious mechanical devices it became possible to drop baskets containing our pigeons on occupied areas where the chances were that they would fall into friendly hands these hands knew where to take them and in due course a large percentage arrived at our lofts bearing valuable information times december thirtieth nineteen eighteen pigeons were also made use of for counter-espionage the germans made a splendidly finished message carrier with a red seal at the top from time to time our troops captured german pigeons in the trenches but could not use them to send messages as they had no similar holders a medal maker of birmingham however imitated the well-made german holder so perfectly that it was impossible to tell those he made from the captured original thereafter a number of dud messages were sent to german lofts with their own birds daily mail april ninth nineteen nineteen in italy on at least one occasion a pigeon post message brought the news that an austrian convoy was moving in front of the british lines 
an aeroplane was at once dispatched and completely disorganized the convoy. Daily Mail, June 26, 1918 A company of French troops, cut off from their fellows by a curtain of fire at Verdun, owed their deliverance to a homing pigeon. New York, American, April 28, 1918 one of the most important factors in the defense in the eastern Champagne, on July 15, 1918, was the smooth working of the information service under the German bombardment. Each pillbox fort in the covering zone was supplied with a crate of carrier pigeons, and the birds brought back news of every movement of the enemy and every phase of the fight to the command posts. One officer commander, with experience of intelligence work, interrogated german prisoners who were brought into his pillbox as they arrived and dispatched the information derived from the bewildered germans by colombo gram almost as quickly as it could have been sent by telegram in another case the garrison of a pillbox sent back by pigeon a request that artillery should immediately open on the ground around their stronghold taking no thought for their own safety as the germans were about to surround them morning post july nineteenth nineteen eighteen the officer who commanded the first tank corps battalion stated that pigeons had frequently saved the situation for him neither a gas cloud nor a heavy barrage of artillery fire deterred these messengers from bringing their dispatches the battle of monchi is alleged to have been won through a flying message to the troops at the base a counter-attack at arras was smashed by the same means bird notes and news volume eight page twenty five although the homing pigeons on the western front were of the greatest use as many as a thousand birds being sometimes employed in a single engagement their value was not always properly estimated there is a story that when pressed hard to find a dinner for his master a faithful batman served up what he simply described as a brace of birds they proved excellent eating, but a subsequent inquiry from headquarters as to the loss of two valuable homing pigeons led to investigations. The Batman eventually revealed the origin of the dainty dish to his master, and after being warned that if found out it would certainly mean a court-martial, was asked if he had left any evidence such as the basket, to which he replied, "'Couldn't cook em without making a fire, sir.' Daily Mail February 3, 1919. The men to whom the carrier pigeons were consigned occasionally became bored by their precious charges. One day a practice pigeon message was received from a somewhat fed-up Australian battalion, rather weary of sending practice pigeon messages during many weeks. The latest message, when decoded, read thus, In view of the shortage of paper, what about crossing these birds with cockatoos and teaching them to deliver verbal messages? Globe, May 31, 1918 On another occasion, during an engagement on a big scale, a certain headquarters staff was very anxiously awaiting news. For a long while none came. Then a pigeon flew into sight, circled several times, and alighted on a roof. A man was sent to catch it he brought down the packet containing the message. The staff gathered round the officer who took the message. They listened with intense eagerness to learn the news. What the officer read out was, I am fed up with this blasted bird. Daily Mail, March 14, 1918 This story, when brought to the attention of the War Office, provoked an encomium of our pigeon service, which, it was said by the officer in charge, had proved invaluable, the birds frequently homing through gas clouds and barrage after all other means of communication had failed. All the birds were presented to the service from the finest strains of long-distance pedigree stock, and the majority of men in charge of them were lifelong fanciers devoted to the work. In one of the greatest battles where pigeons were largely used, one hundred per cent of the messages were delivered under the most difficult circumstances and it was stated authoritatively that thousands of lives had been saved by pigeons homing from seaplanes or minesweepers in distress 
Daily Mail, March 22, 1918. Admiralty records showed that 95% of the several thousand pigeons employed in the Naval Pigeon Service came through with their messages. Daily Mail and Daily Chronicle, May 7, 1918. The pigeons of the Royal Air Force, up till the end of 1918, had brought no fewer than 717 messages of distress from aircraft down on the surface of the water. In carrying these messages, the birds covered an aggregate of 20,000 miles. Referee, December 22, 1918. The Germans erected special gas-proof coats for their pigeons, and went so far as to camouflage their birds by giving them a coat of paint. A message taken from one of these German pigeons pays our troops a backhanded compliment. Field Battery No. 36. Our telephone is out of order. Send us at once reinforcements. These accursed Englishmen keep us busy. Miller, First Lieutenant. Daily Mail, April 5, 1916. By observation plus instinct, most of our birds rapidly learned their route from the trenches. Though shy at first, the pigeons got wise to shell fire, and old birds made away from the dugouts with knowing swiftness. Pigeons proved hardy and recovered from exposure to gas. They were rarely shot dead while flying, and birds with shrapnel in the breast or with broken beaks gamely tried to carry their missives home. In the action which was fought in the region of the Menin Road on October 3, 1917, a pigeon, number 2,709, was dispatched with a message from the front line to divisional headquarters at 1.30 p.m. During its passage, it was struck by a German bullet, which broke one of its legs, denuding the bone, the tibia, of all flesh, and drove the metal cylinder containing the message into the side of its body, the bullet passing out of its back. In spite of its wounds, and although out in the wet all night, the bird struggled home to its loft, a distance of nine miles, and delivered its message at 10.53 a.m. the following day, October 4th, dying shortly after its arrival. The Field, February 2, 1918. The bird has now been added to the museum of the Royal United Service Institution, Whitehall, where it may be seen stuffed in a glass case, labeled, Died of Wounds Received in Action. Daily Mail, July 25, 1918. Had the feat of this pigeon been performed by a human being, it might well have been rewarded by the Victoria Cross. It is impossible to estimate the value of the carrier service to the naval, military, and air forces. Not only were our pigeons extensively employed on the Western Front, but also at Salonica, in Italy, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and elsewhere, and on innumerable occasions they carried life-and-death messages with superhuman pluck and perseverance. Doubtless our enemies would speak as highly of the services of their homers. A German pigeon loft with thirty-five pigeons, captured by the Canadians at Foley near Arras on August 9, 1918, was presented to the Zoological Society of London in October, the two Germans in charge of the loft attempted on the near approach of the Canadians to burn it, but our men quickly dispatched the Germans and extinguished the flames. The marks of the fire, however, remain, and several bullet holes may be seen penetrating the outside frame of the loft. Times, November 2, 1918. In March 1918, when everyone was invited to invest their money in war bonds, an additional attraction was afforded by the Pigeon Post Service, which carried messages from the investor's home to the tank bank in Trafalgar Square, notifying the amount of the investment. Queen Alexandra's pigeon attracted a crowd of people to the mobile loft when the bird arrived within a minute from Marlborough House with the announcement that Her Majesty wished to purchase 500 war savings certificates on behalf of the Queen Alexandra League. Globe, March 4, 1918. In America, the Homer was likened to the dove sent out from the Ark of Noah, which brought wanted news then. So do the carrier pigeons of the war zone bring their messages now. 
New York American, April 28, 1918. A recruiting message from Lady Reading was carried in May 1918 from Washington by three carrier pigeons to New York, where it was read at a mass meeting under the auspices of the British and Canadian Recruiting Committee. The Times, May 30, 1918. In the pageant of the Lord Mayor's Show of 1918, a travelling pigeon loft took part in the procession to remind the public of the splendid achievements performed by members of the Carrier Pigeon Service, which has been not inaptly dubbed the First Flying Corps. Bird Notes and News, Volume 8, page 25. Before April 1919, the demobilization of the pigeons and their attendants in France had taken place, with the exception of birds and men selected for the Army of Occupation. Some 9,000 to 10,000 birds that had served their country well had to be disposed of. They would have been a drug on the English market if they had been sent home, and the cost of the transaction would probably have been more than the birds would have realized. They were therefore sold at Courtrai, Lille, and other places in France and Belgium, and the proceeds of the sale divided among charitable institutions, in accordance with the wish of the breeders who gave the birds to the country for the war. Daily Mail, April 9, 1919 The homing pigeon has been ridiculously libelled during the war, for no spy melodrama or novelette has been complete without one or more of these attractive birds, which are invariably represented as working for the Germans. Ever since the original war story of the market woman of Armentier, or Arras, or Reims, it is told by voracious eye-witnesses of all these towns and many more, whose figure attracted the attention of the alert soldiery, and whose bust flew away when they arrested her, the homing pigeon has labored under a load of suspicion. Daily Express, May 15, 1918. As a matter of fact, it may safely be said that His Majesty had no more devoted, though unwitting, servant than the homing pigeons of his army and navy. It is of interest to note that parrots were employed early in the war at the Eiffel Tower to announce the approach of hostile aircraft, it was found at first that the birds gave warning fully twenty minutes before an aeroplane or airship could be identified by the eye or heard by the human ear. The birds, however, which could never be trained to discriminate between a French and a German aeroplane, appear to have grown indifferent or bored, so that they ceased to be trustworthy. Daily Mail, February 1, 1918 it is well known that canaries, being about fifteen times more sensitive than a man to poisonous gases, are used in mines and in mining disasters to test atmospheric conditions and save miners or explorers from gas poisoning. The Government Mines Committee recommended that two or three birds should be kept at rescue stations for the testing for carbon monoxide. Our soldiers on the Western Front are said on one occasion to have been warned by the behavior of wild birds in the night of a coming attack of poisonous gas. Before the smell of the fumes could be perceived in the trenches, the soldiers were awakened to their danger by the noise of birds which had detected the first fumes of the vile infection. Bird Notes and News, Volume 6, page 102 Canaries and other cage birds were extensively used by both our own and the German miners at the front when tunneling to detect the presence of subterranean gas. Daily Mail, May 29, 1918. A soldier writing of his company's canary says, Many were the nights on which he was rudely disturbed from his slumbers, dumped unceremoniously into a sandbag, and carried through rain and snow up to the trenches, here he would do his job underground, and as often as not reach the surface again, a limp little form lying at the bottom of his cage. He never failed us, though. Bird Notes and News, Volume 8, page 26. In many cases the canaries, issued as tests for the presence of poisonous gas, were made pets of by our soldiers, and placed by them in the safest places, Daily Mail, April 10, 1919. 
hundreds of enemy canaries were killed by our shell and gas but those that were rescued by our troops were needless to say well cared for a demonstration of their utility was given to the members of the congress of southeastern scientific societies on june first nineteen eighteen when a bird in a cage was introduced into a chamber full of poison gas and became unconscious before a human being exposed to the same conditions showed any signs of being affected sunday herald june second nineteen eighteen this wartime use of canaries may have been one of the reasons which caused a canary boom in america where these birds are very popular although double the pre-war price would willingly have been paid the birds were unprocurable german-bred birds being out of the market and the majority of the norwich fanciers having joined the colors the demand proved far greater than the supply daily mail may eighth nineteen sixteen it is horrible to think of canaries being stifled by poison gas and the following verses to a canary in a trench may here be quoted bonjour merry bird your bonny life we ask that we may know when gases blow and spring to don our mask we would that we might mask you too so beautiful so fair you sing to-day your roundelay and love is everywhere bonsoir merry bird in war you've played your part nor knew that death was in the breath that stilled your little heart your perch swings idly in your cage unscathed we march along so may we learn if fortune turn to greet death with a song life november fourteenth nineteen eighteen page seven hundred it is consoling to learn that canaries were also used in ambulance trains to cheer our wounded soldiers with their sweet song sporting and dramatic news june eighth nineteen eighteen seagulls on more than one occasion betrayed the presence of submarines and floating mines to anxious mariners a french writer m louis rousseau claimed them as one of our most precious auxiliaries who had at all times indicated to our fishermen the presence of shoals of fish and who when our boats and their crews were mobilized and fished for mines and submarines imitated them and continued their service of intelligence bulletin de la sfpo june nineteen eighteen a pilot reported that while in the channel on january fifth nineteen eighteen he noticed some seagulls sitting upon a floating object upon closer investigation he saw it was a mine with five prongs on top of each prong was perched a seagull he just had time to alter the ship's course slightly and thus averted disaster observer january sixth nineteen eighteen a somewhat similar story is told by an officer on board a ship in the north sea while watching a puffin through my glasses i suddenly saw the periscope of a german submarine appear above the water close to the bird we altered our course just in time to evade by a few feet two torpedoes which were fired at us we tried to ram the submarine but unfortunately she dived too quickly ibis nineteen seventeen page thirty four the fact that seagulls were attracted by the periscope of an enemy submarine aroused the ingenuity of no less a savant than samuel pepys jr who suggested that it be ordered in the fleet that all seagulls around our ships be fed daily with herrings from an underwater boat so that whenever they shall observe any such boat they shall assuredly flock over it for herrings and so its presence be made known being that these birds can see to a great depth below the water and so keen of sight as to discern a sprat five fathoms below the surface truth february twenty fifth nineteen fifteen the suggestion made by punch that parrots should be used for propaganda work both in this country and in germany the propagandists abroad to be crossed with british homing pigeons punch march twenty seventh nineteen eighteen only aimed at the humorous 
a scheme was however sent in all seriousness to the war inventions board by a man who had noticed that birds peck mortar he suggested that a flock of cormorants should be trained to feed by putting their food in lines against a wall so that they might associate these lines with their food they should then be taken to essen where they would attack the chimneys at krupp's works with such vigor as to destroy them daily mail january thirteenth nineteen sixteen end of birds as messengers from birds and the war by hugh h gladstone read by maria casper The Story of the Great War, Volume 8, edited by Francis J. Reynolds, Alan L. Churchill, and Francis T. Miller. Chapter 15 of Part 4, The Great War's End. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox dot org chapter fifteen austria hungary and germany surrender the war thus comes to an end the sustained success of the allied armies in france and belgium in august and september of nineteen eighteen strengthened the determination of the allies not to relax any efforts to prosecute the war to a victorious conclusion the central powers were no less impressed with the trend of events and throughout september and october repeated efforts were made by austria hungary and by germany to induce president wilson to take the first steps toward an armistice and peace the president made it clear that the united states would urge no course upon the allies that might in any way sacrifice the military advantage their armies had gained it became more and more evident that the terms of armistice and peace would be dictated by the allies that germany was quite as anxious to bring about a speedy armistice as austria-hungary was expressed in a note which the washington government received on october thirty nineteen eighteen and which the state department declined to make public because it was evident that the document had been prepared mainly for propaganda purposes the note described the various steps that had been taken to democratize the german government with the view to impressing the united states that they had complied with president wilson's stand not to discuss an armistice with a nation that was still dominated by an autocracy the note endeavored to prove that the german people were now in complete control of the government but it failed to impress the administration since it did not show any change in the situation created by other german proposals to suspend hostilities the evident purpose of the appeal was to influence sentiment in foreign countries and gain sympathy in the united states it was well understood at washington and in the capitals of the allies that the central powers realized that they faced complete disaster and that their only hope of saving anything from the wreck was to bring about a speedy cessation of hostilities on october thirty one nineteen eighteen the representatives of the entente powers assembled at versailles to consider the terms of the armistice after an informal meeting at the home of colonel e m house president wilson's personal representative on this date turkey capitulated the united states had no part in arranging the turkish armistice which was chiefly the work of the british and french representatives the principal terms of the armistice granted by the allies to turkey were the opening of the dardanelles and the bosporus and access to the black sea and occupation of all forts along these waters by the allies all allied prisoners of war 
and Armenian interned persons and prisoners to be collected in Constantinople and handed over unconditionally to the Allies. Immediate demobilization of the Turkish army except such as were required to guard frontiers and maintain internal order. The surrender of all war vessels in Turkish waters or waters occupied by Turkey. Free use by Allied ships of all ports and anchorages now in Turkish occupation and denial of their use by the enemy. Wireless, cable, and telegraph stations to be controlled by the Allies. The surrender of all garrisons in Hejaz, Yemen, Mesopotamia, etc. All Germans and Austrians, naval, military, or civilians, to be evacuated within one month from Turkish dominions. The capitulation of Turkey, though anticipated for some days by the Entente and the United States, was important inasmuch as it was expected to hasten the collapse of the central powers. Austria, aflame with anarchy and with revolutionary mobs parading the capital, had no choice but to submit to the Allies' terms. In Washington, the complete collapse and unconditional surrender of Germany was hourly expected. All interest was now centered in the Supreme War Council in session at Versailles, where the terms to be offered to the Central Powers were under discussion. There were present during the deliberations General Tasker H. Bliss, representing the United States, Premier Clemenceau, Marshal Foch, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, Colonel E. M. House, President Wilson's personal representative, and David Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister. It was decided that the terms to be submitted to Germany should be confined strictly to military requirements conditioned generally upon President Wilson's principles. During the discussion of Austrian questions, Serbian and Greek representatives were present because of their special interest in Austrian affairs. At Washington, President Wilson kept in touch with the United States representatives at the Versailles Council. Colonel House advised the President of the progress of the deliberations, and there were frequent exchanges of communications. It was known in Washington that the political and economic conditions in the Central Powers had reached such a pass that Austria could not, and Germany would not, refuse to sign any terms which the Entente was prepared to offer. The complete destruction of the Austrian armies by the Italians, which resulted in the capture of over 300,000 prisoners and 5,000 guns, left the dual monarchy no alternative but complete surrender. On November 3, 1918, an armistice with Austria was signed by General Diaz, the Italian commander-in-chief which went into operation at three o'clock in the afternoon of the following day. The principal terms in the armistice may be briefly outlined. Demobilization of the Austro-Hungarian army and withdrawal of all forces operating on the front from the North Sea to Switzerland. Half the divisional corps and army artillery and equipment to be collected at points indicated by the Allies and the United States for delivery to them. Evacuation of all territories invaded by Austria-Hungary since the beginning of the war. The Allies to have the right of free movement over all roads, railroads, and waterways in Austro-Hungarian territory the armies of the Allies to occupy such strategic points as they deemed necessary to conduct military operations or to maintain order. Complete evacuation of all German troops within 15 days from Italian and Balkan fronts and all 
Austro-Hungarian territory. Evacuated territories to be governed by local authorities under control of the Allied armies of occupation. Immediate reparation, without reciprocity, of all Allied prisoners of war and civil populations evacuated from their homes. The naval conditions included surrender to the Allies and the United States of 15 submarines and all German submarines in Austrian waters, three battleships, three light cruisers, nine destroyers, six Danube monitors, etc. Freedom of navigation for the Allies in the Adriatic and all waterways, with occupation of forts and defenses on the Danube. The existing blockade conditions to remain unchanged and all naval aircraft to be concentrated and impractionized in Austro-Hungarian bases to be designated by the Allies and the United States of America. The drastic character of the armistice terms were calculated to please even the bitter enders in America and Europe. President Wilson's diplomacy was now triumphantly vindicated, and those members of Congress who had found fault with his note-writing were ready to concede that to him belonged a great deal of the credit of bringing about a situation that must lead to the ending of the war on the Allies' own terms. On November 6, 1918, the German government sent a wireless message to Marshal Foch asking him to receive German plenipotentiaries who would arrive at the French outposts on the following day, November 7, to arrange for the armistice. The mission was headed by Matthias Erzberger, Secretary of State, and included General von Winterfeld, Count Alfred von Oberndorf, General von Grunel, and Naval Captain von Salo. As previously noted in the last chapter devoted to military operations, the armistice was signed by the German representatives, and all hostilities ceased on November 11, 1918, at 11 a.m. On the same date, President Wilson announced the terms of the armistice in his address to Congress. Briefly summarized, Germany agreed to the immediate evacuation of all invaded countries, including Alsace-Lorraine, and yielded over to Allied occupation the countries on the left bank of the Rhine including control of the crossings of that river at Mayence, Koblenz, and Cologne, bridgeheads of 30-kilometer radius on the eastern bank, and the establishment of a neutral zone from 30 to 40 kilometers in breadth and running from the frontier of Holland to the Swiss frontier. Germany surrendered about half her navy, including 160 submarines, which passed at once under control of the Allies to be disarmed and interned in Allied or neutral ports. All other German warships were to be disarmed and concentrated in German naval bases and held under the control of the Allies in the United States. All the railways of Belgium, Luxembourg, and of Alsace-Lorraine, with their equipment, were to be given up. In the east, Germany abandoned the treaties of Bucharest and Brest-Litovsk. All German troops in Russia, Romania, or Turkey were to be withdrawn, and the agents of German propaganda recalled. The Baltic was open to the warships of the Allies, and provision was made that through Danzig, or the Vistula, supplies might be sent to the starving peoples of Poland and Russia. The Black Sea ports were also to be evacuated by Germany, and she must give up the Russian fleet. While the blockade was to be maintained as respected Germany, all German restriction upon trade of neutrals was removed. Germany must give up all prisoners she had taken, all the ships she had seized, but this was not reciprocal. German prisoners of war and German ships remained in the custody of the Allies. While President Wilson was reading to the assembled Congress the drastic terms which Germany had been forced to accept in order to obtain peace 
there was a tense silence on the part of the great audience. It was only when they realized, as paragraph after paragraph was read, how complete the victory of the Allies was, that faint hand-clapping was heard, then cheers, and presently everyone in the gallery and on the floor was on his feet, cheering madly. After reading the terms of the armistice, President Wilson continued, The war thus comes to an end. For having accepted these terms of armistice, it will be impossible for the German command to renew it. End of the Story of the Great War, Volume 8 Edited by Francis J. Reynolds, Alan L. Churchill, and Francis T. Miller Chapter 15 of Part 4 The Great War's End Statement to the Court Upon Being Convicted of Violating the Sedition Act By Eugene V. Debs this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. September 18, 1918 Your Honor, years ago I recognized my kinship with all living beings, and I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I said then, and I say now that while there is a lower class, I am in it, and while there is a criminal element, I am of it, and while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. I listened to all that was said in this court in support and justification of this prosecution, but my mind remains unchanged. I look upon the Espionage Act as a despotic enactment and flagrant conflict with democratic principles and with the spirit of free institutions. Your Honor, I have stated in this court that I am opposed to the social system in which we live, that I believe in a fundamental change, but if possible, by peaceable and orderly means. Standing here this morning, I recall my boyhood. At fourteen, I went to work in a railroad shop. At sixteen I was firing a freight engine on a railroad. I remember all the hardships and privations of that earlier day, and from that time until now my heart has been with the working class. I could have been in Congress long ago. I have preferred to go to prison. I am thinking this morning of the men in the mills and the factories, of the men in the mines and on the railroads. I am thinking of the women who, for a paltry wage, are compelled to work out their barren lives, of the little children who in this system are robbed of their childhood and in their tender years are seized in the remorseless grasp of mammon and forced into the industrial dungeons, there to feed the monster machines while they themselves are being starved and stunted, body and soul. I see them dwarfed and diseased and their little lives broken and blasted because in this high noon of Christian civilization money is still so much more important than the flesh and blood of childhood. In very truth gold is God today and rules with pitiless sway in the affairs of men. In this country the most favored beneath the bending skies, we have vast areas of the richest and most fertile soil, material resources in inexhaustible abundance, the most marvelous productive machinery on earth, and millions of eager workers ready to apply their labor to that machinery to produce an abundance for every man, woman, and child. And if there are still vast numbers of our people who are the victims of poverty, and whose lives are an unceasing struggle all the way from youth to old age, until at last death comes to their rescue and lulls these hapless victims to dreamless sleep, it is not the fault of the Almighty. It cannot be charged to nature. But it is due entirely to the outgrown social system in which we live that ought to be abolished, not only in the interest of the toiling masses, but in the higher interest of all humanity. 
I believe, Your Honor, in common with all socialists, that this nation ought to own and control its own industries. I believe, as all socialists do, that all things that are jointly needed and used ought to be jointly owned, that industry, the basis of our social life, instead of being the private property of a few and operated for their enrichment, ought to be the common property of all, democratically administered in the interest of all. I am opposing a social order in which it is possible for one man who does absolutely nothing that is useful to amass a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars, while millions of men and women who work all the days of their lives secure barely enough for a wretched existence. This order of things cannot always endure. I have registered my protest against it. I recognize the feebleness of my effort, but fortunately I am not alone. There are multiplied thousands of others who, like myself, have come to realize that before we may truly enjoy the blessings of civilized life, we must reorganize society upon a mutual and cooperative basis, and to this end we have organized a great economic and political movement that spreads over the face of all the earth. There are today upwards of sixty millions of socialists, loyal, devoted adherents to this cause, regardless of nationality, race, creed, color, or sex. They are all making common cause. They are spreading with tireless energy the propaganda of the new social order. They are waiting, watching, and working, hopefully, through all the hours of the day and the night. They are still in a minority, but they have learned how to be patient and to bide their time. They feel, they know indeed, that the time is coming, in spite of all opposition, all persecution, when this emancipating gospel will spread among all the peoples, and when this minority will become the triumphant majority, and sweeping into power, inaugurate the greatest social and economic change in history. In that day we shall have the universal commonwealth the harmonious cooperation of every nation with every other nation on earth. Your Honor, I ask no mercy, and I plead for no immunity. I realize that finally the right must prevail. I never so clearly comprehended as now the great struggle between the powers of greed and exploitation on the one hand, and upon the other the rising hosts of industrial freedom and social justice. I can see the dawn of the better day for humanity. The people are awakening. In due time, they will and must come to their own. When the mariner, sailing over tropic seas, looks for relief from his weary watch, he turns his eyes toward the Southern Cross, burning luridly above the tempest-vexed ocean. As the midnight approaches, the Southern Cross begins to bend, the whirling worlds change their places, and with starry finger points the Almighty marks the passage of time upon the dial of the universe. And though no bell may beat the glad tidings, the lookout knows that the midnight is passing, and the relief and rest are close at hand. Let the people everywhere take heart of hope, for the cross is bending, the midnight is passing, and joy cometh with the morning. End of statement to the court upon being convicted of violating the Sedition Act by Eugene V. Debs Read by Winston Tharp Selections from The Worn Doorstep by Margaret Pollock Sherwood Read by Mary in Arkansas this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. November 1st. War. Unceasing war in the trenches, with rumors of a British naval defeat in South American waters, and little encouraging news save that the Germans have failed to reach Dunkirk and Calais. England's best are dying. Your kind, England's noblest sons rushing to the danger places, foolishly, grandly brave. 
one can feel throughout the country a great purpose shaping itself to the needs of the moment, as it does slowly but surely in this land. That is the secret of this people. They can rise to a challenge, meet any crisis whatever when it comes, and though I know that unpreparedness has cost them much, they are greater and better than if they had devoted their best energy for five and twenty years to getting ready for war. Enthusiasm kindles under the challenge of disaster. The finest have already answered the call. The less fine make the great refusal. You go, but Peter stays, and Peter's kind all over England stays. November 5th. Peter does not stay. Peter is going to the war. For several days he has been very critical of civilization, very severe upon his country and her rulers. At times he seemed to think himself the only real pillar of church and state. Some struggle was going on within him. I have learned enough of him to know that if he expresses a feeling, it is one he does not have. For him, as for me, the horror of the present moment has been intensified by coming into contact with those who have actually suffered. All that I could understand of Henri Dupre's account I have translated into English for Peter's benefit, and the sight of the bullet-riddled hat has plunged him in deep thought. He saw your picture, the picture of you and Khaki. Madge, unpermitted, had taken it into the kitchen to polish the frame of oak. Peter looked at it uneasily. A friend of yours, miss? Yes, Peter. At the front, ma'am? At the front, Peter, I answered. I could not have said anything else, and even if I live to be a hundred, I shall not think of you any other way except as at the front, fighting if need be, carrying messages across the danger zone with no thought of danger. It was a great advance in Peter to admit the existence of a front. He has persisted in declaring the war a bit of sensational romance devised by the House of Lords for their own entertainment. It was a brooding Peter who busied himself with rubbing up the knives. He has been unusually attentive to Madge since her escapade. His mind seemed to be running on troubles greater than his own. "'Do you know where our army is supposed to be now, Mum? he asked when I told him we had no good news from the seat of war. "'Our army. We were getting on. I gave him my best information about our hard-pressed line in the West.' It's astonishing that those Germans are able to fight at all, ma'am, when they have once met the British, said Peter gloomily, polishing a huge carving knife as if it were a sword. Meeting the French, that is different. They are a flighty people, and very excitable. Your knowledge of history needs to be brought up to date, Peter, I ventured. Anything less flighty than that magnificent people of France at this present moment the world has never seen. It must be very difficult, ma'am, fighting on the continent for one who does not speak the foreign tongues. And I couldn't eat frogs, ma'am. I'd almost rather ab the Germans as allies. Sausages aren't as bad as frogs by half. Later I heard him muttering to himself. If the House of Lords is really in trouble, said Peter, finding the great fight with self, if the House of Lords really needs me, of course the throne is more or less a figurehead, but I shouldn't like to see it fall just now, especially if the enemy is coming. I should like to impress them as much as possible. It was when he was sweeping the walk that I heard him say, and I should like to see Bob's once more. But one day determined Peter's future destiny and his rank as a man and a Briton. Peter had gone to the coast with Puck and the cart, spending the night at his sister's on the way, he had some business at Yarmouth, he said. I devised some errands for him and encouraged his going. I thought that it would perhaps prove to be his farewell to his sister before going to war. Those were strange days, the days of Peter's absence, tense, full of nameless anxiety. That early morning feeling of suspense, of expectancy, lasted into the afternoon, and one early morning had brought us the unmistakable sound of guns from the sea. Peter came rattling home in the late afternoon, a pale, distraught Peter, who seemed to have lost several pounds. 
he came into the garden where I was tying up rose bushes for the winter. At first he seemed unable to speak, but at last gasped out, Those Germans! And the gasp ended in a little sob. As I watched him, I found myself sharing his trembling indignation. German ships, ma'am, men of war, standing off our coast, bombarding. It has never been attacked before. I saw them with my own eyes. I heard them with my own ears. The firing, then, had had the significance that we dreaded. It began at about seven o'clock in the morning on November 3rd, terrifying the peaceful folk of the seacoast town, shell after shell, report after report, for nearly an hour. Peter, who was getting an early start for home, had taken Puck and the cart to a house on the outskirts of the town, where he was getting a bag of very superior fertilizer. Then came the great noise and the splashing. Little, if any, actual damage was done to buildings or to people. Yet Peter contended that Puck was actually struck on the shoulder by some fragment of splintering wood or flying stone dislodged by a shell. Those shells may have missed their intended mark, but they went home to the heart of the time-expired man, Peter Snell. He knew at last that there was a war, and I knew, what he himself had not yet realized, that he was going to it. Peter lacks descriptive powers. I got from him little idea of the actual scene and all the fright and confusion. When he had found that there was nothing he could do to help, he had sped toward home, intent on carrying out his unavowed purpose. Asking how Puck, now standing with drooping head at the gate, had behaved at the crisis, I got the account that I expected, and as we petted this veteran of the war and dressed a small herd on his shoulder, I heard how he, the most antic pony in the British Isles, had held his ground, had jumped only moderately, had endured the crashing and the splashing, standing with his four legs braced in the sand, trembling all over, while Peter, dazed a bit at first, came to his senses. And I will say, ma'am, that he showed more ed than I had myself, for the reins were loose on his back. I haven't dropped them to put in the bag of fertilizer. He never offered to run, ma'am. Puck, the war veteran, took our praises modestly, making no claim to be recognized as a hero. He helps me understand the British temper, not to say the British constitution. No paper theories for him. The unwritten law of common sense, available when needed, is admirably embodied in him. That power of keeping your head while others lose theirs is what wins in the long run. And despite the discouragement of this present moment, I feel confident that the English will win in the end. The Germans' plan, theorize, show great forethought, but are lost without a program. Life does not go by plans and charts. No known precautions can foresee its emergencies. Unless some chemical or electric invention of the Teutons can remove the element of uncertainty from existence, surely victory will go to the people who can meet the unforeseen, pull themselves together and know, without forethought, what to do in an instant's danger. All these meditations passed through my head as Puck shook his mane, making light of his adventures, and trotted away down the street to his stable with an unmistakable air of England expects every pony to do his duty. The country thrills with indignation, surprise, and increasing resolution. The impossible has happened, and those inviolate shores have been desecrated by attack. Peter is away, Peter in khaki, with something already gone from his laggard step, with firmer and more self-respecting tread, recalling the old training which he was beginning to forget. Surely, because of his experience as a soldier, they will let him go soon to the front. The sympathy and admiration in the eyes of our fugitives have nerved him, as nothing else has done, for the great adventure. I heard Henri giving him some French lessons, strictly along the line of request for food and drink. The French will make up in swiftness of understanding what he lacks in pronunciation. His last days with Madge have been funny and tragic, too. Her first remark in hearing of the Yarmouth incident was along the old line of urging him to war. Some minds, she remarked firmly, 
need shot and shell to open em. But I could not help noticing that when he began to talk about going, she stopped talking about it. Her face has been tragically comic as she watched him in a Falstaff, he that died a Wednesday mood, packing his belongings. I heard the sound of loud sobbing in the kitchen as she made herself a cup of tea the afternoon he went away. Could it be Madge who was muttering questions as to why the king didn't go to war himself if he wanted war? June 15th. Peter. Can it be Peter? With that expression upon his face? He is really here, and a transfiguring look of suffering has worn away forever a something of earth and of stubbornness. A Peter who seems to have gained greatly in strength and in stature, although one arm is gone, and an empty sleeve hangs by his side. If I had known how to salute, I should have saluted Peter when I saw him home from the war. Mentally, I do it whenever I see him working with his one poor hand in my garden beds. One of the first things he said to me when he came home, that he was going to Shepperton to try to get work that a one-armed man could do, selling papers or something of the kind. But Peter, who has faced the enemy and the poisonous gases, flinched before my countenance when I heard this. Peter knows now that the little red house and the garden can never get on without him. It is odd to see the animals with him. Don cannot be attentive enough, but you would expect a dog to understand. Puck is a wonder, standing as meekly as a lamb to let himself be harnessed by a one-armed man, though he used to dance an ancient British war dance as the straps went on. The old racial love of fair fighting shines out in him. Man to man it used to be, or man to pony when both were able-bodied, but he will take no advantage of a handicap. He seldom shies now, even at a feather or a floating leaf, but he watches constantly in every direction, waiting for some great danger in which he can comport himself with perfect self-control for the sake of a one-armed man, defying the whole modern era to invent a mechanism that can frighten him. I should like an equestrian statue of Puck not shying at a zeppelin. Madge is pathetic. She has lost her old moorings of prejudice and conviction and sails in an unchartered sea of life. Church and state are to her only a shade less reprehensible than the Germans since Peter came home without an arm. While Peter, completely changed and loyal to the government, for the country he has served so well is his country indeed, sits with her on the bench by the kitchen door in the twilight, full of affectionate talk of Kitchener and Bob's. His grief over Lord Robert's death was both sincere and personal. Madge mutters fiercely against the House of Lords for its selfishness and its incompetence. If women ruled, all would be different. Her condemnation of the government would suggest that she is in a fair way to become both an anarchist and a suffragette. She never would have let Peter go a step to war if she had supposed that he would be wounded. Peter came home not with a Victoria cross, but with an iron cross. And I can never tell whether he is joking or in earnest when he explains his possession of it. When I asked him how he got it, he replied, I bestowed it upon myself, miss. It seems that he had taken it from a German with whom he had fought in a terrible bayonet charge. He was a man, he was, Peter says admiringly. If I got the better of the man who had earned it, it stands to reason that I'm a better man than him and fit to wear it. So Peter wears his iron cross, to the wonder and admiration of the farmers baiting their horses at the inn, the blacksmith's eleven children, and the inhabitants in general of our village. How much he tells those eager listeners of the horrors he has seen, I do not know. But sometimes from that bench by the kitchen door, I hear fragments of his tales of suffering that makes me sick and faint. Yet he is very reticent in regard to it, having evidently a feeling that he must protect others from knowing what he has known. As I make his acquaintance anew, I realize that his great loss is truly exceeding gain. 
there is more of his real self in his wakened mind and soul than he lost in his arm. But Peter, invalided home, returned not alone. It seemed to me as he came up the walk that he was over heavily weighed down by luggage, though he had a brother soldier to help him. If you please, mum, said Peter diffidently when our first greetings were over, I've taken the liberty of bringing someone home. Nothing could please me better, I said, holding out a welcoming hand to the tall soldier at his side. If you please, mum, said Peter, grinning, if heroes can be said to grin, she's inside. He opened the big old-fashioned basket he was carrying, made of oyster, a kind I remember seeing in my grandmother's attic many years ago, and there, oh, Pharaoh's daughter, how I understand you now, was a little child of perhaps ten months asleep. She had soft dark hair, hands a bit too thin for a baby, eyes that proved to be, when she wakened and opened them, big and brown, and a mouth that had learned, and not forgotten, like so many sorrowful mouths today, how to smile. "'Where did you find her?' Madge and I cried out in one breath. "'She was in the village where I was taken when I was wounded. You will excuse me, Mum, but I cannot say its name. I really cannot. A woman had taken charge of her for weeks. She had been found quite deserted by the roadside. I believe, Mum, earlier in the war, when people were trying to escape from the enemy.' The nurse used to bring her into the hospital just to let the soldiers see her. Peter was disappointed that I could not speak, but speak I could not. She's a French baby, Mum, he added. I took a great fancy to her, and when I came away, I told them. What did you tell them, Peter? I asked sternly. The little thing had grasped my finger and was trying to pull herself up. It was the first touch of any of my fugitives that seemed to come from my very own, and I knew that the French baby had come into my life to stay. Knowing your abbots, miss, I told them I thought I knew a good home for her. So they sent her on with a nurse who was coming back, reserved for me as it were. They kindly allowed me to bring her down from London myself, but I had difficulty in holding her, so I took out me clothes and put them in a paper, and she fitted very nicely in the basket. Peter still mistook my silence for hesitation. I thought if you didn't care to adopt her, I would, ma'am. But from what they told me about her clothing and all, and from the look of her, I fancied she's rather your class than mine, ma'am. I couldn't aspire to your class, Peter, I said. You belong to the heroes. We will all adopt her. You, Madge, and I, and Don, and Puck, and the Adam, and our English queens. Among us all, she will get a well-rounded training. End of Selection from The Worn Doorstep Masks and Faces from The Happy Hospital by Ward Muir This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An English war hospital, on the whole, furnishes forth fewer horrible sights than happy ones. But there is one perturbing experience, which, for the worker in such an institution, is inevitable. It is this. He finds that he must fraternize with fellow men at whom he cannot look without the grievous risk of betraying, by his expression, how awful is their appearance. Myself, I confess that this discovery came as a surprise. I had not known before how usual and necessary a thing it is in human intercourse to gaze straight at anybody to whom one is speaking, and to gaze with no embarrassment. Now I never felt any embarrassment in thus amicably confronting a patient, however deplorable his state, however humiliating his dependence on my services, until I came in contact with certain wounds of the face, and even these, when still at the stage of requiring to be dressed and bandaged, did not repel. When the wound was healed, however, and the patient was going about with his wrecked face uncovered, 
i was sometimes sensible of the embarrassment to which allusion has been made i feared when talking to him to meet his eye generally there is only one eye left i feared that inadvertently i might let the poor victim perceive what i perceived namely that he was hideous hideous is the only word for these smashed faces the socket with some twisted moist slit with a lash or two adhering feebly which is all that is traceable of the forfeited eye the skewed mouth which sometimes in spite of brilliant dentistry contrivances results from the loss of a segment of jaw and worse far the worst the incredibly brutalizing effects which are the consequence of wounds in the nose and which reach a climax of mournful grotesquerie when the nose is missing altogether to talk to a lad who six months ago was probably a wholesome and pleasing specimen of english youth and is now a gargoyle and a broken gargoyle at that the only decent features remaining being perhaps one eye one ear and a shock of boyish hair is something of an ordeal you know very well that he has examined himself in a mirror that one eye of his has contemplated the mangled mess which is his face all the more hopeless because healed he has seen himself without a nose skilled skin grafting has reconstructed a something which owns two small orifices that are his nostrils but the something is emphatically not a nose he is aware of just what he looks like therefore you feel intensely that he is aware that you are aware and that some unguarded glance of yours may cause him hurt this then is the patient at whom you are afraid to gaze unflinchingly not afraid for yourself but afraid for him such a patient must be the more disappointed when he is first allowed to use a mirror if he has undergone a sequence of laborious operations which have improved his features from what they were the signs of the improvement are far to seek that i fear must be his preliminary impression when he regards the upshot of wonderful skin grafting bone transplanting injection of wax and all the other marvels of the surgeon's acumen without this series of masterly cuttings and manipulations he would have died or perhaps would have lost the sight of his surviving eye or perhaps would have been able to breathe only through his mouth perhaps would have been prevented from masticating without surgery's aid his face might have been unspeakably worse than it is he has every reason to bless surgery and yet surgery at last has washed its hands of him and in his mirror he is greeted by a gargoyle suppose he is married or engaged to be married could any woman come near that gargoyle without repugnance his children why a child would run screaming from such a sight to be fled from by children that must be a heavy cross for some souls to bear well we have found a way of easing the burden here as in other matters the war has evoked a creative spirit to combat its destructiveness and mankind is the richer for a notion which in normal times would never probably have blossomed or borne fruit yet even in normal times facial disfigurements occur so that in future the victims of such an accident will profit by the work done on soldiers in this military hospital indeed already by special permission civilians have made pilgrimages to be treated here civilians who long before the war were disfigured and now thanks to the war can walk the world unabashed one of these a woman had for years worn a thick practically opaque veil a rodent ulcer had been removed from the middle of her face and the hiatus which it left was appalling now she has a nose cheeks and a mouth we may look at her photographs before and after they must be seen to be believed it suffices that the after owns the countenance of a woman a trifle expressionless but still a woman whereas the before but these are some things which quite literally and in every sense cannot be described let me take the reader into the masks for facial disfigurements department at the third london general hospital tommy atkins facetious here as elsewhere calls it the tin noses shop 
His joke is far from being a sneer, as you will learn if you find him being accommodated with a tin nose. For tin noses are not easily come by if they are to bear the remotest resemblance to actual ones. And the tin noses, which are not tin, by the way, supplied at this war hospital, resemble the real with a closeness that when you have examined the fraud is almost comical. And there are other delicate frauds as well as the tin nose, the tin cheek, for instance, and the tin eyebrow, and even the tin ear. Of these more anon. Comical or no, the so-called masks are not devoid of beauty, the beauty of a fine idea finely materialized. The idea, and also its materialization, are to the credit of one man, Francis Derwent Wood, A.R.A., -A, the sculptor, in May 1915 he enlisted as a private in the R.A.M.C., and, like his comrades, was promptly put to washing dishes and doing other ward-orderly chores. The present writer washed dishes with Derwent Wood, and to the best of his recollection Derwent Wood was quite an efficient washer of dishes. There are artists whose art can conceivably find no appropriate application in war, and who are therefore content to wash dishes, indeed proud to do any task however humble in the nation's great need others there are whose talents are wasted because the powers that be are blind or unimaginative private wood was an exception in both respects his art has shown itself war useful if a much needed word may be coined and his commanding officer has been wise enough to encourage it thereby rendering the community a service not always received from commanding officers similarly situated in regard to unusually gifted men in their employ. Private Wood's tentative suggestions, that is to say, were listened to, not pooh-poohed. He was promoted in due course from the errand-boy housemaid career of a ward orderly, and given a free hand to make a new type of splint, daintily wrought to the patient's arm, leg, back, or whatever it might be the said arm, leg, or back being first of all cast in plaster of Paris. These casts and splints, in the perfection of their craftsmanship, betrayed the sculptor's trained hand. Presently Derwent Wood was a sergeant, in charge of the splint room. That same room still sees the evolution of remarkable splints. But its forte is dealing with facial wounds. It is now the Masks for Facial Disfigurements Department, and its creator and director is no longer sergeant but Captain Derwent Wood of the general service. The room, divided by a partition, is half a workshop and half a studio. In the workshop we encounter a lance corporal who, as a civilian, was a sculptor's moulder by trade, a job not learnt in a day. He presides over a bench, a litter of esoteric implements, a bag of plaster of Paris, some plasticine, a sink, and a geyser for hot water. In the studio we find the sculptor, but a sculptor attired as a captain of the British Army, and likewise some of his odd sculptures, frail little painted bits of human visages, some with neat moustaches and pairs of spectacles attached to them, and on the walls a frieze of souvenirs in the shape of casts of those same visages, with photographs of their owners in the flesh, the before and after recordings, which so promptly demolish the criticisms of the theorizing objector. What exactly happens to the man who goes into that room with a gargoyle face, and a week or two later, after various processes, is able to emerge with a face which at a few yards' distance is almost a replica of the one he wore before he was wounded? To begin with, it must be explained that the sculptor does nothing, whatever, unless the surgeon has finished with the case. The wound must be radically healed. It is useless for the sculptor to tackle it, if further shrinkage is going to alter its contours. When the healing is pronounced complete, the man can be turned over to the masks for facial disfigurements expert, not before. He enters the room, is seated in a chair, and very carefully scrutinized. He has been asked to supply, if possible, a portrait of himself as he was before he went to the front. Generally he can do so that last photograph which the wife or sweetheart coaxed him to endure develops an unforeseen value and this portrait guides the sculptor in some of the factors he must weigh in deciding what type of mask is best suited to the individual later too the portrait will be of priceless help in the mask's finishing touches 
The decision arrived at, the patient's face is prepared for molding. He has lost, perhaps, one eye, a slice of the adjacent cheek, and the top part of the nose. In such a case, the whole of the upper half of the face, including the entire nose and the surviving eye, must be molded. It is first painted over with oil, the eyebrows are smeared with Vaseline, the moustache, if any, receives the same treatment. This is to prevent the plaster of Paris, which is about to be applied, from sticking to the hairs. Meanwhile, our Lance Corporal has been deftly mixing the plaster of Paris with warm water in a bowl, a minor preparation which nevertheless demands a craftsman's knowledge, for this substance's behavior is fickle. Soon it is of the proper consistency, and the patient, leaning back in his chair as though on the point of being shaved at a barber's, closes his one remaining eye, and has a snippet of tissue paper placed on its oily lid to protect it. A similar snippet protects the hole which once contained the other eye. Quickly a film of plaster is brushed on to the face. Heavier dollops of plaster are applied to this film. Soon the face looks as though its upper features had been very richly lathered. The lather grows thicker and thicker, more and more solid, drier and drier. At length the correct moment, as recognized by the Lance Corporal, has arrived, and he detaches and lifts off from the patient's face a faintly steaming shell of plaster, the inner surface of which is a negative replica of the gargoyle which is to be restored to naturalness. A minute later the gargoyle's owner, none the worse, has had all the oil sponged off and is ready to go back to his ward, or to his home, until he shall be required to pay his next visit. After various adventures have befallen it, in which soft soap and soaking plays a part, the plaster of Paris negative yields a plaster of Paris positive. This positive has its few imperfections, minute lumps and the like, smoothed off, then another negative is made from it. From this second negative, a squeeze of plasticine is taken. Why the technical name for these sometimes rather beautiful and bust-like works should be such an ungainly one as squeeze, I know not, but squeezes they are, and when you go into the masks for facial disfigurements room, it is rarely that you will not find a squeeze being labored upon by the presiding genius of the place. It is upon this squeeze, in the first instance, that the sculptor exercises his art. The squeeze, as it stands, is a literal portrait of the patient, with his eyeless socket, the cheek partly gone, the bridge of the nose missing, and also with his good eye and a portion of his good cheek. These undamaged features were purposely included in the original cast, for these are what the damaged ones must be made to match. But the eye is closed, its lid was, of course, lowered to shield it from the plaster. We remember that a morsel of tissue paper further shrouded it. The plasticine squeeze, then, represents a face lacking one eye and with the other eye shut. The shut eye must be opened so that the other eye, the eye to be, can be matched to it. With dexterous strokes the sculptor opens the eye. The squeeze, hitherto representing a face asleep, seems to awaken the eye looks forth at the world with intelligence. This opening of the closed eye is practically the sole function of the squeeze. From the squeeze thus modified, a further plaster of Paris cast is made, a negative, and then a positive. This last positive is the basis for the sculptor's main task. On it, working with minute and elaborate finesse, he builds up the patient's portrait, the eyeless socket is filled in and given an eye, eyebrow, and eyelashes, which pair with their neighbors. The concave cheek is made convex to pair with the good cheek. The nose is restored, its shape reproduced from measurements and from comparison with the photograph or photographs. It comes to pass in the fullness of time that a plaster likeness emerges of the man not as he is but as he was and from this sculptured plaster portrait the eventual mask is forged. The mask, so called, when it gets its preliminary adjustments on the patient himself, perhaps does not appear very promising. It is a thin metal contrivance, an electrotype plate, one thirty-second of an inch thick, which bears a remote resemblance to an irregular bit cut out of one of those papier-mâché visors worn by revellers at a fancy-dress ball. 
as yet it is not tinted, it is only shaped, and shaped with notable nicety. It exhibits an oval aperture where the eye is to come. Adjacent thereunto is the upper part of the nose. At the side we see restored the lost slope of the cheek. Very, very painstakingly is the patient fitted. Then the plate is covered with an electric deposit of silver. Meanwhile the sculptor, turned painter for the moment, is painting on a slim oval disk of glass an eye which is an adroit reproduction, down even to the veins in the white, of the patient's undamaged eye. This disk will be accommodated in the oval aperture left for it. Commercial artificial eyes were tried, but faultless pairing, and the masks for facial disfigurements department is fanatically particular, was seldom achieved, so the painted discs hold the field. Lastly, the silvered disc itself is painted. Oil paints are used, this after diligent investigations into the possibilities of fired enamels, and the patient's sound skin is matched with as microscopic precision as was his sound eye. Eyelashes of metallic foil, real hair has been tried and abandoned, are fixed above the eye. These and the eyebrow are painted, brown, black, or whatever the patient's color may be. Spectacles are soldered to the mask's fragment of nose. These spectacles are not to enable the patient to see, but to hold the mask in place, an office unobtrusively performed by the spectacles' hooks behind the ears. The mask is so light that it needs little support. With some of the smaller ones, spirit gum suffices. Generally speaking, when the patient is wearing his mask, the only difference which his friends can observe in him at a couple of yards' distance are, one, that whereas before the war he had no occasion to wear glasses, he now does wear them, and, two, that he occasionally squints. This latter apparent phenomenon is of course due to the fact that the mask's eye is immovable while the sound eye shifts from side to side. But as long as the patient in talking remembers to look directly at his vis-a-vis, -vis, no seeming squint occurs. The sole abnormality is that one eye winks and the other does not this and the squint the spectacles partly conceal. It is difficult to convey a fair impression of the extraordinary thousandth of an inch sort of correctitude with which these membrane-like but strong metal masks adhere to the face and cover the grisly gap beneath them. At a slight distance so harmonious are both the moulding and the tinting that it is impossible to detect the join where the live skin of cheek or nose leaves off and the imitation complexion of the mask begins. Figure what this means to the patient. Instead of being a gargoyle, ashamed to show himself on the streets, he is an almost normal human being, and can go anywhere unafraid, unafraid a happy release of seeing others afraid. Self-respect returns to him, his depression departs, with this improvement in mental health, there is a corresponding improvement, as no psychologist will need to be told, in physical health likewise. And should it have happened that his wound has injured the nerves controlling the salivary glands or the tear ducts, so that he is troubled by a constant discharge, the sculptor's mask is a blessing, for an absorbent pad can be conveniently tucked away within it, and will be a comfort to the patient in his distressing affliction. The before and after photographs which line the studio walls do not therefore tell the whole of the story. They show us macabre and sometimes brutish physiognomies, metamorphosed into sane and reasonable ones, but they cannot register the access of cheeriness which has been brought about within the brains which those facades hide. Some hint of it is indirectly conveyed by certain of the after portraits, to be sure, and is rather more noticeable in the profiles than in those which are full face. Four photographs are taken of each patient, one full face and one profile before, one full face and one profile after. The profile which is noseless, or has been deprived of all but a portion of the nose, or is lacking the upper lip, is pathetically ugly. Such a profile, wearing the moulded mask which restores these features, has no ugliness whatever, and is frequently even expressive. When the upper lip is gone, its absence is screened by a false moustache hung beneath the artificial nose. This false moustache is made to imitate the moustache which the patient boasted before the war if he was a moustache-wearer. 
one owner of a mustachioed mask of this type is so proud of it in spite of its falseness that he waxes and twists it in a fashion sprucely dendaical and would not be offended if told that he is now a handsomer man than he was when he joined the army certainly his two after portraits suggest that this is not impossible they are so spick and span in another frame we see pictures of a soldier who had completely lost one ear an elegant false ear in painted metal like the masks and as imponderable as a feather has been created for him by captain derwent wood this ear is attached by spirit gum you would not think that the loss of an ear could matter much with longish hair brushed over the place no decline in comeliness should have ensued nevertheless there is a blank in the full face before portrait and when we examine the full face after portrait with its two ears of which we can scarcely tell which is the spurious one we descry at once an added intelligence the wrongness is exercised and the face has returned to a pleasant rightness instead the very eyes have become in some queer way straighter and more tranquil all this is brought about by a very close union between craftsmanship and art the masks for facial disfigurements department which is intensely practical and materialistic would not have evolved and could not be conducted by any one but a sculptor those oddly shaped flakes of painted metal do not perhaps define themselves very ostensibly as sculpture pure and simple but they are based on the formulae and practice of sculpture and grow from the deftness of the sculptor's hand with training anybody might in time make the plaster of paris moulds and advance as far as the plasticine squeeze it is in the alterations and adaptations the buildings up and trimmings down and the ultimate reproduction of the human face as it was that the person who does not happen to be a sculptor and a sculptor of imagination would inevitably fail in the masks for facial disfigurements department there is no parallel to be drawn with any other branch of the war hospital's activities there is no surgery and nothing the least like surgery no medicine and nothing the least like medicine no treatment of the face or jaw as in say massage or dentistry no treatment in short of any description whatsoever the doctor the surgeon the masseur the dentist all are specialists come here to watch a confrere whose work on patients is perhaps the only work in the whole institution which does not on some neutral ground overlap with theirs this confrere has no degrees like theirs and is in no remotest sense either their competitor or their rival he is not an unqualified man pushing into a close corporation of qualified men he is outside their domain but they equally are outside his for they are scientists, and he is simply an artist. End of Masks and Faces from the Happy Hospital by Ward Muir Read by Maria Casper Merchantmen at Arms, The British Merchant Service in the War by David W. Bone Independent Sailings This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Independent Sailings Until nearly three years of war had gone on, we sailed independently as single ships, setting our speeds and courses, and conforming only to the general route instructions of the Admiralty. The submarine menace did not come upon us in a sudden intensity. Its operation was gradually unfolded, and countermeasures were as methodically advanced to meet it. The earliest precaution took the form of a wide separation of the ships, branching the sea routes apart on the sound theory that submarines would have voyaging to do to reach their victims. While this was a plan of value on the high seas, it could not be pursued in the narrow waters of the channels destroyers in sufficient numbers not being available to patrol these waters fishing craft trawlers and drifters were commissioned to that service being of a moderate speed their activities were not devoted to a mass operation by which they could group the merchantmen together for protection the custom was still to separate them as widely as possible each zigzagging on her own plan 
until the convoy system was established measures for our protection did not take the form of naval escorts sailing in our company such vessels were only provided for transports or for ships on military service vessels on commercial voyages were largely left to their own resources when clear of harbour limits that all sea-going vessels should carry a wireless installation was one of the first measures enforced by admiralty the magnificent resources of the marconi company though strained were equal to the task there was a life labour alone in the technical education of their operators but they drilled the essentials of their practice into landward youths in a few months blessed them with a probationer's license and sent them to sea it is idle to speculate on what we could have done without this communication with the beach it is inconceivable that we could have served the sea as we have done throughout the length of channel waters we were constantly in visual touch with the patrols but in the more open seas we relied on the wireless to keep us informed of enemy activities at first we were lavish in its use the air was scored by messages back chat was indulged in by the operators an s o s and they were frequent was instant signal for a confusion of inquiries that often prevented the ready succour of a vessel in distress we grew wiser we put a seal on the switch regulations came into force to restrain unnecessary sparking we sat in to listen and record and only to speak when we were spoken to codes were issued by the admiralty for use at sea their early cryptogram was easily decoded by friend and enemy alike knowing that certain words would assuredly be embodied in the text of a message words such as from latitude report submarine master it was not difficult to decipher a code of alphabetical sequence there were famous stories of traitors and spies but our authoritative simplicity was responsible for the occasional leakage of information at this date nineteen fifteen to sixteen wireless position detectors came into use by the enemy a spark group repeated after an interval could give a fair approximation of distance and course and speed more than ever it was necessary to maintain silence when at sea withal the air was still in strong voice at regular periods the great longshore radios threw out war warnings to guide us in a choice of routes and warn us away from mined areas patrols and warcraft kept up an incessant linking report distress signals hissed into the atmosphere in urgent sibilance then faltered and died away on occasion the high note of a telefunken set invited a revealing confidence that would lead us chicky chicky to the block we were well served by marconi extension of the power of enemy submarines brought new practice to our seafaring we had made the most of a passage by the land steering so close that the workers in the field paused in their toil and waved us on but the new underwater craft crept in as close and mined the fairways we were ordered to open sea again to steer the shortest course by which we could reach a depth of water that could not be mined zigzag progress now assumed the importance that was ever its right it had been but cursorily maintained the shortest distance between two points had for so long been our rule that many masters were unwilling to steer in tangents on passage in the more open sea they were soon converted to a belief in the efficacy of a crazy course statistics of our losses proved the virtue of the tangent of a group of six vessels sunk in a certain area only one a very slow vessel was torpedoed while maintaining a zigzag extracts from the diary of a captured submarine commander was circulated among us giving ground for our confidence in the frequent admissions of failure owing to a sudden and unexpected alteration of course still we were unarmed if by zigzag and a keen lookout we were fortunate in evading torpedo attack the submarine had by now mounted a surface armament and we were exposed to another equally deadly offence for our protection admiralty placed a new type of warship on the routes approaching the channels built originally for duty as minesweepers the sloops were faster and more heavily armed than the drifters 
they patrolled in a chain of five or six over the routes that we were instructed to use during the daylight hours we were rarely out of sight of one or other of the vessels forming the chain our route orders were framed towards a definite point of departure into the high seas when darkness came there the patrol of the sloops ended we had the hours of the night to make our offing and by daybreak again were assumed to be clear of the danger zone but the danger zone was being extended swiftly it was not always possible to traverse the area in the dark hours of a night only the fast liners could stretch out a speed that would serve profiting by experience that was constantly growing the reichsmarine amt constructed larger submarines capable of remaining long at sea and of operating in ocean areas that could not adequately be patrolled twelve fifteen then twenty degrees of longitude marked their activity advancing to the westward they went south to thirty five in time the mediterranean became a field for their efforts gunfire being the least expensive they relied on their deck armament to destroy unarmed shipping the patrols were but rarely in sight the submarine became a surface destroyer there was no necessity for submergence on the ocean routes underwater tactics were held in reserve for use against fast ships the slower merchantmen were brought to in a contest that was wholly in favour of the u-boat in a heavy atlantic gale cabotia was sunk by gunfire a hundred and twenty miles from land she had not the speed to escape despite the heavy seas that swept over the submarine and all but washed the gunner from the deck the enemy was able to keep up a galling fire that ultimately forced the master to abandon his ship virginia was fired upon at midnight when steering for the cerigo channel notwithstanding the courage of captain coverley who remained on board to the last there could be but one end to the contest virginia was sunk a strong ship the enemy had to expend two of his torpedoes to destroy her. Against such attacks, only one measure could be advocated, the measure we had for so long been demanding. It was impossible to patrol adequately all the areas of our voyaging. Guns were served to us, and we derived a confidence that the enemy quickly appreciated. We did not expect wholly to reduce his surface action, but we could and did expose him to the risk he had come so far out to sea to avoid on countless occasions our new armament had effect in keeping him to his depths with the consequent waste of his mobile battery power even in gun action he could no longer impose his own speed power on a slow ship under conditions that he judged favourable to his gunnery the submarine commander still exercised his ordnance usually after a torpedo had failed to reach its mark many of the hazards were against us but our weapons brought the contest to a less unequal balance if we did present the larger target we had in our steady emplacement a better platform from which to direct our fire from the first it was a competition of range and calibre six pounders led to twelves these in turn gave way to four point sevens anon the enemy mounted a heavier weapon to which we replied by a new type of four inch sighted to thirteen thousand yards thus armed and equipped we were in better condition to meet the enemy in our independent sailings he was again obliged largely to return to the use of his torpedoes with all the maze of underwater approach that that form of attack involved if outranged in a surface action we had our smoke-producing apparatus to set up a screen to his shell-fire and that form of defence had the added value of forcing him to proceed at a high and uneconomical speed to press an attack some of our gun actions resulted in destruction of a sea pest but all however unsuccessful contributed to lessen his power of offence every torpedo fired every hour of submergence every knot of speed expended in a chase was so far a victory for us as to hasten the date when he would be obliged to head back to his base his chances of survival in that passage through the patrols and the nets and the mines could not be considered as good end of merchantmen at arms the british merchant service in the war by david w bone independent sailings 
Recording by Son of the Exiles. Chapter 8 of The Little Book of the War by Ava March Tappan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8 The United States Enters the War January 1917 had come, and the war had been going on for two years and a half. When it first broke out, it was announced in big headlines in the newspapers, and some of us took down atlases to make sure just where Serbia was. But we did not expect the United States to be seriously affected by a little fighting in a remote corner of Europe. When England and France took up arms, the trouble began to seem rather nearer home. But still, we were on the other side of the Atlantic. We had followed Jefferson's advice and avoided European entanglements, and there seemed no reason why we should have anything to do with this one. Therefore we had issued promptly a proclamation of neutrality. Of course Americans, as well as people of other nations, had read German books declaring German aims, but we had never taken them seriously. Perhaps one reason was that with our own great country, the blessed land of room enough, and our long lines of seacoast, we could hardly understand the feelings of a rapidly increasing people who felt themselves shut into two narrow boundaries. However that may be, there was certainly one thing which we had not suspected, and this was that German spies were scattered throughout our land. We found that the German government was paying men to place bombs on ships sailing from the United States, to burn our factories, to bring about strikes, and to wreck railroads. These men were also attempting to use the United States as a base from which to outfit steamers to supply German raiders. They were making efforts to induce the Hindus in this country to arouse those of their race in India to rebel against the rule of England, and they were trying to excite the people of India, Mexico, Haiti, and Cuba to hatred of the United States. They planned to involve Japan in their plots. Japan is our friend, and if we treat her fairly, there is no reason to suppose that she will ever be otherwise. But Germany schemed to unite Japan and Mexico against us, their reward to be land in our southwest. Germans living in this country were advised from home to oppose military training and arming so that the United States might be the more easily overcome in case of war. All this was before there was any break between this country and Germany. These things were done partly in revenge for our sales of ammunition, and partly that we might be kept too busy at home to join in the war in Europe if the time should come when we discovered the wisdom of so doing. The German embassy was the head and front of this work. It even issued passports by forging the name of the United States, a particularly dishonorable act, as a foreign minister is regarded as the guest of the country to which he is sent, and is accorded special privileges and courtesies. We learned at last that we must meet bribery, treachery, and crime. Before the beginning of the war, we had felt as kindly toward Germany as toward any other country. But as the months passed, our feelings underwent a change. War is horrible under all conditions, 
but civilized nations have tried to lessen its terrors by international laws and agreements forbidding certain methods of warfare among the forbidden acts are the destruction of private property the bombardment of undefended towns and the bombardment of any towns without warning injury to churches art galleries hospitals and hospital ships the use of anything causing unnecessary suffering such as poison on weapons or in wells poison gas or liquid fire it is forbidden to impose upon any community fines or other penalties for deeds of individuals for which the community is not responsible all these regulations and many others germany had violated again and again she had treated her prisoners with cruelty she had spread germs of disease in belgium poland and elsewhere she had torn many thousands from their families and driven them away into slavery she had recognized no law but her own will in great free america we could hardly believe that such crimes as these could be committed anywhere in the world when it was proved not only that the charges were true but that the crimes had been committed not by lawless soldiers but under strict orders from headquarters it was impossible not to take sides what had happened in our own country increased our indignation still we waited until at last germany's method of carrying on submarine warfare became unendurable these were briefly early in nineteen fifteen germany marked off a large area of the high seas in which she declared she would sink all enemy ships without warning three months later she sank the lusitania one year after this she promised to sink no more vessels without warning eight months later february the first nineteen seventeen she declared that she would sink without warning every vessel that she met this was nothing more nor less than piracy and it aroused the indignation of the world our government had learned before this that the german ambassador count von bernstorff was at the head of the plots against the united states and two days after the declaration of unrestricted warfare he was given his passports this was not declaring war but it was a threat of war if germany did not mend her ways germany continued in the same course and two months after the departure of count von bernstorff president wilson stood before congress called in special session he summed up the injuries which germany had inflicted upon the united states and the efforts of the government to keep the peace then he said with a profound sense of the solemn and even tragical character of the step i am taking and of the grave responsibilities which it involves but in unhesitating obedience to what i deem my constitutional duty i advise that the congress declare the recent course of the imperial german government to be in fact nothing less than war against the government and people of the united states congress voted resolved that the state of war between the united states and the imperial german government which has thus been thrust upon the united states is hereby formally declared we are in this war for the reason which the president stated in just eight words the world must be made safe for democracy 
the word democracy comes from two greek words meaning people and power and a democratic government is one in which the people are the source of the power the united states is a democracy we choose men to represent us representatives senators and president but if even the president does not do for the country what the majority think is wise and honorable we have the right to try him and if he is proved guilty to put him out of his office france like the united states is a republic england is not a republic but it is a democracy it has a king to be sure but politically he is hardly more than a figurehead the prime minister and his party rule but if they propose an important measure and parliament chosen by the people refuses to pass it they understand this as a broad hint that they are not representing the will of the people they resign and another election is held the government of italy is much like that of england italy has a king and legislature of two houses its cabinet like the english prime minister and his party resigns if parliament refuses to pass any important measures which it has presented such is a democratic government of the people by the people and for the people as lincoln so well expressed it the government of germany is an autocracy this word comes from two greek words meaning self and power that is the ruler himself and not the people is the source of the power the german empire was formed as has been said before by the union of a number of kingdoms duchies free cities etc the states of the united states united on equal terms no state having more privileges or rights than another the number of representatives which each state sends to congress depends as is fair and just upon the number of the state's inhabitants but every state whether large or small sends two senators the german union of states is quite different from ours when it was formed some states refused to join unless they could have special privileges bavaria for instance pays no taxes to the empire on beer and domestic liquors of all these states prussia was by far the strongest and when her king became also german emperor she was able to secure whatever special privileges she wanted the government of germany consists of the kaiser the chancellor and two houses the members of one of these the bundesrat are appointed by the rulers of the twenty-five states each one having a fixed number of votes the other the reichstag represents the people and its members are chosen by the people's votes at first glance this seems much like the government of england with king prime minister and the two houses of parliament but there is a great difference as will be seen later the kaiser is of course at the head of the government under him is the chancellor whom he appoints or puts out of office as he chooses the chancellor is president of the bundesrat and he has also a seat in the reichstag in england as has just been said if the prime minister proposes an important bill and parliament refuses to make it a law the prime minister resigns in germany if the chancellor proposes an important bill and the reichstag refuses to make it a law 
the Reichstag may be dissolved and a new election held. This may be done again and again until a Reichstag has been formed that will vote as the Chancellor, that is the Kaiser, wishes, and the Chancellor remains in power until the Kaiser desires to make a change. The Reichstag, then, has almost no power, and is practically, as it has often been called, only a debating club. The Bundesrat represents the states as states, but the number of representatives varies with the different states. There are in all 61 members. Of these, Prussia has 17, while 17 of the states have only one apiece. Alsace-Lorraine has three votes, but the Kaiser instructs how they shall be cast. The delegates from each state vote as a unit, and as they have been bidden by the prince of their state to vote. Now, the Kaiser is also king of Prussia, so the twenty delegates are subject to his will. The meetings of the Bundesrat are held in secret. If the Reichstag passes a law, it is not valid unless the Bundesrat agrees to it. As the Kaiser controls one-third of the votes of the Bundesrat, it is an easy matter for the Chancellor to secure for him enough more votes to make a majority and pass whatever measure he may please. The Kaiser, then, controls both the Reichstag and the Bundesrat. He also controls the army and the navy. To make offensive war, he must ask the assent of the Bundesrat, not difficult to obtain, as we have seen. But if, in his own opinion, the war is defensive, all he needs to do is to say, let there be war, and the vast war machine of the empire is set in motion. The present war the Kaiser averred to be defensive, and he did not officially notify the Bundesrat until three days after it had been declared. As Prussia is the leading state of Germany, it is of interest to know that Prussian voters are divided into three classes according to their property. Four percent of the wealthy folk of the land count in voting for as much as eighty-two percent of the working people, and the vote of one man of wealth or of noble birth may be equal to the votes of ten thousand working men. This is why a junker, that is, son of a noble house, which has always been devoted to military service, holds so much power. Bismarck was a junker. The government of the United States, of England, of France, and of Italy, is a government of the people by themselves, a democracy. The government of Germany is a government of the people by one person, an autocracy. Lincoln said, this country cannot endure half slave and half free. Neither can the nations endure half democratic and half autocratic. As long as there is a man in the world who has the power to bring war upon a country simply by saying the word, the world is not safe. That is why we are fighting. Our boys do not cross the ocean to enter European entanglements, but to keep autocracy from our own land. This is our war. We fight to defend our own country and ourselves just as certainly as if German troops had landed on our shores. Paris in three weeks, London in three months, New York in three years was a common saying among German officers. From the beginning of the war, France and England and little Belgium have been fighting our battles. The Atlantic is wide, but if England had not been our friend and had not protected us by keeping the German fleet shut up in the North Sea, who can doubt that Germany would have strained 
every nerve in the effort to bombard our coast towns and turn parts at least of our country into a second belgium end of chapter eight of the little book of the war by ava march tappan chapter eleven of inventions of the great war by a russell bond this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by marianne spiegel chapter eleven warriors of the paintbrush when the great european war broke out it was very evident that the entente allies would have to exercise every resource to beat the foe which had been preparing for years to conquer the world but who ever imagined that geologists would be called in to choose the best places for boring mines under the enemy that meteorologists would be summoned to forecast the weather and determine the best time to launch an offensive that psychologists would be employed to pick out the men with the best nerves to man the machine guns and pilot the battle planes certainly no one guessed that artists and the makers of stage scenery would play an important part in the conflict but the airplane filled the sky with eyes that at first made it impossible for an army to conceal its plans from the enemy and then there were eyes that swam in the sea cruel eyes that belonged to deadly submarine monsters eyes that could see without being seen eyes that could pop up out of the water at unexpected moments eyes that directed deadly missiles at inoffensive merchantmen they were cowardly eyes too which gave the ship no opportunity to strike back at the unseen enemy a vessel's only safety lay in the chance that out on the broad reaches of the ocean it might pass beyond the range of those lurking eyes it was a game of hide-and-seek in which the pursuer and not the pursued was hidden something had to be done to conceal the pursued as well but in the open sea there was nothing to hide behind hiding in plain sight there is such a thing as hiding in plain sight you can look right at a tree toad without seeing him because his colors blend perfectly with the tree to which he clings you can watch a green leaf curl up and shrivel without realizing that the curled edge is really a caterpillar cunningly veined and colored to look just like a dying leaf and out in the woods a speckled bird or striped animal will escape observation just because it matches the spotted light that comes through the underbrush nature is constantly protecting its helpless animals with colored coats that blend with surroundings long ago clumsy attempts at concealment were made when war vessels were given a coat of dark gray paint which was supposed to make them invisible at a distance actually the paint made them more conspicuous but then concealment did not count for very much before the present war it was the eyes of submarines that brought a hurry call for the artists and up to them was put the problem of hiding ships in plain sight a new name was coined for these warriors of the paintbrush camoufleurs they were called and their work was known as camouflage matching the sky of course no paint will make a ship absolutely invisible at a short distance but a large vessel may be made to disappear completely from view at a distance of six or seven miles if it is properly painted to be invisible a ship must reflect as much light and the same shade of light as do its surroundings if it is seen against the background of the sea it must be of a bluish or a greenish tint but a submarine lies so low in the water that any object seen at a distance is silhouetted against the sky and so the ship must have a coat of paint that will reflect the same color as does the sky now the sky may be of almost any color of the rainbow depending upon the position of the sun and the amount of vapor or dust in the air fortunately in the north sea and the waters around the british isles where most of the submarine attacks took place the weather is hazy most of the time and the ship had to be painted of such color that it would reflect the same light as that reflected by a hazy sky with a background of haze and more or less haze between the ship and the periscope of the u-boat it was not a difficult matter to paint a ship so that it would be invisible six or seven miles away one shade of gray was used to conceal a ship 
in the north sea and an entirely different shade was used for the brighter skies of the mediterranean in this way the artists made it possible for ships to sail in safety much nearer the pursuer who was trying to find them and by just so much they reduced his powers of destruction but still the odds were too heavy against the merchantman something must be done for him when he found himself within the seven-mile danger zone here again the artists came to the rescue before the merchant ships were armed a submarine would not waste a torpedo on them but would pound them into submission with shell even after ships were provided with guns submarines mounted heavier guns and unless a ship was speedy enough to show a clean pair of heels the pursuing u-boat would stand off out of range of the ship's guns and pour a deadly fire into it but the ships too mounted larger guns and the submarines had to fall back upon their torpedoes getting the range for the torpedo in order to fire its torpedo with any certainty the u-boat had to get within a thousand yards of its victim a torpedo travels at from thirty to forty miles per hour it takes time for it to reach its target and a target which is moving at say fifteen knots will travel five hundred yards while a thirty-knot torpedo is making one hundred yards and so before the u-boat commander could discharge his torpedo he had to know how fast the ship was travelling and how far away it was from him he could not come to the surface and make deliberate observations but had to stay under cover not daring even to keep his eye out of water for fear that the long wake of foam trailing behind the periscope would give him away all he could do then was to throw his periscope up for a momentary glimpse and make his calculations very quickly then he could move to the position he figured that he should occupy and shoot up his periscope for another glimpse to check his calculations on the glass of this periscope there were a number of gradations running vertically and horizontally if he knew his victim and happened to know the height of its smokestacks or the length of the boat he noted how many gradations they covered and then by a set formula he could tell how far he was from the boat at the same time he had to work out its rate of travel and note carefully the course it was holding before he could figure where his torpedo must be aimed there was always more or less uncertainty about such observations because they had to be taken hastily and the camoufleurs were not slow to take advantage of this weakness they increased the enemy's confusion by painting high bow waves which made the ship look as if it were travelling at high speed they painted the bow to look like the stern and the stern to look like the bow and the stacks were painted so that they appeared to slant in the opposite direction so that it would look as if the vessel were headed the other way u-boats came to have a very wholesome respect for destroyers and would seldom attack a ship if one of these fast fighting craft was about and so destroyers were painted on the sides of ships as scarecrows to frighten off the enemy making straight lines look crooked we say that seeing is believing but it is not very hard to deceive the eye the lines in figure thirteen look absolutely parallel and they are but cross hatch the spaces between them with the hatching reversed in alternate spaces as in figure fourteen and they no longer look straight take the letters on the left figure fifteen they look all higgledy piggledy but they are really straight and parallel as one can prove by laying a straight edge against them or by drawing a straight line through each letter as shown to the right figure sixteen such illusions were used on ships stripes were painted on the hull that tapered slightly from bow to stern so that the vessel appeared to be headed off at an angle when it was really broadside to the watcher at the other end of the periscope there are color illusions too that were tried if you draw a red chalk mark and a blue one on a perfectly clean blackboard the red line will seem to stand out and the blue one to sink into the black surface of the board because your eye has to focus differently for the two colors and a very dazzling effect can be had with alternating squares of blue and red other colors give even more dazzling effects and some of them when viewed at a distance will blend into the very shade of gray that will make a boat invisible at six miles when u-boat commanders took observations on a ship painted with a dazzle camouflage they saw a shimmering image which it was hard for them to measure on the fine gradations of their periscopes some ships were painted with heavy blotches of black and white 
and the enemy making a hasty observation would be apt to focus his attention on the dark masses and overlook the white parts so he was likely to make a mistake in estimating the height of the smokestack or in measuring the apparent length of a vessel a joke on the photographer early in the submarine campaign one of our boats was given a coat of camouflage and when the vessel sailed from its pier in the north river new york the owners sent a photographer two or three piers down the river to photograph the ship as she went by he took the picture but when the negative was developed much to his astonishment he found that the boat was not all on the plate in the finder of his camera he had mistaken a heavy band of black paint for the stern of the ship quite overlooking the real stern which was painted a grayish white the artist had fooled the photographer at a distance of not more than two or three hundred yards seeing beyond the horizon the periscope of a submarine that is running awash can be raised about fifteen feet above the water which means that the horizon as viewed from the elevation is about six miles away and if you draw a circle within a six mile radius on the map of the atlantic you will find that it is a mere speck in the ocean but a u-boat commander could see objects that lay far beyond his horizon because he was searching for objects which towered many feet above the water the smokestacks of some vessels rise a hundred feet above the water line and the masts reach up to much greater altitudes aside from this in the early days of the war steamers burned soft coal and their funnels belched forth huge columns of smoke which were visible from twenty to thirty miles away when this was realized efforts were made to cut down the superstructure of a ship as much as possible some vessels had their stacks cut down almost to the deck line and air pumps were installed to furnish the draft necessary to keep their furnaces going they had no masts except for slender iron pipes which could be folded down against the deck and could be erected at a moment's notice to carry the aerials of the wireless system over the ship from stem to stern was stretched a cable familiarly known as a clothesline upon which were laid strips of canvas that completely covered the superstructure of the ship these boats lay so low that they could not be seen at any great distance and it was difficult for the u-boats to find them they were slow boats too slow to run away from a modern submarine but because of their lowly structure they managed to elude the german u-boats when they were seen the u-boat commanders were afraid of them they were suspicious of anything that looked out of the ordinary and preferred to let the clothesline ships go the british mystery ships the germans had some very unhealthy experiences with the q boats or mystery ships of the british these were vessels rigged up much like ordinary tramp steamers but they were loaded with wood so that they would not sink and their hatches were arranged to fall open at the touch of a button exposing powerful guns they were also equipped with torpedo tubes so that they could give the u-boat a dose of its own medicine these ships would travel along the lanes frequented by submarines and invite attack they would limp along as if they had been injured by a storm or a u-boat attack and looked like easy prey when a submarine did attack them they would send out frantic calls for help and they had so-called panic parties which took to the boats meantime a picked crew remained aboard carefully concealed from view and the captain kept his eye upon the enemy through a periscope disguised as a small ventilator waiting for the u-boat to come within range of certain destruction sometimes the panic party would lure the submarine into a favorable position by rowing under the stern as if to hide around the other side of the ship at the proper moment up would go the white ensign the british man-of-war flag the batteries would be unmasked and a hail of shell would break loose over the hun many a german submarine was accounted for by such traps submarines themselves used all sorts of camouflage they were frequently equipped with sails which they would raise to disguise themselves as peaceful sloops and in this way they were able to steal up on a victim without discovery sometimes they would seize a ship and hide behind it in order to get near their prey camouflage on land but the call for wielders of the paintbrush came not only from the sea their services were needed fully as much on land 
and the making of land camouflage was far more interesting because it was more varied and more successful besides it called for more than mere paint all sorts of tricks with canvas grass and branches were used of course the soldiers were garbed in dust-colored clothing and shiny armor was discarded the helmets they wore were covered with a material that cast no gleam of light in every respect they tried to make themselves of the same shade as their surroundings like the indians they painted their faces this was done when they made their raids at night they painted their faces black so that they would not show the faintest reflection of light a paper horse the most interesting camouflage work was done for the benefit of snipers or for observers at listening posts close to the enemy trenches it was very important to spy on the enemy and discover his plans and so men were sent out as near his lines as possible to listen to the conversation and to note any signs of unusual activity which would be likely to proceed a raid these men were supplied with telephone wires which they dragged over no man's land and by which they could communicate their discoveries to headquarters some very ingenious listening posts were established in one case a paper mache duplicate of a dead horse was made which was an exact facsimile of an animal that had been shot and lay between the two lines one night the carcass of the horse was removed and the paper mache replica took its place in the latter a man was stationed with a telephone connection back to his own lines he had an excellent chance to watch the enemy on another occasion a standing tree whose branches had been shot away was carefully photographed and an exact copy of it made but with a chamber inside in which an observer could be concealed one night while the noise of the workmen was drowned by heavy cannonading this tree was removed and its facsimile was set up instead and it remained for many a day before the enemy discovered that it was a fake tree trunk it proved a tall observation post from which an observer could direct the fire of his own artillery fooling the watchers in the sky in the early stages of the war it seemed impossible to hide anything from the germans they had eyes everywhere and were able to anticipate everything the allies did but the spies that infested the sky were the worst handicap even when the allies gained control of the air the control was more or less nominal because every now and then an enemy observer would slip over or under the patrolling aeroplanes and make photographs of the allies lines the photographs were carefully compared with others previously taken that the slightest change in detail might be observed airplane observers not only would be ready to drop bombs on any suspicious object or upon masses of troops moving along the roads but would telephone back to their artillery to direct its fire upon these targets of course the enemy knew where the roads were located and a careful watch was kept of them the french did not try to hide the roads but they concealed the traffic on the roads by hanging rows of curtains over them as these curtains hung vertically and were spaced apart one would suppose that they would furnish little concealment but they prevented an observer in an aeroplane from looking down the length of a road all the road he could see was that which lay directly under his machine because there he could look between the curtains if he looked obliquely at the road the curtains would appear to overlap one another and would conceal operations going on under them in one case the germans completely covered a sunken road with canvas painted to represent a road surface under this canvas canopy troops were moved to an important strategic point without the slightest indication of such movement hiding big guns nature's tricks of camouflage were freely used in hiding the implements of war on land our big guns were concealed by being painted with leopard spots and tiger stripes the color and nature of the camouflage depending upon the station they were to occupy in many cases they were covered with branches of trees or with rope netting overspread with leaves so careful was the observation of the air scouts that even the grass scorched by the fire of the gun had to be covered with green canvas to prevent betrayal of the position of the gun roads that led nowhere in the making of an emplacement for a gun it was of the utmost importance that no fresh upturned earth be disclosed to the aerial observers even footpaths leading to it had to be concealed plans were carefully made to cover up all traces of the work before the work was begun 
where it was impossible to conceal the paths they were purposely made to lead well beyond the point where the emplacement was building and still further to deceive the enemy a show of work was sometimes undertaken at the end of the path wherever the sod had to be upturned it was covered over with green canvas the earth that was removed had to be concealed somewhere and the best place of concealment was found to be some old shell hole which would hold a great deal of earth without any evidence that would be apparent to an observer in an airplane if no shell hole were handy the excavated material had to be hauled for miles before a safe dumping ground could be found as far as possible everything was sunk below the earth level big pits were dug in which the mortars were placed or if a shell hole were empty this was used instead shadowless buildings any projection above the ground was apt to cast a shadow which would show up on the observer's photographs this was a difficulty that was experienced in building the hangars for airplanes the roofs of these sheds were painted green so as to match the sod around them but as they projected above their surroundings they cast shadows which made them clearly evident to the enemy this was overcome by the building of shadowless hangars that is hangars with roofs that extended all the way to the ground at such an angle that they would cause no shadow except when the sun was low in some places aerial planes were housed in underground hangars the approach to which was concealed by a canvas covering as for the machines themselves they scorned the use of camouflage paint was little protection to them some attempt was made to use transparent wings of ceylon a material similar to celluloid but this did not prove a success the photographic eye although camouflures made perfect imitations of natural objects and surroundings they were greatly concerned to find that the flying observers could see through their disguises to the naked eye the landscape would not show the slightest trace of any suspicious object but by use of a color screen to cut out certain rays of light a big difference would be shown between the real colors of nature and the artist's copies of them for instance if a roof painted to look like green grass were viewed through a red color screen it would look brown while the real grass which apparently was of exactly the same shade as the roof would look red it had not been realized by the artists who never studied the composition of light that there is a great deal of red in the green light reflected by the grass and that if they were to duplicate this shade of green they must put a certain amount of red paint in their imitation grass roofs air scouts did not depend upon their eyes alone but used cameras so that they could study their photographs at their leisure and by fitting the cameras with different color screens they could analyze the camouflage and undo the patient work of the artist a call for the physicist to meet this situation another man was summoned to help the physicist who looks upon color merely as waves of ether who can pick any ray of light to pieces just as a chemist can analyze a lump of sugar under his expert guidance colors of nature were imitated so that they would defy detection aside from this the physicist helped to solve the tricks of the enemy's camouflures but the physicist had barely rolled up his sleeves and got into the fray when the armistice was signed which put an end to the shams as well as to the realities of the great war while the work of camouflage was not completed we owe an inestimable debt to the men who knew how to fake scenery and to their learned associates who count the wavelengths of light and although their trade was a trade of deception and shams there was no sham about the service they rendered making ships visible while in war safety lies in invisibility in peace the reverse is true now that the war is over it may seem that the work of the camouflures can find no useful application but it was impossible to learn how to make objects invisible without also learning how to make them conspicuously visible as a consequence we now know how to paint a ship so that it will show up more clearly in foggy weather thereby reducing the danger of collision we know too how to paint light ships buoys etc so that they will be much more conspicuous and better guides to mariners and how to color railroad signals and road signs so that they will be more easily seen by locomotive engineers and automobile drivers 
End of chapter 11 of Inventions of the Great War by A. Russell Bond